Hello, everyone, and a very warm welcome to the second Fusion 8 Receive workshop on behalf of BSC, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, ARRES, the Spanish Supercomputing Network. My name is Mary Mansinen, and I'm the Fusion Group leader and ICRE research professor here at BSC. I will host this welcome session together with my colleague Jordi Mas Castella from BSC address. And I will also chair the first two talks of this workshop straight after this welcome. First of all, we would like to thank the program committee for putting together such an exciting um, uh, program that we have at this workshop. Secondly, I would like to thank the collaborators shown on this slide for um, their contributions to this event. And lastly, uh, our thanks go to the local organizers for making this event possible in the first place. Over the two days of this workshop, we will hear four keynote talks, 11 invited talks, and 11 contributed talks. You can check the program at this address. The durations of the talks are also shown here, and there will be uh, some time for questions and answers. Tomorrow, in the closing session, there will be live voting and announcement of three favorite invited or contributed talks. We will have two minutes to vote for our favorite talks uh, using a link that we will provide in the closing session. So stay tuned and participate in this competition with your votes. It has been really great to see so much interest in this workshop. We have received about 220 registrations from um, 31 countries all over the world. The, the largest participations are from Spain, UK, uh, France, India, Germany, and United States. Thank you everybody for your participation. Regarding the logistics, um, we will have one virtual meeting room at all times with the connection details that you all should have received by email. The questions and answers we are organizing by the Zoom um, Q&A function, which is located at the, at the um, bottom of the screen. Please use this option and be as concise as you can with your questions. We will record this workshop and we will share it online afterwards. If you have any questions uh, to ask or comments, please send uh, them to us by email using this address hbcfusion at dsc.s. Next, as the second part of this welcome, we would like to say a few words about the BSC and REST and the work we do. Um, I will pass the word now to my colleague, Jordi Mas Castella, who will start this part of the welcome. Thank you. Thank you, Merby, and good morning, everyone. Uh, just a few words to introduce. Uh, probably most of you know about BSC, but just a few words about the BSC for those that uh, don't know the center. BSC is just a, a very unique center in the sense that it gathers uh, a supercomputing uh, machine, a supercomputing service, giving providing service to Spanish and international researchers. It's also a, a research center in itself, in, in computing, in live earth, and engineering science. And it also has a lot of services, a lot of activities regarding talent, uh, mobility talent, talent creation, talent development, the PhD program, technology transfer, and, and public engagement with society. Uh, formally, BSC is a consortium, is a public consortium that includes the Spanish and the Catalan government, which are main the main owners of the consortium, together with the Polytechnic University of Catalonia, UPC. Uh, if you can go to the next slide, please. The, the core of the BSC is the Mare Nostrum, the infrastructure, uh, which is a, has a total peak performance of 13.9 uh, uh, petaflops. It has a, a part, a general purpose uh, cluster, a general purpose part, which 
is used for service, but it also is used to, to, to do research for research activities. So it's a kind of mixture between service and, and research itself. Of course, it is within the network of Praise uh, and, and the rest, which is the Spanish supercomputing network, which provides also access to, to all computers. Here at the bottom, you have the different stages of the evolution of Mare Nostrum. We are right now in Mare Nostrum 4, but, but really in a very, I would say in, in, in a few years, Mare Nostrum 5 will be a, a reality, will, will, will be, the, the works are being done right now. So we will see very soon Mare Nostrum 5. If you can just jump to the next slide, just a few words about the Spanish supercomputing network, which is was created 2006. It gathers uh, already four, 14 nodes all over Spain, gathering 17 supercomputers together and providing resources, HPC, and data services resources for the scientific community. And right now we have, we have just launched the second data management call for projects needing uh, storage uh, uh, and, and data management services. Uh, we provide more than six, 600 million CPU hours a, a, a year through a, a, a three-year calls. Uh, sorry, three, three calls a year, three calls a year for the computing resources. And uh, we, we are very happy to have a really good support team that helps and provides all the support to the more than 1,000 regular users of the, of the infrastructure. Uh, the, B, the, the BSC and the RES is a member of the, it's called Unique Scientific and Technical Infrastructure Network in Spain, ICTS. And, and here at the bottom, you see the logos and the representation of the, of the different nodes in, in Spain. If you can jump to the next one, because this is going to be short, very just as a reminder for those of you which may be interested, now that there are two calls open for the, for the rest, which is the computing time allocation, computing time resources that closes uh, January 11. The, for data management services, the open call that's now open, it ends January 25. And you can find here below the links for more information. And plus, we have also some uh, project working in, RES is working in a European project called EuroCC project, the National Competence Center Spanish uh, project, which has test beds or, or possibilities for SMEs regarding different aspects of, of HPC. And then if we go to the next slide, just very few words about the different departments at BSC. Uh, first, computer science, where, I mean, BSC for many years has uh, lead, uh, has shown the leadership in, in architectural proposals for, for HPC. Mm -hmm. uh, it has been a key player in design, of course, and acceleration, and, and it's, it's part now, it's leading uh, one of the initiatives to, to, for, for Europe to become a, a European processor generator, um, which will be for sure in the future, one of the competitive drivers of Europe in the near future. Uh, regarding the next uh, aspect, the next department is life sciences at BSC, very shortly, uh, of course, with uh, understanding living organisms by theoretical and computational needs, and probably there's a, there's a focus on personalized medicine, which at least gathers the interest of different aspects and different departments and different projects running uh, nowadays at, at BSC. And just the last, uh, for my side, uh, the Earth Science Department, uh, which uh, really focuses on, on modeling, especially air quality, which is, uh, I would say, a, a huge, uh, because of COVID and because of many issues, I think that air quality will be a, a hot topic in the, in the next future. And also regarding predictions of climate change, modeling the climate and so on. They have, of course, many several uh, user sectors of this of this uh, department regarding ice scientists and uh, and uh, that is for my side just thank you Mervi and, and thanks to the organizers and from the rest from the Spanish 
Supercomputing Network, I wish you a very fruitful event, a very fruitful conference. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Jordi. And then the final and the fourth department at BSC is the Department of Computer Applications in Science and Engineering. It is a very industry-oriented department with applications covering a wide range of areas shown here as some examples, um, including energy and fusion. Together with other departments at the BSC, we are working to improve the performance of existing fusion HPC codes via, uh, via three key projects, European projects. First, the European Performance Optimization and Productivity Center of Excellence, POPCOE for short, the PRAISE uh, high level support team, where the PRAISE is the Partnership for Advanced Computing in Europe, and then the Eurofusion Advanced Computing Hub in collaboration with CMAT and many European fusion research uh, laboratories. Um, in addition to our work, improving the existing HPC tools in Fusion. We also develop new Fusion modeling capabilities uh, at our center. These developments are based on ALIA multi-physics computational mechanics codes, which uses highly scalable numerical methods. In our department, we develop applications using this code in many areas of uh, science and engineering, some examples are shown here. Um, at this event, you will uh, have a chance to learn more about our work, including that using ALIA, um, in the talks by Petro Gomia, Ezequiel Goldberg, Uriol Fernandez, and Julio Gutierrez. And with this, we have come to the end of this very short welcome. Um, we thank you once again for joining our workshop. And we will really wish you enjoyable time with us over these two days. And from here, um, I would like to go straight to the first session, the technical session, and the first speaker of the day. It is really my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Frank Chenko from Max Planck Institute of Plasma Physics in Germany to give his keynote talk on accelerating fusion energy research through HPC. Frank, the stage is now yours. Thank you, Mervi, and uh, welcome. Good morning, everyone. So let's see. I want to share my screen. Everything OK, Mervi? Can you confirm? Yes, fantastic. OK, very nice. Uh, I understand it's 35 plus 10. So maybe after 30 minutes, you can give me a, a heads up. Sure. OK. OK, so this is uh, about accelerating fusion energy research through HPC. And um, let me start by reminding you just briefly what the challenge is. So this is a projection done more than 10 years ago. And at this point, it was concluded that from today, until the end of the century, we will see a worldwide increase uh, of electricity needs by a factor of three to five. And I think these numbers, if anything, have gone up since this prediction was made. So there's a, there's a gap opening, and, and this will not close anytime soon. It will further open if you take into account worldwide trends. Uh, this, on the other hand, is uh, one step closer to one of the potential answers, fusion energy. This is the EDA construction site in southern France. And as you know, uh, operation is scheduled to begin in just a few years. So it'll be a very, very exciting new phase for uh, fusion energy, energy research. Now, if you look at this uh, from a theory and simulation point of view, I think uh, we are about to um, experience a pretty dramatic change. For many years, fusion energy research was done in, let's call it a trial and error way. So. Uh, people had uh, um, some idea and they built an experiment and they tried out those ideas and theory was helping a little bit here and there, but it was not in a, in a um, position where it was able to make quantitative predictions of any sort or 
uh, steer the design, at least in most cases. There are a few exceptions. Uh, and we are about to go to a predict first approach. And this includes then high performance computing, of course. Uh, as you may or may not know, uh, fusion energy research has actually been at the very forefront of supercomputing ever since the 1970s. Uh, this is a, a short excerpt from a statement of NERSC about their history. And uh, they say that in the aftermath of the oil crisis in 73, um, this uh, computing center was started and it was originally called uh, the Department of Energy's Magnetic Fusion Energy program center is so it was it was really a computing center supporting in support of fusion energy and only later it uh, it also uh, spread out to other areas of science and uh, this is a, a slide that is supposed to illustrate the progress that was made until the 90s or so uh, so time marches on from left to right uh, with it goes uh, increasing fidelity and modeling capability uh, which is uh, thanks to increasing computing power. So originally the geometries uh, were very simple uh, and the physics was also reduced. Um, then in the teraflop era, the models got uh, more realistic, more scales were kept. Uh, first uh, uh, experimental comparisons were made. Uh, this is where we are right now. Um, this trend has continued. And as we move into the 2020s uh, with exaflop machines becoming available, uh, we are witnessing things like uh, a full plasma, full device simulations. And of course, uh, in, the, in the future, we will see maybe uh, also the inclusion of more technical aspects of, of fusion energy systems. The big challenge, needless to say, is uh, we have a, a vast array of length and time scales involved and uh, also many physical processes. Uh, for many years, these different processes were treated independently of each other, as if there was a superposition principle and we just need to understand these processes one by one. And later on, we can just couple them together in, in some way. But as it turns out, it's not that easy. There are many nonlinear couplings uh, between these processes and uh, we're just about to find out. I'm gonna give you some examples a little later in this talk. Now, uh, while it is certainly extremely valuable, indispensable, I would argue, to have high fidelity models, which are hopefully parameter free and predictive, uh, at the same time, we need to worry about reduced models that are uh, much, much faster, but have uh, reduced and uh, less complete physics. But we need both of them. Uh, for instance, we need reduced models to do uh, scoping studies, optimization, and similar things. Um, and also um, at some point, people who are interested in plasma control needs real-time capable um, physics models. And um, there's actually trends which I'm not gonna address today, but maybe we can talk about this on a future occasion. There are ways to couple high, mid, low fidelity models together dynamically in the course of a single simulation. And this is also, in my opinion, a very interesting, very important trend. So uh, computing has been around for many years and decades actually now and has transformed the way we do science. But more recently, AI has come back, um, as, you, as you well know, and it's, it's omnipresent now. It's in many devices that we use. Uh, it's also entering science. And um, this is from a FISEC report from a few years ago in the US. And they say that advanced algorithms will transform our vision of feedback control for a power producing fusion reactor. And they say that machine learning, AI, integrated data analysis and the like uh, are gonna be game changers. And uh, this is something that was also explored at uh, a meeting, actually a series of meetings in the fall of 2018, I was one of the organizers and this included people from Facebook, from Google, from Microsoft, Cray, AMD, so many companies that, that play a leading role in this context. Also uh, from many universities like Stanford, Berkeley. Um, and, uh, and we had long discussions about uh, how computing uh, can uh, join with, uh, with big data and, uh, and AI and the like um, to also help advance science. And this is still, I think in the infancy, but we're seeing more and more of this. 
just to give you one small example. Um, so people have been using artificial neural networks, of course, for many years. Also, in fusion, for instance, for the um, for the prediction of disruptions. But one thing that has not been fully explored yet is how can you integrate scientific knowledge into these networks? Because if you start just from data and you, you forget that you have scientific background knowledge, uh, you're really hurting yourself. You should try to find ways to include um, your physics uh, knowledge into the design of these networks. And there's various ways to do this. Again, today, I don't have the time to go into great detail. This would be a different talk. But uh, just a, a simple example, uh, at the bottom of this slide, you can see a simulation. This is uh, uh, one block of water that uh, dives into a bigger uh, um, pool of water. And you see it splashing a little bit. Now, uh, you can do the simulation based on uh, the regular solvers of the Navier-Stokes equations. But you can also do the very same simulations um, with uh, parts of the simulation replaced by um, what a neural network can do. And this can lead to big, big speed ups. And recently, we have also started to apply this to fusion uh, applications, for instance, uh, plasma turbulence simulations. And we also observe a very, very significant speed up, uh, talking like an order of magnitude or, or much more even. So in my next part, I want to talk about uh, the core of uh, the plasma and what the typical challenges there are. I'll give you just a few examples. It's really all about bridging space and time scales. This is a big, big challenge. And this is what requires us to go HPC in many cases. So for the last decade or so, uh, I think there were very serious efforts in many contexts uh, for instance, in turbulence research, uh, to verify our codes, to address the question, are we solving the equations right? And here you can see an example from a paper from about five years ago. At the same time, we do more and more code validation, addressing the question, are we solving the right equations? So you may be solving your equations right, but you may not be self solving the right equations. And of course, both needs to be in place. Um, to be predictive. And, uh, and you, as you can see here, we're making very, very good progress. Although in some cases, this requires things uh, like uh, artificial diagnostics that mimic uh, actual physical diagnostics and, and all the rest. So it's not always straightforward to do this correctly, but uh, there are many uh, good examples now where this has been applied successfully. So in terms of time scales, um, one, direction you can go is from turbulence time scales, which is somewhere in the many microsecond uh, yeah, regime to transport time scales, which can be anything from tens or hundreds of milliseconds to seconds. That's a, a big, big jump. And uh, what people have um, suggested uh, even a decade ago uh, was to decouple the turbulence problem from the transport problem. So transport is about how profiles react to certain uh, uh, turbulence activities in the plasma. Um, and again, the, the time scales are pre pretty disparate and, and therefore one, one can uh, apply such a, um, a split in, in the space and time scales. So here in this example, uh, we have, uh, kept eight radial positions, have done flux tube turbulence simulations, and coupled them with the transport solver to make predictions about the profiles. More recently, this was extended to global gyrokinetic simulations. What you can see here is a similar type of coupled simulation. Uh, it's a transport code, in this case, Tango, coupled to a global gyrokinetic code, in this case, Gene. And again, the goal is to reach a transport equilibrium and, uh, and get the, the right profiles. And this was also published in, in a series of papers in the last three years. Uh, this was the first of these uh, papers. Now, why is this interesting? Because um, a typical standalone uh, turbulence simulation 
lasts for something like a millisecond. That's the overall simulation time in, in uh, SI units. If you um, want to do a profile prediction for a big device like either, um, you would have to run this uh, for at least something like a, a confinement time, which is in the range of seconds. So uh, in other words, you would have to do a simulation that's about a thousand times longer than what you would usually do. On top of this, this would be a, a huge waste of resources. Um, and because you can get the same answer in a different way, as is pointed out here. And um, by doing this for bigger machines in particular, uh, jet eater demo, uh, you can get speed ups of several orders of magnitude. So this is a really, really important step forward. So as always, it's not just brute force, it's also algorithm development. Now you can also go down from the typical iron uh, gyro radius scales, which are a few millimeters and then multiples thereof, down to the electron gyro radius scales, which is typically a, a 40, 60 times smaller. And uh, here we have electron temperature gradient modes, which uh, were considered irrelevant until about two decades ago. And then uh, a series of works, which I was involved in, uh, addressed this question, and we found that uh, there is actually um, potential for ETG to be very experimentally relevant. And this is because uh, ETG and ITG modes are not isomorphic, non-linearly. Uh, the, uh, the symmetry is broken in the nonlinear dynamics of these modes between ion temperature and electron temperature gradient modes. And uh, as it turns out, ETG modes can saturate at much, much higher normalized levels, which makes them potentially relevant. Now, more recently, uh, several groups have revisited this question uh, using state-of-the-art uh, simulations. Some of them uh, required several 10 million core hours for a single simulation. This is from Miyama and collaborators uh, in Japan. And what they showed is uh, that uh, in some cases, um, you have a situation where uh, um, if you only keep the ion scales, so this is ITG turbulence and, uh, or trapped electron mode turbulence typically at those scales. Um, if you only keep those, which is the blue simulation, and you compare it to what you would get from a two scale simulation, which includes ion gyro radius scales and electron gyro radius scales all at the same time, as you can see in the red line, you basically get the same answer. Uh, and ETG alone is, is uh, suppressed by the interaction between these different um, type of scales. However, in, uh, in a different situation here at a higher beta value, you can see that a standalone ion scale simulation gives you the wrong answer. And that including the electron scales uh, pushes up the transport by quite a bit. So this is a warning sign because it indicates that some you should not blindly trust ion scale simulations. Uh, sometimes ETG scales uh, beyond making contributions on their own can also affect ion scales. So this was an important discovery. And there was a, another uh, similar study by Nathan Howard and colleagues uh, at CMOD in the US uh, where they have also seen they can only explain the experimental findings uh, if they take into account the existence of, uh, of cross-scale coupling. So I don't have the time to go into detail. I just wanted to mention this in passing. And uh, for a number of years, we have also tried to investigate uh, simulations that cover all three scale ranges at the same time. So you have your profile scales, the global scales, you have the ion gyro radius scales, and the much smaller electron gyro radius scales. And what you see on the left is a snapshot from a simulation for the TCV tokamak in Switzerland. And um, you see uh, virtually well, at least most of the plasma. And then you see very uh, fine scale structures here. Here is a, 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 um, a zoom in, of, in, in this thing. And it, it looks like it's just not well resolved, but, it's, but this is actually physics going on. And you can see here, this is the transport spectrum in wave number space. There is a peak at uh, longer wavelengths, uh, which is coming from the ion scales. And there is another big peak at the electron scales, 
which is coming from the much smaller ETG modes. So uh, this is a three scale simulation, if you will. Uh, and I'm sure we'll see more of this, at least in, in, in a few examples. So let me now come to my second topic regarding core physics. This is about connecting different physical processes. Uh, as I mentioned uh, at the beginning of my talk, uh, for the longest time, people uh, have considered, for instance, fast particle physics to be disconnected from turbulence. And we investigate these processes separately. However, uh, in a paper from 2013, it was found that um, you can only explain the absence of ion profile stiffness in certain jet discharges by taking into account um, the uh, presence of energetic particles, which was a big surprise because no one had done it uh, uh, up to this point. And uh, a little later, it was also seen um, in Astic's upgrade uh, discharges uh, that if you do a regular simulation, you would get, for instance, this, uh, this blue curve, you would over predict by more than order of magnitude. So you would get ridiculously high transport levels compared to experiment, which is down below. And only if you take into account uh, the effect of energetic particles, can you get the transport to reasonable levels. And uh, this was in the context of uh, the attempt to go towards steady state discharges in Astix upgrade. So it took uh, a number of years to come up with explanations. And uh, there's, there's multiple scenarios that can play a role here, but one of them is the excitation of Alfin eigenmodes. Um, so what you see here is uh, ion temperature gradient turbulence. This is the heat flux that's produced as a function of uh, the normalized uh, beta. Um, and um, if you do a regular ITG simulation, this is what you get, the red line. If you include fast ions, this is what you get, the blue line. And as you can see for higher beta values, there is a very significant drop. And this was explained in this context through careful analysis by the fact that the ITG modes, the turbulence driving modes, um, interact non-linearly with toroidal Elfin eigen modes in this case, which are themselves uh, linearly stable, but then are excited through nonlinear coupling and this energy exchange leads to an increase of the TAE amplitudes and a decrease of the ITG turbulence level. Now, um, there also exists a, a linear effect, uh, which uh, can be studied also on the basis of an, a careful analysis of the geochemical equation, and then also viewing this in the nonlinear cases. Um, on this basis, um, Simulations had been performed uh, for Astix upgrade geometry, predicting that in the presence of ICRF heating, um, one should be able to get something like a transport barrier. So a radially localized region of reduced transport in the region where the fast ions produced by ICRF have steep gradients. So this was the prediction. And then experiments were carried out uh, as you can see on uh, the left, uh, this blue curve, the ICRH power of the heating has been stepped up from zero to 1.5 to about three and, and so on. Um, and where, as this was done, one observed that uh, the temperature profile steepened in the region uh, that has this uh, the steep gradients of the energetic particle profiles. So this is a beautiful example of a predict first approach. This was um, one of the examples where theory and simulation actually uh, came first and suggested experiments, which then confirmed the prediction. So I think we will see more of this in the future. And just in passing, I want to mention that uh, similar effects are also predicted for W7X. And uh, we are currently in the process of working out various details um, which uh, are supposed to help make more precise uh, predictions. So with that, I want to come to my next topic, uh, and this is towards whole device modeling. This is, of course, a huge challenge. And uh, let us start by first looking at the weakest point uh, in this context, and this is the pedestal and the scrape of layer. I think one is able to say that for the core region, uh, we are, as a community worldwide, we're actually doing fairly well. 
but um, again, there, there are big weaknesses when it comes to the edge region. And this is a challenging reason, a region because uh, the geometry is very strongly shaped. Um, this means that a lot of the textbook uh, knowledge is not applicable and it, uh, it leads to very challenging scientific questions. Um, also, uh, one typically needs to use a very high resolution to resolve all of these uh, geometric changes. There is a large zoo of micro instabilities, again, non-conventional, not your classical ITG, TM modes. And uh, some people have even argued that gyrokinetics may not be applicable in this context. Uh, but I quote here a number of publications over the last several years, which uh, suggest otherwise. So I would say as long as uh, someone has not shown um, the, the definite breakdown of gyrokinetics, uh, we should continue to use it for sure. And uh, even in extreme parameter regimes, um, one may have maybe corrections necessary of, I don't know, let's say something 10%-ish, uh, but I, I doubt that gyrokinetics will have a total breakdown. That's at least my current understanding. So even uh, more than a decade ago, uh, there were the first attempts to apply gyrokinetics to uh, the pedestal region. And uh, there were many surprises. Micro tearing modes uh, played an important role. Electron temperature gradient modes played an important role. Uh, but the modes sometimes peak not at the outboard midplane, which is what they typically do in the core, but they peak, uh, for instance, near the X point. So here is a, an example for such a, a mode structure. Uh, so lighter color means larger amplitude. So this, mo this particular mode peaks near near the this x point which is uh, again radically different from what we're used to so in the context of uh, the new framework program in europe uh, we also launched a new uh, initiative um, the eurofusion theory in advanced simulation coordination effort and uh, on the physics side, this consists of about uh, or uh, of 14 um, projects, uh, which are listed here. And uh, they address some of the key open questions in fusion research. And they are supported by a total of five so-called advanced computing hubs across Europe. One of them is in Barcelona, as it turns out. And, um, and these are the topics that, that are being uh, tackled on this list here. One of them, so this is the first one here in this list, physics of the LH transition and pedestals. <clears throat> this uh, uh, particular project tries to uh, address some of the, the key open issues in, in this context. So uh, they want to advance edge gyrokinetics in the first place. Uh, for instance, how to include MHD type effects, 3D effects, uh, new numerical schemes, and, and such. Uh, they also want to do gyrokinetic simulations for L mode, H mode, I mode separately. Uh, then they want to study uh, the, the sources for uh, radial electric fields and, and its dynamics. And then they want to, of course, dynamically couple all of this such that you have a, uh, a hopefully a physical model at some point of the entire LH transition. So that's the, that's the vision. Uh, now the pedestal instabilities have been uh, targeted uh, by various groups um, for either for Astix upgrade and for many other devices. And um, there, is a, uh, there are some certain indications, I would say, that potentially the ETA pedestal may differ fundamentally from known pedestals. And this is, of course, a very important statement because uh, if that turns out to be true, uh, then we may have various surprises, positive or negative, as we go to larger devices, either and up. This is one uh, reason why I've said many times in this talk, uh, it is very important to have this capability of doing uh, uh, up initio simulations, which are truly predictive although they're very expensive and require a lot of HPC resources. So in the context of this uh, project, 
the radial electric uh, field is also studied uh, by uh, the Gisela team in France. You can see here a snapshot from a simulation. And on the left, you see uh, the radial electric field as it forms in the course of such a simulation. So again, with they're trying to put together the, the pieces of the puzzle before they put it together, all the individual elements, which then ultimately together uh, should lead to the desired result, namely the prediction of an LH transition. At the same time, uh, codes are being developed uh, that cover the entire plasma, including uh, the pedestal and scrape of layer region. So here is a simulation by the GeneX code, which has recently been developed. It is one of several such codes that is being developed in Europe. Um, and uh, maybe you can see it a little bit here. This is a, where the dark and the light uh, blue meet. Uh, this is where the separatrix is. So uh, we also include here uh, the, um, the scrape off layer and all of the core plasma. This is possible because TCV, of course, is not uh, a very large machine. This makes life a little easier. But the important thing is that we have now these simulation capabilities uh, in Europe uh, to address such questions and the core edge uh, coupling that is uh, believed to be extremely important to understand the overall uh, performance of fusion devices. So obviously, uh, one needs to also bring into play some additional physics like neutral gas dynamics. And one of the other projects on my list of the 14 projects uh, deals exactly with that. Uh, they develop uh, advanced uh, fluid neutral models and then hybrid fluid kinetic models and fully kinetic models. Uh, this brings us back to the idea of a multi-fidelity hierarchy uh, where you have high, mid and low fidelity models which you can swap out and you can couple them to any such uh, turbulence uh, simulation that I showed you earlier. Now, some other efforts, just to, to mention those, <clears throat> excuse me, uh, in passing. Um, so we have the Jekyll code uh, that is developed in, uh, in Princeton. And on the right, you see a snapshot from one of their simulations. The Cogent code, which is developed in Livermore in California, the GZLX code in France, and the Pickles code also in Europe, which uh, is a PIC code. So uh, these, um, four efforts. Uh, the first one use grid-based methods, but different types. This is a similar Lagrangian approach. This is a PIC approach. So it's very encouraging to see that there is a big push now uh, in, uh, in Europe and also in the US and maybe also in Japan uh, to go to uh, a whole device uh, models. So I think these will be, play a very important role in the future. In the meantime, we also have fluid codes that try to do similar things. And this is uh, three snapshots from simulations with acrylic code um, with different types of diverted geometries. And such simulations are currently used to also guide uh, the design and operation with uh, new kinds of diverters. So this yeah, is really five key. minutes. OK, very good. So this is a, a movie from such acrylic simulation. This is uh, the overall simulation domain. And here you can see three sections of the simulation uh, that is uh, shown on the right. Uh, you can see shearing near the separate tricks where the turbulent eddies are torn into smaller pieces. You can see a lot going on here in the, in the X point region. Uh, there's strong flows in the outward mid plane. So uh, all of this, of course, can be studied quantitatively. And uh, there are various papers by this gentleman and collaborators uh, over the last few years that discussed this in more detail. But since this is a high level talk, I just wanted to point out that we are uh, able to do simulations that were unthinkable even a few years ago. This is actual geometry. This is a lot of physics, including in some cases, neutral physics. Uh, so I think we're getting closer and closer to finally tackling the LH transition problem. And this is my final um, section for the last few minutes. This is a very ambitious project, coupling two high fidelity, two gyrokinetic codes to create a whole device model. And we may take this as an example 
uh, for other such efforts which are ongoing and uh, will continue uh, to happen over the next years, I'm sure, uh, because we have this um, enormous range of space and time scales. Uh, it does not make sense to do one simulation that includes everything from heating to profile evolution. I mean, this would be outrageous. And even uh, on exascale computers, this would not be feasible. So one has to come up with frameworks that provide tight coupling or loose coupling between various codes, such that all the different physics aspects can be taken into account. And what's done in the project that I'm going to uh, point out to you, this is a project in the US, is that two codes, XGC and Gene, are being coupled at an interface uh, to form a whole device model. So when you want to couple two codes, you first want to make sure that uh, they give the same answers. So we did careful code benchmarking uh, for the codes. And we even involved the third code here, just in case. So this looked all uh, fairly good. Second step was a couple one code to itself just to test the coupling scheme. And uh, here we have uh, an XGC only simulation. And here is XGC plus XGC coupled. And you can see these white lines. This is the coupling region. So two instances of the same code coupled and then compared to a standalone uh, regular simulation. And this worked also. So the coupling scheme for this case at least was okay. And then we replaced one instance of XGC by Gene. And uh, this is, uh, these are snapshots from the simulation. The instantaneous growth rate was measured. And as you can see here, they converge. Of course, the time evolution may be slightly different, but it's, it's, it's not a matter of getting, getting the curves right, uh, but getting the, the statistical properties, for instance, averages right. And this was possible in this case. Uh, for such simulations, we use some of the world's largest supercomputers, for instance, Summit. And uh, this required us uh, to uh, port XGC and Gene to these machines, uh, which, as it turns out, is very challenging. Um, but ultimately, we were successful. What you can see here is for different uh, node numbers, uh, what is uh, how many how many seconds do we need uh, per time step for a given problem size? This is uh, the left bars are always uh, only CPUs and the the right neighbors are switching GPUs on. And as you can see here, typically we gain something like an order of magnitude um, speed up uh, when we switch on GPUs. This brings me to my very last slide. Just to summarize and give you the big picture again, I think it's fair to say that in recent years, we have achieved really enormous progress uh, in the area of computational plasma physics. Uh, 20 years ago, this was unthinkable. We had just started to make halfway realistic models and do very, very initial experimental comparisons. And nowadays, this is done on a daily basis. And many experiments can be explained qualitatively or even quantitatively. Um, and that is remarkable progress. So we should be very happy to, to see this. And um, if you extrapolate this, um, if we bridge spatiotemporal scales and connect different types of, of physical processes, uh, we can certainly assume that we'll move closer and closer to what some people call digital twins or a virtual fusion plasma. Um, this may not be the, the simulation, as I said, that includes everything in one box. Uh, this may involve certainly a coupling uh, to, uh, between different codes. Um, but in the sense that it's, it's, a, it's a precise and predictive model of the plasma dynamics. The overarching goal, needless to say, is to aid either operation and also the design of demo and other devices on the basis of such a validated predictive capability. And this is one of the few ways we can hope to accelerate fusion energy research. Uh, if you look at ITER, for instance, it was a project that spans many decades from the inception and physical design to the engineering design, to choosing a site, to uh, building this whole device and getting it up and running. 
uh, we do not have the time to go through such uh, long time loops uh, several times more. Uh, so we need to make uh, the biggest steps possible uh, based on the best uh, understanding that we have. And uh, nowadays, this certainly involves high performance computing, uh, but never forget also the importance of reduced models, of course, in this context, as I highlighted many times. But I think this should be enough motivation for a meeting like this. And uh, I'm sure we'll hear many other exciting uh, elements and contributions along these lines in the next two days. So thanks for your attention. Thank you so much, Frank, for your talk. So I, I would like to remind everybody that we have the Q&A um, button here at the bottom of the screen. So please send your questions using this, uh, this uh, tool. And we have already <laughs> some questions there. So we go straight, straight at, uh, to them, basically. There's first question, um, Frank, um, asking, are there ways to check if machine learning predictions are reasonable without experimental data? How much do we expect to trust machine learning predictions? Um, so ma machine learning is, um of course, based on the availability of curated high quality data sets, large data sets. Um, this must never be forgotten. And, and this implies that uh, one has to uh, build these data sets, either experimentally or computationally. Uh, and, and I think that's where the biggest challenge is for a community like ours, because we do have what we consider pretty substantial data sets in some cases. But uh, compared to what, what Amazon and Google and Facebook have, this is nothing. Our data sets are small by comparison. If you have a thousand shots, it, I mean, that's, that's not much to train neural networks. Um, so I, I think... A, um, an approach where you, where you just build on neural networks and data, forgetting or neglecting your physics knowledge, I think is a big mistake or would be a big mistake. Uh, I think it is, uh, it is uh, urgently needed to include as much prior knowledge uh, in terms of physics as possible. Uh, because this allows you to get more out of uh, limited size data sets and, and then can be used to, to make uh, good analysis and good predictions. So uh, I think this is true for both the experimental side and the computational side. And maybe those can even be combined in various ways in the future. So I think uh, for fusion energy research and other scientific disciplines, um, the hope lies in combining uh, physics, a, mo a model-based approach with AI or machine learning, which is a data-driven approach. I think unless the two merge and bring the best they have to offer to the table, uh, we will uh, limit ourselves. Thank you, Frank. Um, let's, let's go to the next one. And uh, there's a question, where electrostatic approach can be used in gyrokinetics and where electromagnetic approach is absolutely necessary. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think, of course, it's, it's a matter of uh, what we call the beta value, which is the, uh, the ratio of the local plasma pressure divided by uh, the magnetic field pressure. And um, the beta values themselves tend to be fairly small, actually. They can be 10 to the minus 3 near the edge, 10 to the minus 2 in the core region, roughly speaking. But it's not so much the beta value itself, but its gradient. Uh, so another parameter we often quote is alpha. Or you can also translate this into a critical beta, which is used as the onset to kinetic ballooning modes. And the question is, how far are you in your beta value from this onset point? And typically, uh, when you approach this onset, uh, you know, you get within a factor of two or so of this thing, then electromagnetic things start to happen. Um, and of course, uh, if you look into the future, uh, people are very interested in getting high performance discharges, which means they want to 
increase beta as much as they can before hitting MHD instabilities, for instance. Um, so I think, uh, of course, there are many cases uh, today where maybe electromagnetic effects are not all that important. But I think looking to the future, uh, it's, uh, it's vital to include those effects. And in the edge region, they're also known to be very important. There are modes. So some modes are modified, like ion temperature gradient modes, trapped electron modes. They are by nature electrostatic, but you know, electromagnetic effects uh, modify them a little bit, especially uh, ITG. But then there are modes like kinetic ballooning modes or micro tearing modes that are inherently electromagnetic. They don't exist electrostatically. And those would be missed in the first place. So anyway, there, there's many facets to this, but I think, uh, uh, you know, going forward, electromagnetic simulations are unavoidable. Sure, thanks for that. And then we have one more question. What are the boundary conditions for turbulence in X-point plasma? Uh, well, referring to modeling of all device you showed. And then the follow-up question, do you have equilibrium mean flows? What is L mode? Oh. Well, that I don't quite understand. <laughs> okay. yeah. uh, so the boundary conditions, that is a very, very good question and a very uh, tough one. I would, I would think that this is maybe one of the most challenging open questions when it comes to whole device modeling uh, is what, what do you do at the material boundaries? Um, people have been using um, simplified uh, models uh, for the last almost 20 years. Um, but uh, these are or have been developed uh, for very simplified cases. For instance, a magnetic field hitting a wall at a 90 degree angle. And of course, this is almost never what happens. Typically, it's a grazing angle. So more recently, people have looked at this particular limit. But what if it's not super grazing? It's a little bit more like this. So um, generally speaking, because you have magnetic pre-sheath and anyway, you have effects that are not contained in gyrokinetics. Uh, you would need a fully kinetic simulation to address this appropriately. So what is needed is uh, kinetic theory and kinetic simulations. I mean, fully kinetic now. Uh, to understand the physics near the walls and then translate this into a model that can be used and included in either gyrokinetic or fluid simulations in the boundary. But both on the gyrokinetic and on the fluid side, uh, people are aware of the fact that uh, this is a, um, an important open question and needs a lot of attention. Actually, in one of the TSVs, number four, uh, this is explicitly uh, included. And I think one or two of the other TSVs are also dealing with this. So uh, across the board, this is this is uh, a question that has to be addressed and, and is addressed. Okay, thank you so much, Frank. Um, I don't see any more questions. So and the time is basically up. So thank you once again for your very very nice overview on the HPC's role in our field. And with this. We move to the next speaker of this session, who is uh, Dr. Kenshi Imadera from Kyoto University in Japan. He will talk about five dimensional full F gyrokinetic simulations with HPC infrastructures. Kenshi, the stage is now yours. Okay, so do you see my screen? Yes. Oh, okay. Thank you for chairman. And uh, good evening, everyone. It's already 6 p.m. in Japan. I'm Kenji Imadera in Kyoto University, Japan. It's my great honor to report our research at this Fusion HPC workshop. In our talk, after the brief introduction, uh, I would like to report two achievements which reduce the computational cost. Uh, one is the implementation of the field aligned coordinate for full F gyrokinetic simulation, and the other is the GPU acceleration. Then, as one of the large scale simulation results, 
I will show you spontaneous ITB formation in flux driven ITG TEM turbulence. First of all, uh, let me discuss the background. Uh, gyrokinetic simulation is considered to be an essential tool to study ion and electron scale turbulence. In the past, each scale was individually investigated by assuming the scale separation between device size scale, ion scale, and electron scale, because there exist a few other gaps. But uh, recently, owing to the rapid progress of high performance computing, which is the scope of this workshop, much scale simulation becomes accessible, and our purpose is to do the direct uh, March scale simulation for device size scale profile evolution and ion scale size uh, turbulence to clarify their hierarchical interactions. To achieve such uh, March scale simulation, we have employed global full F model. Uh, Gyrokinetic simulation is roughly categorized into two approaches. One is the delta F local approach in which the evolution of the perturbed distribution function is traced while the background profiles are assumed to be uniform in space and constant in time for simplicity. Since this scale separation enables us to do numerical simulations with relatively low computational resources, it is often applied to the experimental data analysis in addition to the much scale simulations for ion and electron scale turbulence. On the other hand, in full F global approach, both delta F and its equivalent part are solved self-consistently under the power balance between external heat source and sink, which is called as flux driven simulation. It enables us to do much scale simulation for background profile evolution and ion scale turbulence, as was mentioned on the last page. We can also trace uh, global profile formation coupled with mean ER, which can be linked to the transport barrier formation. Also, the other advantage is that uh, neoclassical and turbulent transport process can be traced self consistently showing the much physics nature. Taking such advantages into account, uh, we have developed a proof of gyrokinetic code named GKNet. In original GKNet, employed equation system consists of gyrokinetic Vlasov equation for full F eigen distribution function and gyrokinetic quasi neutrality condition with adiabatic electron. Recently, we have extended it to three directions. One is the rectangular coordinate one, which enables us to treat various kinds of magnetic shape by introducing numerical MHD equilibrium. Another is the electromagnetic version with kinetic electron, which has been already applied to investigate the electromagnetic turbulence, such as kinetic ballooning mode and the toroidal alphabet eigen mode. On the other hand, in the electrostatic simulation with kinetic electron, so-called omega H mode appears, which severely limits the CFL condition. To avoid this problem, we have introduced the hybrid electron model. These two figures show the animation of the 3D potential, uh, 3D potential of electrostatic potential, uh, 3D electrostatic potential in addition to the trapped ion and trapped electron of it. We can see that the dynamics of turbulence in full torus, uh, in full torus is well captured by taking not only ion, but also fast scale kinetic electron into account. However, uh, the numerical cost becomes uh, quite huge because kinetic electron dynamics can make the uh, can make the CFA condition very severe, which is proportional to the square root of mass ratio. Therefore, uh, to reduce the number of the simulation grid and the resultant calculation time, we implemented the field aligned coordinate 
which is given by the uh, geometrical uh, toroidal angle theta and the straight feed line toroidal angle theta star as follows. In this coordinate system, the covariant vector EZ should follow the magnetic field line so that fewer grid number along Z direction could be enough to reproduce uh, long, long wavelength mode. The other is the GPU acceleration by OpenACC. As you know, OpenACC is a kind of directive, uh, a kind of simple directives to utilize GPU polarization in the heterogeneous CPU GPU system, which is similar to OpenMP for CPU polarization. In this study, uh, we verified how the simulation with the field aligned coordinate uh, can be accelerated by using OpenACC directives on Balcony 100. Then, uh, finally, as one of the large scale simulation results, I will show you spontaneous ITP formation in flux driven ITG TEM turbulence by using the polar version with hybrid kinetic electron model. Uh, today, I would like to focus on these one, two, three contents. Okay, so that, then let me move to the first topic. Uh, generally, circular concentric magnetic field in toroidal coordinate system is given by this uh, form. However, uh, this Q bar does not correspond to the safety factor in global system when it is integrated around the geometrical toroidal angle theta. So uh, we consider so-called the straight field line toroidal angle theta star given by this formula. In this case, Q satisfies the definition of safety factor, which has the advantage to reproduce the balloon type structures of microscale instabilities. Then we perform the transformation to the field aligned coordinate given by this relationship. As a result, uh, the magnetic field has the only Z component in the covariant basis, which demonstrates that EZ follows the magnetic field line as was discussed on the last page. In fact, gyrokinetic equation of motion in the field aligned coordinate, which is derived from the gyrokinetic fundamental form with the aid of the deep perturbation theory, consists of these one, two, three, four equations. We can see that the advection term along the magnetic field line appears uh, only in dz dt like that, so that uh, the mode has a long wave along the z direction, so that the required unit number is expected, expected to be smaller. On the other hand, gyrokinetic crush unity condition given by this equation type is symbolically given by this form. Here, L0 is the differential operator for X and Y, uh, while L1 is the for Z. Uh, since the wavelength is long along the Z direction, uh, L1 becomes a higher order. Uh, to numerically solve uh, this type of equation, first uh, we do the 1D FFT along the Y direction, uh, because all the coefficient, uh, all the coefficient is independent to y. Then by setting the initial guess phi zero and applying the non-diagonal part of L1 to phi zero, uh, we have only to solve the 1D equation for x uh, by using a matrix solver. Then by substituting the obtained phi one as a new phi zero, uh, we can get the converged solution iteratively. This method is the same as a simple Yakov method, but a few iterations are usually enough for the convergence because partial phi, partial z is a higher order. Uh, so that uh, by utilizing the uh, kz, uh, the factor that kz is small, uh, we can uh, efficiently solve the, such kind of field equation. From this page, I would like to report the linear benchmark results in the case with the cyclone best case parameters. The left bottom figure shows the dispersion relation of toroidal ITG mode 
obtained by the toroidal and field aligned GKNet. While the real frequency coincides with each other, the growth rate have the slight gap in the high wave number regime. This is originates from the uh, long wave support situation used in the toroidal version so that it is not so a uh, critical problem. From the upper two figures, uh, both versions seem to get same toroidal eigenfunction with n equal 20, and the corresponding toroidal harmonics show that the radial position of local eigenfunction, for example, m equal 28, uh, satisfies the resonance condition because at this point, q equal 1.04. So that it is natural to compute that the field aligned version can precisely solve the IPT instability. These two figures show the impact of the grid number along the toroidal direction in the toroidal version and the z direction in the field aligned one. The other parameters are same and fixed as follows in both cases. In the toroidal version, 128 mesh number is required for the convergence, but it is drastically reduced to 16 uh, by using the field aligned version. So that in the standard magnetic shear case, the field aligned version can much improve the computational cost. These figures show the resultant computational time to calculate each part. Field is a part to calculate the direct kinetic flash neutrality condition, and the boundary condition is set at this bound part. When uh, we use the converged grid number each case, so namely 128 in toroidal case and 16 in field aligned case, we can see that computational, computational costs of both Vlasov and field parts becomes roughly one order smaller uh, by introducing the field aligned coordinate. The ratio of total computational time is also 0 0.11 in 256 cores and 0 0.15 in 1024 uh, cores, so that we can compute that the free aligned coordinate efficiently works for reducing the computational cost. However, uh, the cost and the scaling of bound part uh, in the field aligned version is not so good because of 1D FFT to calculate the twist boundary condition and the MPI I send I receive for the boundary data communication. We plan to improve this bottleneck by optimizing the MPI domain decomposition and the hybrid parallelization, but still under development. Then, uh, and the, or, the alternative approach for the acceleration is the GPU acceleration, uh, GPU parallelization. In this study, uh, we introduced the uh, open NCC directives and verified its efficiency of Marconi 100 through the Japan EU collaboration framework for fusion energy uh, because CPU is major in Japan. As you know, so each node of Marconi consists of two IBM Power 9 with 16 cores and four NVIDIA Volta V100. Memory bandwidth between CPU and CPU is a 64 gigabyte per sec, uh, while that between CPU GPU and the GPU GPU is 150 gigabyte per sec by uh, LVD2. I would like to briefly explain how the OpenACC directives are specifically installed to the field aligned version of GKNet. The most heavy part in GKNet is the 5D loop uh, to time integrate the distribution function shown in the left program. We combine uh, this 5D loop to one by using the ACC loop collapse directive and then distribute, uh, distributed uh, heavy calculations to each GPU. In order to use the multiple GPUs in one node, uh, we use uh, ACC set to device now uh, subroutine to explicitly link the GPU to each CPU as is shown in this figure. Such kind of technique is available in the MPI OpenACC hybrid parallelization. 
for C, for CPU GPU data transfer, uh, so called the, the open HCC data directives such as copy and copying are utilized. But uh, uh, this cost is not so uh, uh, is uh, very smaller than the others. From the viewpoint of memory bandwidth, the direct transfer <coughs> sorry between GPU GPU is favorable, but it has not been installed yet in this study. <coughs> On the other hand, the collision path consists of relatively light, but uh, one, two, three, uh, similar fiber group, and also the MPI old digits like that. Here, uh, by using the fact that uh, this variable moment local zero, one, two, are uh, independent with each other, the asynchronous uh, execution is utilized to hide the calculation and the communication. More specifically speaking, when a GPU finishes the first 5D loop, it can go to the next executions without waiting for the other GPUs. Same technique is also applied to the boundary part for hitting the buffer set and the communication. And we confirm that the asynchronous execution essentially works in both parts and the scaling becomes better. The desired computational time are summarized on this page. By using the uh, one GPU on each one node, so namely, so 60 GPUs on 16 nodes, uh, the plus part is accelerated by 21 times, and the total accelerated rate is roughly 13 times, as is shown in this figure. In addition, by using the four GPU on each one node, which is the maximum number in Marcon 100, the total accelerated rate becomes roughly 44, uh, 48 times, which rate is found to be almost proportional to the number of GPU, and the scaling is quite nice. So we can also conclude that GPU acceleration efficiently works for the speed up of the simulation with feed aligned coordinate. However, the living problem is that a 50 part is not GPU accelerated yet, uh, which is the main reason why the cost and the scaling of the bound part is still low. Uh, we plan to improve this part by introducing QFFT soon. And then let me move to the uh, final topics about ITB simulation based on the uh, GKNet with hybrid electron model. In this study, we consider two cases. Uh, one is the uh, ITG case uh, in which electron temperature is gentle as there is no electron heating. The other is the uh, ITG TEM case in which electron temperature gradient is enough steep and sustained by electron heating. Here, we introduce only heat source in both cases, which does not provide particle and moment of input. And uh, uh, it is also noted that we use a robust uh, safety factor profile in this study, uh, which Q minimum is located at the R equal 0.6A0. First, uh, these three figures show the time spatial evolution of ER in flux driven ITG turbulence uh, with adiabatic electron, uh, ITG turbulence with kinetic electron, and ITG GM turbulence with kinetic electron. From these figures, we can clearly see that stable local maximum of ER is formed near Q minimum surface only in these two kinetic electron cases. This is because the kinetic electron dynamics can provide more unstable linear ITG instability and the resultant stronger zonal flow generation, which details is skipped uh, here. And we also found robust net core rotation is driven around the Q minimum surface in kinetic electron case, as is shown in this figure. Interestingly, there exists a positive feedback mechanism between mean ER and the resultant uh, moment of diffusion. Because according to this moment of transport theory, uh, the first term 
uh, has a par uh, even parity across Q minimum uh, like that. So that uh, this term can work to reduce the moment of diffusion like that. As a result, a peak co-rotation profile is sustained and uh, can be balanced with the mean ER through the radial force balance, which this will be discussed later. On the other hand, in ITG TM case, weak co co counter rotation is also observed in the negative magnetic shear region uh, here. Uh, on this page, uh, to confirm the origin of uh, co and counter rotation, we perform the ITG dominant and the TM dominant decaying turbulence simulation in the cyclone base case. This video shows the linear eigenfunction and the intrinsic rotation profile in ITG and TEM case turbulence uh, cases, respectively. We can clearly see that uh, ITG turbulence can trigger the co current toroidal rotation, while TEM turbulence can trigger the opposite one. This originates from the fact that finite ballooning angle of the global mode structure. Uh, is shown to induce the residual stress part of the moment of flux, as is discussed in this paper. The sign of the ballooning angle between ITG and TEM is opposite, so that the direction of the intrinsic rotation is reversed. This observation indicates that the steep electron temperature gradient is considered to destabilize TEM in the negative magnetic shear region leading to the opposite intrinsic rotation shown in the last page. Such a difference of intrinsic rotation is considered to improve the different sustain, sustainment mechanism of ER. Uh, this figure shows the radial profile of each term in the radial force pass given by this equation, this equation, uh, the, uh, the, this notation. In flux driven ITG turbulence with kinetic electron, Co-current uh, toroidal rotation can balance with the mean ER. On the other hand, in ITG TM turbulence case, uh, ER is reversed in negative magnetic shear region by counter co intrinsic rotation, which makes its shear stronger and the pressure gradient also steeper. As a result, the ion turbulence thermal diffusivity is in flux soluble ITG TM case uh, spontaneously decreases to the neoclassical transport level like that, uh, which is a typical tendency uh, inside the transport barrier. This result indicates that the coexistence of different modes located inside of Q minimum and outside of Q minimum can trigger the steeper mean ER and leading to the positive feedback loop uh, for spontaneous ITP formation. Okay, so I would like to summarize my talk. Uh, by using the field aligned coordinator, the grid number is reduced by one ace, and the resultant calculation time also becomes one ace. In addition, uh, by utilizing open ACC directives, the calculation speed to time integrate time to time integrated the distribution function is accelerated by 48 times. As an achievement of the large scale simulation, we also reported a spontaneous ITB formation. And, uh, as a future plans, uh, uh, future works, uh, we plan to optimize the uh, API domain decomposition, GPU acceleration for FFT and the direct data transfer between GPU, GPUs. We are, we are also going to study the feedback effect of boot subcurrent on safety factor profile and the resultant ITP formation by taking the ion electron match species position, which is a key issue uh, for the ITP physics. Okay, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for this interesting talk showing the great improvements that you have made with this code. Really, really nice results. So we have already some questions in the Q&A panel. Let's see. Uh, the first one is asking, how do you solve the fields on the axis for the field aligned version? On slide eight, we see a hole in the core for one version. Is this a limitation? 
Okay. Uh, thank, thank you for your comment, uh, question. Yeah, right. Uh, in this case, uh, uh, in this linear simulation, uh, we skip the magnetic axis uh, to relax the CFL condition, but uh, we also developed the code which can treat around the magnetic axis. Uh, so by, uh, by setting the grid across the magnetic axis. I have not tried yet in the field aligned case, but uh, I, I believe I can utilize such kind of method uh, even for the field aligned case. Uh, but, but it's a, uh, a future plan. Thank you. And the next question is um, asking, what is the overall speed up of the entire code when you include GPUs? Ah, uh, okay. Uh, so, so that, uh, to, in this case, I mentioned only the time integration part, so that only uh, the brass of related part, uh, because FFT part is still under the development, so that uh, now uh, GPU is not utilized for solving the field equation. Uh, but uh, my, once, uh, but the uh, field part is relatively uh, low cost, so that uh, I think even if uh, we consider the uh, field part uh, after the development of the QFFT part, uh, I think almost the same speed up rate can be kept. Okay, thank you for that. And the next question is, does the availability of GPUs create a limiting factor for how much simulations can be accelerated compared to just CPU usage? See, compared to just the CPU, yeah. Uh, so uh, as you know, so if we use uh, only MPI parallelization, uh, data communication becomes, uh, sometimes become bottleneck. On the other hand, uh, at least according to my benchmark test, uh, this scaling almost proportional to the number of GPU so that uh, this uh, GPU acceleration, the scaling of GPU acceleration is very nice, which can so support the CPU scaling. If we use only CPU uh, MPI, I think scaling becomes worse. On the other hand, by using the GPU, uh, I can uh, so enlarge the scaling, I believe. Thank you for that. And the final question is about um, how do you see, what is your vision with this code uh, when we go towards the exascale era? Do you see that you can do more demanding calculations? How, how do you have some developments going on in that direction? Can you comment on this? Okay. Holy, and, uh, in my idea, so field aligned coordinate is a, uh, uh, also can be applied to the H plasma. And uh, uh, so that uh, and now my collaborator is uh, handling the about the plus plus code. So that by comparing the numerical scheme between our code and about plus plus code, we would like to access to the H plasma by using the such kind of his aligned version. Okay, thank you. Thank you for your answer. It's a really exciting prospect. Yeah, thank you very much. Okay, um, now the time is up. I want to thank both speakers once again for the interesting talks in this session. Um, I will close this session here. And I remind that we will um, start the next session in 15 minutes at uh, 10.45 Central European time. See you. See you soon.
Oh, hello, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Julio Gutierrez from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center, and I will chair this session where we will have three invited talks on fusion reactor simulations. Each speaker will have like about 30 minutes slots. We will have like 25 minutes for the presentation, and then we will leave five minutes for questions at the end of each talk. So please use the Q&A option in Zoom to make your questions by the end of the talk. Uh, the first presentation will be given by Gabriel Pedroche from the National University of the Instance Education in Spain. And the talk will be on Monte Carlo simulations of neutronics in a 360 degrees model of ITER. So, Gabriel, the floor is yours when you are ready. Hello, so I'm starting to share everything. So, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, I'm showing also the video. Not that the light is good here, but well, <laughs> it's what we have. And let me know if you can see my my screen. Okay. Yeah, perfect. Yeah. Okay. 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 I'm just putting the timer just to make sure I'm not. Okay. So um hello everyone. My my name is Gabby, and I am, as Julio Gutierrez mentioned, I am from the National University of Distance Education here in Madrid, Spain. And first of all, well, before starting, I want to thank you, Julia, and all the organizing committee for giving me this opportunity to, to give this talk and, and really thank you for the invitation. So what I'm going to be doing here, I don't know if I can hide this. Yeah. Okay. What I'm going to be doing today is uh, give a talk about a neutronics model, that is a model that is used for radiation transport calculations that represents the entire ITER tokamak, and its name is ELECT. Now, although I'm the only presenter, I'm not the only uh, author of this work. In fact, this is a complete list of people that have contributed to this work in, in one way or, or another. And as you can see, the, all these people are from different institutions. The majority of them are from my research group, the tech field group. Well, in fact, not my research group, the group I belong to here at UNET. And also there, is, there are authors from the ITER organization itself and from Fusion for Energy. On the right, I want to leave here my email just in case you want to ask me further questions after the, um, after the talk or if you want to ask me for more information, whatever. And also, I leave here the web page of my research group, the tech fair. So, as I'm saying, um, some of the authors are from ITER and Fusion for Energy. So, that's why I have to put this, this disclaimer here. And now, having, having done so, I can start with the outline of this talk. So what I'm going to be um, talking about first is, well, I will make a brief introduction, a general introduction about ITER nuclear analysis, their relevance and how they connect with this workshop. Then I will be a bit more specific and I start talking about the topic of this talk, which are the neutronics models of ITER tokamak. I will introduce the limitations of the neutronics models of ITER tokamak that are of our interest and which are the ones that have pushed us to produce the ELA 360 degrees neutronics model. Then I will show an example of application of PLAC in one real ITER nuclear analysis, and I will finish with some summary and conclusions. So let's start with the first part, ITER. Well, here you have a vertical cross-section of ITER. I'm sure everyone is quite familiarized with it. As we all know, ITER will be, be, will be the largest tokamak ever built, and it aims at demonstrating the scientific and technological feasibility of fusion as a power source. We also know that it is a very complex machine. And here, I don't want to explain why it is so complex. I just want to focus on one of the aspects that make it so complex. And it's the fact that ITER will be subject to intense radiation fields. The most relevant of these radiation fields, of course, is due to the 40.1 MeV neutrons that are released in every deuterium uh, tritium nuclear fusion. However, there are other uh, radiation fields of concern, but I don't want to cover them here either. What I want to point out here is two aspects of radiation in ITER. Radiation in ITER will be present throughout the entire facility. That means it will not only be present in the, in the tokamak, but it will be present also outside the tokamak, in the tokamak complex, which is a civil structure that hosts the tokamak and all the systems necessary for ITER operation. That is, radiation will be outside the biosphere. In fact, it can also be outside the tokamak itself, outside the building. Also, an important feature of radiation ITER is that it will be present both during operation, that is, while we have a plasmas operating, but also after machine shutdown. Now, radiation in ITER has both positive and negative aspects. Among the positive aspects, well, it's obvious that, as we all know, neutrons will produce tritium in ITER, they, it will, they will produce it in the 
TBMs in the test blanket uh, modules. Also in the future reactors, they will produce this in the, in the breathing systems. Also, a positive aspect of radiation is that it can be measured with diagnostic systems and give us information about the plasma. Among the negative aspects, well, of course, radiation leads to material damage, to unwanted nuclear heating, and very important to biological damage, damage in the living creatures. Now, benefiting from the positive aspects or avoiding the negative aspects poses um, really um, big uh, challenges in ITER. And this is because, as I'm mentioning, ITER is a very complex machine. It's, it's quite unique. And therefore, also the problems derived from the presence of radiation in ITER are as well unique. We have to keep also in mind that JET, which is ITER's uh, predecessor, is much smaller, much simpler than ITER, and it will um, lead to a production of neutrons that it is six orders of magnitude lower than the total production of neutrons in ITER. So in this context, nuclear analysis is a key discipline. And why? Well, because it allows us to characterize the radiation fields as well as the processes derived from the presence of radiation. Thanks to nuclear analysis, we can um, estimate and know what will be the, the amount of heating generated in a magnet, know what will be the dose that a certain worker will receive while performing a maintenance operation, or know what is the amount of friction that will be produced in a, a TBM concept. So therefore, nuclear analysis is key for the design operation, the commission, the commission, and among other phases. Now, I want to highlight here one important aspect of uh, ITER nuclear analysis, and that is quite relevant for this talk, and it's the fact that ITER nuclear analysis have to be very reliable. Again, ITER is very complex, so we need reliable results and reliable numbers from nuclear analysis to make good uh, design decisions. Also, it is important to have good numbers from the nuclear analysis to demonstrate that ITER will operate safely. So having said all this, I want to connect now a little bit this talk with um, this workshop. So ITER nuclear analysis uh, basically relies on um, the performance of activation and radiation transport calculations. As I mentioned, the model that I'm going to present is used for radiation transport calculations. In ITER, these kind of calculations are performed with Monte Carlo codes. In fact, data reference for such calculations is MCMP. Why uh, this uh, code is used in ITER? Well, basically, again, because it allows in many problems to obtain very reliable results. However, Monte Carlo has a very important drawback. One of the drawbacks is that Monte Carlo calculations are very computationally demanding. And here is where HPC comes in. HPC, high performance computing, is essential for many ITER nuclear analysis. So having made this general introduction, now I'm going to be a bit more specific and let's talk about the topic of this, of this talk. So there are different agents involved in an ITER nuclear analysis. We have nuclear data, radiation transport code, activation code, couple activation transport systems, radiation source models, geometry models, et cetera. Here, I'm going to focus about the geometry models. Particularly, I'm going to focus on the neutronics models of the ITER tokamak, which are referred as reference models. And this is how I'm going to refer to these models from now on. So neutronics models of the ITER tokamak. Well, what you have here on the left-hand side is a vertical cross-section of one of these uh, ITER tokamak reference models. Mm, these models are basically 3D MCMP models that represent the different components of the ITER tokamak. We have blankets, vacuum vessel, the magnets, uh, the cryostat, etc. And they represent the, ma the machine from the central solenoid up to the biosil here at the back. One important feature of these models is that they are very detailed and realistic models. And this is because ITER is uh, very rich in penetrations that lead to streaming paths, and also um, it features a large material heterogeneity. And both these aspects are pretty important, and they have to be well represented in the models, again, to obtain reliable results. The um, goal of these models is that they serve as a standard models for radiation transport calculations in ITER, so they have, over the years, satisfied a great demand of ITER nuclear analysis. Now, one important feature of these models, and central to this talk, is the fact that reference models have always been partial. And what do I mean with partial? Well, again, we show this vertical cross-section, but if we now do an horizontal cross-section at its height, what we see is what we have here on the right-hand side, that the model do not represent the entire tokamak. They just represent a toroidal segment of it, of 13 degrees. Currently, the ITER tokamak reference models that they are, they are used are these two, and G model and MBI on the left and, and right hand sides, respectively, and they represent a 40 and an 80 degrees toroidal segment, respectively. 
Now, we cannot forget, obviously, in a nuclear analysis about the rest of the machine. We need to take into account the rest of the environment. So what these models do is basically make use of boundary conditions. And particularly, they make use of reflective boundary conditions. So here, if we had a neutron born in the plasma that approaches um, this boundary, it would be simply reflected or mirrored as shown in these slides. So now we have a general idea, more or less, of the neutronics models of the ITER tokamak. Now let's jump into the limitations of these models. Well, these limitations are really um, related to the partial nature of these models. And the fact, the thing is that when we represent a machine in this way, what we are doing is assuming that the machine, the ITER machine, has a certain symmetry pattern. In fact, for example, if we get this model, what we are assuming is that on the other side of this boundary, we have the same segment, but simply reflected with respect to this boundary. In other words, when we represent the tokamak with um, a partial model, what we are doing is this kind of assumption. We have our model, and on the other side, we are assuming that we have something similar. Now, this is obviously an illustration, and it's quite simplistic. But what we have in reality is something a bit different. The actual tokamak is asymmetric in some senses. And the main source of this asymmetry are the ether ports, which are shown in this slide in red. These ports are um, located in the different levels of the tokamak, the B1, L1, and L2, and throughout different toroidal locations. Now, the thing is that the symmetry assumption is valid in many cases. Uh, I mean, it has been used, these partial models have been used for many years, and they have um, allowed us to obtain good results. But it is true that there are cases in which it, they can introduce this symmetry assumption, significant deviations in the results. And these, since these deviations are not easy to quantify, I mean, they're quite difficult, this leads to unquantified uncertainties in the responses. Now, another limitation of partial models is that they are not practical for certain applications. And the better way to show this is with an example. So if we have here our partial model and we had a source out there and the region of interest uh, here. So if we wanted to compute the radiation conditions due to this source, this model, well, it is obvious that we have some problem because if we have reflective boundary conditions, the radiation cannot come inside the model. So to compute nuclear responses, we will have to delete these boundary conditions. And there, we will be completely neglecting the influence of the rest of the machine. And that, of course, introduces deviations in the results that are not very compatible with reliability. So these kind of limitations are quite general and with examples that I have shown here, they affect the reliability and practicality of ITER nuclear analysis that are quite important to demonstrate the safe and successful operation of ITER. For example, um, some of the nuclear analysis that are affected by these limitations and that, that are quite important, they are necessary to estimate the dose received by workers, to evaluate the compatibility of electronics with existing radiation levels, and I'm here including also electronics involved in, um, safety, in safety, also, they are important to support the calibration of neutron detectors, which um, they will be important at the same time to measure uh, different plasma parameters, including the plasma power or the tritium burner. It's important to note that the plasma power will be necessary to know if one of the go main goals of ITER will be fulfilled, and is if we obtain or not a Q greater or uh, equal than 10. So we can see how the limitations of models, of the neutronics models, can scale. Now let's see, well, uh, the, the, the next part of this talk. So in this situation, it is desirable to analyze the potential impact and, uh, of the, the limitations of partial models and overcome these limitations. So that's why in this situation, we produce ELECT, a 360 degrees neutronics model of the ITER tokamak. Now, this is more easier uh, said than done. And, and doing this task, well, it, it was um, quite, uh, it was, Risky. It was also exciting, but the thing is that such a model was not um, conceivable um, today with the uh, computational resources uh, available. But this this was the idea. So this is, let's say, the first model of this kind that that, it, that is done with this complexity. And it was possible thanks to, of course, the currently available HPC resources that we have nowadays, and um, thanks to optimizations of the MCMP code that were performed by colleagues of my research group, but also in, par in parallel by other um, research groups, for example, in the Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So here, what you have is the ELI360 degrees neutronic model of the ITER tokamak. And as you can see, well, now we are not representing just a portion of it. We are representing the entire machine. And we don't have just one D shape, but we have the two D shapes here on, the, on this vertical cross section. 
Now, I don't want to give more information about this model, how it was produced. I think that it would be more interesting if you want to write me an email and I can um, write you back with more information. Here, just I want to focus on an example of application of eLight. So the example that I've chosen is a real application and are the ether radiation maps in the tokamak complex. As I mentioned before, the tokamak complex is the civil structure that hosts the tokamak and all the different systems necessary for the operation of ether. And you can see it here in a vertical and horizontal cross section. Basically, it's a civil structure and it's made of uh, concrete. Now, here I'm not showing the tokamak inside, just the tokamak complex. And on the right hand side, what you can see is the kind of maps that I am referring to here, the radiation maps in the tokamak complex. Here again, a vertical cross section and a, and a horizontal cross section. And what I'm not showing here is any quantity and I'm not showing any layer, just avoid any kind of conflict with um, ether. But you can imagine here that what I'm showing are radiation levels. So what we have is in dark red, more intense radiation levels and in dark blue, less intense radiation levels. So well, why are these maps important? Well, they're important because they are necessary to, on the one hand, evaluate the radiological zoning in the building and also to um, evaluate if the radiation limits outside the building are being met. And also they are important to check the compatibility of electronics with the radiation levels. Again, I include here electronics concerned with safety. The importance of these maps is such that they are reviewed by a French nuclear regulator, that is the ASN. And in fact, um, ASN reviews these maps and other several inputs from other several analyses to evaluate and um, conclude if they can give green light or not to the continuation of the construction of ITER. So this is to give an idea of the importance and the relevance of these maps. Now, the problem is that they are not easily computed, these maps. And particularly, it's not easy to compute the plasma, due, the, sorry, the maps due to the plasma radiation. And this is essentially because nowadays, and I will not enter into much detail on this, but the fact is that nowadays, um, we cannot represent in one single model both the tokamak complex and the tokamak. That's it. If you what you see here, for example, in this image, is just the tokamak complex from the bio shield onwards. But you have to imagine that inside we would have the ether tokamak. So not being able to have both the, of these things in one model, we have two separate models. We have the tokamak uh, tokamak complex model, which is represents the region of interest, and the uh, tokamak models, which contain the plasma. The plasma source. So somehow we need to compute the, the to compute the maps due to the plasma radiation in the tokamak complex. We need to somehow couple the radiation transmission between these two models. And this is normally done in the interneutronics community by modeling intermediate plasma radiation sources. Now to recap, the general process to compute the maps due to the plasma radiation are the following. So. First, what we need is to characterize the radiation levels right in front of the biosphere. And for that, we use ether tokamak models like the one that I'm showing on the right, ELIT, for example. So we would compute the radiation levels right in front of the biosphere here in the region that is marked with these dashed lines. Um, also, this is shown in this other image where we see the different radiation levels throughout the 360 degrees of the biosphere. And where, again, more red, red is more intense, dark blue is less intense. So once we have the radiation conditions right in front of the biosphere, what we would do is use this information to model a plasma radiation source right in front of the biosphere, right in this region that I am again indicating here with these dashed lines. And once we have this uh, plasma source, an intermediate plasma source, we will run radiation transport calculations in the ITER tokamak complex model to obtain this kind of maps. Well, as I'm saying, ITER, uh, sorry, ELIGHT was um, used for the ether radiation maps for the latest release, the one that was released in 2020. And these maps were used to characterize the radiation levels right in front of the virus. What I'm going to show here on the right is uh, how this characterization was done by using partial models in 2016 and how it was done in 2020 using ELIT. Again, here I'm not showing any quantities and, and, and any legend, I'm just showing radiation levels. And these radiation levels, were, I'm showing them through the different ports, one to 18, and through the different levels of the machine. You have to imagine that basically what I'm showing here is this cylinder, but extended over a plane. Now, by simply visually inspecting these maps, it is obvious that uh, there are some difference between them. However, I have to be honest, 
And the truth is that not all the differences are due to it. There are differences due to the approaches and other, uh, other factors that were considered in 2016 and differently considered in 2020. But the truth is that two big differences are due to it. One is shown here and the one I'm going to explain it later. So the, this, the first big difference is the fact that with elite, what we avoid is this kind of non-physical discontinuities. What you can see, well, I'm referring to these ones, the one that we have here in this kind of mosaic. What we see is that in elite, we don't have them. We have a smoother and much more realistic characterization of the radiation levels right in front of the biosphere. And basically, well, these, these um, discontinuities they are due to the, among other reasons, due to the symmetry assumption of partial models. So um, considering that ELA doesn't need to rely on this, on this symmetry assumption, they are not appearing in the map at the bottom. Also, the, the final effect or the, the eventual effect of these discontinuities is that they can introduce an impact, a deviation in the results. So therefore, when we avoid them, what we are doing is reducing uncertainties, and we are having a much more reliable characterization and modeling of the radiation source. The other difference, which is not shown in these maps, is the fact that just one simulation and just one model is needed to produce this map over here. Whereas here, we needed several models and several um, calculations. And this, believe me, is a huge improvement because it really facilitates the modeling, the review, and the update of the plasma source. And it makes a much more robust, uh, I mean, it, it makes the process of modeling the plasma radiation source more robust, and it allows to reduce the probability of human errors, which is quite important from a point of view of quality assurance. So now I jump finally to the summary and conclusions. So as I, as I mentioned at the beginning, nuclear analysis is a core discipline in ITER. And these nuclear analysis in ITER have to be very reliable. That's why we require very realistic models as ELITE and also Monte Carlo calculations. And therefore, that is why high performance computing is essential. Now, being more specific, what we mentioned is that ITER tokamak reference models have always been partial up to now. They have satisfied the demand of nuclear analysis over the years. However, they have limitations that affect the reliability and practicality of nuclear analysis. In this situation, to respond to these limitations, we have produced a 360 degrees model that is called ELIT. Now, ELIT, well, in summary, the main features are the the, the fact that it overcomes the limitations of partial models and allows to quantify their impact by itself or complementing um, nuclear analysis uh, performed with partial model, it increases the general reliability of ITER nuclear analysis. And ultimately, it allows to perform certain nuclear analysis that were not feasible within acceptable uncertainty margins until now. And this, I haven't mentioned it too much, but they are the nuclear analysis that will support the calibration of ITER neutron detectors. Also, ELITE facilitates the performance of certain nuclear analysis, as we have uh, seen. It, it uh, facilitates the modeling of the intermediate plasma radiation source for the tokamak complex radiation maps. And one important feature that I, I want to remark again is the fact that it is the most complete NCMP model ever produced in ITER. And it is usable thanks to optimization of the NCMP code and again, thanks to HPC facilities. Finally, I just want to add here that ELITE uh, has been incorporated by the ITER project as another one of its reference neutronics model. It has been and will be used in ITER nuclear analysis of relevance. And an example are the uh, 2020 radiation maps in the tokamak complex that I have just mentioned. But also, as another example, there, there are even more, is the certain dose rate maps of the tokamak complex that were performed by F4E, Fusion for Energy. Finally, I just mentioning that it has been highly valued and recognized within the ITER neutronics community. And has, such has been the, the recognition that I can happily say that uh, the, a publication dedicated to ELITE was um, releasing the prestigious uh, journal Nature Energy. And having said this, I just want to thank um, Technofusion, which has um, partially funded the, this work that I'm presenting here. And also thank you for, for your attention. Thank you, Gabriel, for this very nice talk. We have already Thank you. a few questions here. OK. So first one from Helen Brooks is asking, what is about ELI that makes it more suitable than NCMP to perform a full 360 neutronics analysis? What is what makes ELI more suitable than, than NCMP that? to perform a full 360 
What, what makes MCMP more suitable to run ELAB? Maybe is it because MCMP is the code and ELAB is, is the model. So we use MCMP to um, perform the calculations with ELAB. However, we needed uh, to modify some aspects of the memory management of MCMP to, to use ELAB. So basically, we need to upgrade some of the features of MCMP because MCMP originally was not conceived to run such huge models. And we need to tune that also Oak Ridge do some modifications and this is what allowed us uh, to use elite with mcmp i don't know if i responded to the to the question yeah thanks no, she, she was just i think was confusing between the two different models of it but yeah i, I think it was clear that you made an adaptation of the mcmp model for your elite mm -hmm. so yeah next question from marina Becule. these radiation maps were produced for what iter scenarios and how they will depend on fusion power. Okay, they were uh, performed for the, what they are called the mode zero operation, which is a uh, full plasma operation at 500 megawatts. Also, they are considering um, the possibility of having uh, 700 megawatt pulses. They can also, also I didn't mention the, this uh, in this slide, but also it has been used for um, mode one calculations that is shut down radiation maps and basically there the sa2 irradiation scenario which, con which considers the full uh, the complete irradiation scenario of ITER for neutron calculation was co was considered okay thanks we have a question from pedro bonilla some of the heating consequences of neutron deposition is desire to harvest the energy that will produce energy can you give details about the undesired heating consequences on the neutron deposition? Is it a matter of location, magnitude, or both? So, sorry, can you, can you, the, 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 so can is you repeat? A, so, yeah, <laughs> sorry. Some, some of the heating consequences of the mm -hmm. neutron deposition in the reactor, they are desired to produce energy. But okay, so, I have it here also, not a question. Uh, it's in the chat, but he says that some other, they will be, and desired. So ah, okay, some, some, okay, I said some heating will be desired and some heating will be yeah. undesired, no? Okay, okay, sorry, I guess I mentioned this at the beginning. Okay, now I, I follow, sorry. So, well, heating that will be desired, for example, not in ether, and that's maybe I was, I, it was a bit, um, well, I didn't say heating that was desired in ether, I just said I wanted heating, but, um, well, in the future reactors, we will want a desired heating to heat up the, the water and eventually produce um, electricity in in ether and much of the heat as far as i know is, is unwanted is undesired because well it heat adds the the components for example the magnets would need to uh, work at uh, certain temperatures very low temperatures so the heating of the magnets is undesired also the heating of certain components that uh, if it go, if it rises too much their temperature their, their mechanical stability and other aspects of of the different components can be altered when we have that heating so Pretty much a, a lot of the heat in, uh, producing in ITER is, is unwanted. In the future reactors, as I say, it will be necessary to, to produce the, the steam and, and produce electricity, electricity, but maybe I'm forgetting other benefits of having heat in, in ITER. And apologize for that, but now I'm, I'm not recalling. Okay, thanks. Then we have another question from Marina Becule. What HPC resources you need to run ELITE, CPUs, GPUs? What are the memory requirements and what time you need to produce the map? Good question, and I, and I, I was, I didn't put this, but um, it's a good question and good point. Well, we are using normally we're running in, in Marconi and uh, Mare Nostrum supercomputers, and uh, we are with CPU. We haven't yet tried, and this is something that is yet to be analyzed in the neutronics field. There are some advances that have been done in, in recent years with GPUs, but normally we, we run with CPU. The model by itself consumes um, per, per processor, it consumes around 2.5 uh, gigabytes. But then you have to add also um, the meshes necessary to compute the results. So it can add an additional um, memory requirements. But the truth is that we, we are achieving, for example, in, in Marconi to use the full load of the node while running ELITE uh, calculations. In fact, for the calculations of that I have shown here, the radiation levels right in front of the bison, we use full node load. 
Thanks. Uh, yeah, I think we have time for a very last question from Ezequiel Goldberg. He's asking when moving from one run on for each port to an integral run, considering all the ports, what is the computational in, increase in the, in the simulation? Okay, well, this is, as I say, it is not directly comparable because, um, for example, the, um, this, this question is related to the number of model of port models that are available. And there is, there was not the same number of ports used in 2016 and in 2020. But basically, uh, we can uh, reduce the total number of calculations to half because when we, in the approach that was used in 2016, although we were using a partial model that contains uh, one uh, port and two halves on the sides, we needed to compute one calculation per single port. So we could not benefit from the fact that we have two half ports on the side. So we need to do 18 calculations while maybe if we were considering that the model is 40 degrees, we only did it nine. So with Elite, uh, we, we reduce that number. Of, uh, it is true that it has to be said that for um, calculations, of course, um, if we want to achieve the same um, statistical, um, uh, sorry, the same statistical errors when computing a certain nuclear response, it is true that Elite is a bit much bigger model. So you need more, um, more simulations, more neutron histories to achieve the same statistical error as if you would use a partial model much smaller, basically because you need to populate all with neutron histories. However, if you want to compute nuclear responses that, that are not local, that are broader, and that you need in all the complete uh, model, with Elite you can achieve a, well, a reduction in some cases of half, maybe in some cases you don't reduce as much, but at most you can achieve a reduction of half the number of calculations that you will require with partial models. Very good. So yeah, thank you very much for the nice Thank discussion. you, and thank you all for the, for the discussion. Questions. We have to move on to the next talk. It will be given by Pedro Bonilla from the BSC Fusion Group. And the talk will be on multiphysics simulations of fluid of fusion-related phenomena with Alia code. So Pedro, when you are ready. Hello. So let me. So I need to share a screen. Okay, so can you see the full screen? Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. So uh, thank you, uh, Julio, and I want to also thank all the organizers for uh, for for this uh, workshop. Uh, interesting. I, can, workshop. I cannot. Sorry, Pedro. I, I cannot see yourself. Ah, yes. Sorry. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Ahead, sorry. Uh, so. Uh, again, thank you, you and the organizers for this workshop, and and and, and Pedro Bonilla, and, and well, all, thank you also to all the people attending the talk that will be on simulation of multiphysical phenomena with Alia, which is the Barcelona Supercomputing Center high performance software uh, for multiphysics. So uh, this work has been conducted by a big team. And the Barcelona Supercomputing Center is the main institution involved, but we are collaborating with ICREA, the National Atomic Energy Commission in Argentina, and the National Scientific and Technical Research Council also in Argentina. Um, this is the outline of my presentation. And then after the motivation, I will talk about ALIA and why we chose that tool for our work. And then I will give some highlights of three of the applications related to fusion that are currently under development by in our group. Um, so there's an increasing need of, for electricity production as pointed out in a previous talk by Frank Jenko. And the European Union is investing in fusion as one of the alternatives to produce clean energy. In the figure, you can see the roadmap that Eurofusion has established to demonstrate the feasibility of electricity production by means of fusion reactors. And at the moment, ITER and IFNIS Dones uh, material ITER reactor and IFNIS Dones material testing facilities are under construction, and demo reactor is going to be designed from new simulations, extrapolating the data obtained at, at ITER and IFNIS Dones facilities. Um, the design of these nuclear reactors relies heavily on in the modeling effort, as Fusion uh, Eurofusion states in its roadmap. 
and to model a whole reactor, uh, simulation tools ready to take advantage of the full capabilities of supercomputers are needed. And one of the aims of our group is to provide some of these tools uh, ready for, for exascale. Um, uh, and we have started for the more uh, engineering focused part of, of these simulations. So modeling a fusion reactor is a big challenge. So in previous talks, we have seen all the complexity of plasma physics and, and now uh, Gabriel Pedroche just talked us about uh, the, the, well, the, the neutron transport and all, all, all modeling all the, the, all the neutrons uh, transport and, and how they interact in, in, the, in the building. Um, and on top of that, there are multiple physical phenomena interacting uh, uh, to harvest this energy. So uh, the nuclear reaction of the plasma generate heat and, uh, and, and also uh, produce neutrons. And, and then this, uh, uh, well, in the, in, the, in the reactors that, that, will, that will produce uh, electricity, this heat and, and well, the neutron depositions will also uh, add heat to these uh, steel panels of the of the vacuum vessel, and then uh, there uh, the, the will be water coolant flowing through the uh, through this first wall that will uh, capture this heat and with uh, the double purpose: uh, first, of maintaining the structure on safe temperature levels, and second, transforming this captured heat into electricity in the primary heat uh, transfer system. And well, all these phenomena and others that, that are also present in the, in the fusion reactors, like plasma wall uh, interactions or electromagnetism, including superconductivity in order to contain the plasma, uh, adds even more level of multi-scale and in time uh, and space uh, for modeling the whole reactor. And the tools that are currently in use in the more engineering parts of these simulations may not scale up to exascale, and this is crucial to model a whole reactor. So our fusion group at Barcelona Supercomputing Center has chosen these more engineering parts of the simulation as a starting point for our work towards the full react reactor models uh, because of ALIA multiphysics solver. So the reasons for this choice is that ALIA is a computational mechanic code that has proven excellent scalability for other fields, as you can see in the figure on the right, that it's made for a um, cardiac electromechanical model uh, with explicit solvers and it reached uh, uh, th uh, 100,000 cores. So it used 100,000 cores on blue water and the mesh was roughly 3.5 uh, uh, billions of uh, small scale hydra. So uh, uh, another reason is that is, uh, ALIA is part of uh, six European Union funded centers of excellence in high performance computing. It is also part of the unifi unified benchmark um, application benchmark suite for supercomputers, which is a, a kind of benchmark that the European used to test the supercomputers and rank them. Um, it has a modular system, each of the modules describing a physical process. And this structure allows independent teams of experts to develop the physics modules and to be uh, well, to benefit of, of the uh, expertise and, and knowledge, and it, it has also a framework, uh, framework and coding conventions for the for the modular coupling within the software. That uh, in order to not require data converters or writing outputs or, or inputs files, which really slows this kind of uh, high performance computing simulations. And this uh, coupling is made at selected time steps, which allows uh, multi-scale simulations. Um, so what is this ALIA software I'm talking about? So it's uh, ALIA solves many different physics models based on differential partial equations through the finite element method. It can be used in structure or on structure meshes in, in differently. And it is currently applied to several fields of research, such as aerodynamics, combustion, biomechanics, strength of materials, or weather prediction. And also, we are using it for fusion. And it is not an open source code, but it is quite easy to obtain a free license in the, if the purpose is research. 
uh, well, it is code in Fortran with, paralyz with parallelization implemented from scratch with no need of user intervention. And well, uh, some examples of this parallelization is that uh, it uses MPI, OpenMP, vectorization, or OpenACC. And well, it's one of the very few external components that not developed uh, uh, for the VSC specifically uh, for for Alia is the automatic mesh partition that, that is, is used in the Metis library. And for fusion applications, our group uses the modules of Navier Stokes Fluid Dynamics, Turbulence, and Heat Transfer, and develops uh, the Deuton Transport module and the High te Temperature superconducti Superconductivity modules. So moving to the highlights of Alia applied to fusion, I will start with the coupling of the heat transfer and the fluid dynamic modules. And retaking this, this slide, uh, we are modeling the heat interchange that takes place in the first world reactor. So in here, uh, and the heat is, is produced by, by nuclear reactions itself uh, and the deposition of neutrons. And because we are working on the, uh, we are working on the, on the coupling of the neutron transport that is not uh, ready yet. We are using the available data of, of this heat. Uh, from a paper from Fradera, um, and then yeah, this heat is uh, is uh, transferred to the to the water coolant that is flu uh, flowing through through the first wall and, and cools the, the the panel uh, and keeps stable. Um, so we are using ITER design available data in order to test Alia and ITER as well. Uh, uh, Gabriel made a, a more detailed uh, description of ITER, but uh, just to sum up, uh, so ITER has a vacuum vessel with nine sectors uh, uh, here uh, you, that you can see here, and we are in uh, well, we're very much concentrated in one of the segments of one sector, which is this one in green, the PS01. Uh, and once benchmark Alia, uh, once Alia is benchmarked and, and validated, it will be an excellent tool for the design of future uh, fusion reactors. So here are uh, some more details about the complex geometry of this segment. All these intermodular keys here on, on green uh, are designed to align interfacing components and to maximize the effectiveness of, of, the, of this heat transfer by speeding the flow next to the main heat exchange surface. And, and these holes in, in pink will host the housing that will act as bolts to fasten all steel parts together. And of course, to create the, uh, they create a, a turbulence in the flow that it's one of the difficulties in the model. So, the meshes that we are using in our competition for this segment have approximately 5 million elements for the fluid domain and 2 million elements for the solid. So uh, this slide summarizes the physics model used by the uh, modules in this benchmark. So the coupling between the two main different partial, partial equations, which are the energy conservation equation and the navier storage equation, is here stressed out in red, so the velocity in the energy conservation equation and the, then the density and the viscosities in case that that uh, we use compressible we decide to use compressible flows um, depend on the temperature and we also use the turbulence mental shear transfer tra shear stress transport k omega and the business approximation which well which uh, reflects in this uh, in this first equation. Uh, so the heat transfer and the fluid and dynamic models are two of the most developed models in Alia. They have multitude of options uh, for time skin and anigmatic solvers. And let me just point out that Alia uses large city simulations of subgrid scales stabilization methods in, if someone is interested in the formulation in more detail. So this is the approach that we follow for the capital problem post with a separate mesh for the fluid and the solid. There is a first instant coupling in the, in the fluid uh, in which the, well, the, the modules of heat transfer that it's called temper and the Navier-Stokes uh, uh, incompressible that it's called nasting 
are sharing our couplet uh, in the same mesh. And then there's another inst uh, second instance coupling between the steel and uh, well the solid and the water uh, between the two temper modules, uh, in which well they indistinctly uh, uh, need to communicate the temperature and the gradient of the temperature, and this is needed because the steel is the is the domain where the prescribed uh, heat volumetric source uh, on the heat volumetric source is prescribed so we need this coupling in order to to make the heat transfer um among the, res the resolution schemes available we tried first the explicit scheme which allows enabling automatic for for the sorry this is for the fluid dynamic results uh, so among the resolution schemes, we use uh, the explicit scheme, which allows enabling automatic critical uh, time step estimation. So in the figure here, you can see how uh, the shorter simulation time steps uh, concentrate the, the, in the area where the velocity gradients are larger, as this is as expected. And it shows that the predictive time, uh, adaptive time step is working. And then once we had these uh, critical time steps, we ran also uh, the same implicit uh, scheme with a with a fixed uh, time step that it's slightly shorter to the to the one uh, that was uh, to the minimum of the one or the most limited one uh, produced by the explicit uh, um, solver. And here is the comparison, and you can see that the, the same implicit uh, scheme is working slightly better, but the difference is not much, it's roughly at 20%. So uh, the two models are valid in order to perform the, the computations. Uh, this is a video of, of the simulation of, of the fluid dynamics, and here you can see that, uh, well, that it. Uh, that well, the flow uh, speeds up in these uh, narrow channels, and then due to these, uh, well, due to all these elements of the geometry uh, that creates this turbulence, uh, the steady state is kind of cyclic. So, and then for the multiphysics results, for the couple results, I'm showing a section that it's closer to the heat interchange that, than the other one, and that's why. why here we have higher velocities closer to the intermodular keys here on the right uh, that well, are these uh, the well these geometries that are designed as i told to 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 align the different uh, the different uh, components of the sector and the segment and of course uh, they well they they are designed with this uh, geometry of this piece in order to sp speed up and direct the, the flow to all this area here which is where the highest concentration of the of temperature uh, uh, is located on the on the steel plate um in the so you can see here that then the the coupling is is working correctly because this heat is uh, being conducted downstream and here on on this plot you can see actually uh, like the temperature is growing as we go downstream of, of this piece so the results uh, for the fluid flow uh, are in in agreement with the with the reference data that it's from the paper of Radera uh, 2015 that I comment earlier and and the ones for the temperature are promising, but we are currently uh, slightly overestimating the well, overheating the system. So we are looking into that. We are uh, working on other cases that I will not show uh, because they are on very preliminary phases, allowing a, a, a multi multi flow, uh, multiple phases flows like uh, so like the Fides facility water facility from the Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. And that that it's well, it will be a target of, of the very similar to the Ignit Dones facility. Um, so moving to the next highlight, that will be the the neutrons transport. So now uh, the fusion. Uh, so now we are focusing on this uh, neutron uh, neutron production uh, due to the reaction in, inside the plasma, and. The motivation of, of this work of, of the development of the work is because this neutron will not interact with the surrounding materials and uh, 
uh, it is needed a, a, a high fidelity simulation of this transport is needed uh, in order to study in detail the shielding, the tritium breathing, and uh, heat and, and damage in the rest of the components of the of the neutron of the fusion reactor. And the physics model of the uh, is and relies on the stationary deterministic equation for with no fusion terms and with the part particularity that the prob probability of dispersion between the two directions is only dependent on the angle of the angle. And some of the characteristics of the formulation is, is that for the space discretization, it uses finite elements in order to be uh, consistent with the rest of ALIA code. For the angular discretization, it, used the, it uses the discrete uh, ordinates method. And for the energy discretization, the multigroup approximation. And for the scattering term, a spherical harmonic expansion. Um, this is one of the examples of the kind of benchmarks that have been run to validate the module. In here, we have a slab of iron, uh, 5T6, that well, we compare the we, we compare the the specter and uh, the the lethargy neutron specter on on this lab and with the shielding integrated benchmark archive database which is uh, available from the nuclear agency energy agency and as you can see there's a very good agreement between the simulation and the experimental results and I will, the second of the ALIA modules that has been developed uh, with fusion in mind is the high temperature super, uh, superconductors one. And high temperature, high temperature superconductors are already part of fusion reactor designs, as for instance in demo magnetic fields here in the picture. And well, the, about the motivation is that. Uh, well, these superconductors are, are key to reactor design because they allow higher current at higher magnetic fields, leading to more compact reactor design, like the one here on the on the picture, that it's a spherical tomahawk uh, from Tomahawk and Energy. But as I mentioned, some of the components of demo are already also being designed with these uh, high temperature superconductors in mind. And the physics behind super, uh, superconductivity uh, is, uh, is highly complex. And running this module without coupling already requires uh, uh, a lot of computational resources. And at the moment, the, the electromagnetism part of the module is ready to be used. And the coupling with the heat transfer and the solid mechanic modules is under development. And well, we will need these couplings in order to, well, to, to accurately model all the phenomena like the cable stability against energy deposition, the AC losses, the quench propagation velocity, the hotspot temperature, or the mechanical stability of these uh, wires or, of, super, of superconductors. So the physics model of, the, of this module is based on the H formulation of maximal equations, and in particular, the nonlinear constitutive flow based on the electric field and current density. Some of the characteristics of this model is that it uses edge elements or nedelic elements, that uh, it uses an implicit backward differentiation formula uh, for, uh, as the time scheme integration and also has this adaptive time step uh, feature that I was talking of, of the, on the fluid dynamics uh, module. And for the nonlinearity, uh, well, they are solved with the Newton method. This is the simplest of the benchmarks that has been run uh, to validate this module. And we're assuming shutdown current with uh, of, of, 50, of 50 hertz and an amplitude of, of 400 amperes is uh, applied to an infinite circular wire of, of, of these uh, characteristic values. And you can see here that, again, uh, the results of the simulation agree with the very well for the analytical solution in all the fronts, like the current density, the energy losses inside the wire, or the magnetic field energy. Um, so I talked very briefly about these two models because there are two talks specific about each one of the models. So the, about the neutron transport sol, uh, module, uh, it will be given by FK Goldberg at, at uh, five minutes to uh, at 15.55. And, and about the high temperature supercondition module, uh, it will be given by Uriel Fernandez at, at uh, 
1655. So to conclude, I will point out that theory and model effort is crucial for fusion energy development, that to model a whole fusion device, efficient exascales capability are required. And ALIA is built specifically to model multiphysics partial differential equation, equations with exascale in mind. Uh, multiphysics applications based on ALIA are already under development, like the thermohydraulics, neutron transport, high temperature and high temperature superconductivity uh, superconductivity that I show. And the benchmarks show as good accuracy as available alternatives. And that we hope to provide an integral exascale tool for model fusion reactors, solving some of the computing challenges in fusion reactor design. So thank you for your attention. And I need to mention that this work is funded by FusionCAT, which is a consortium of seven Catalan institutions uh, co-funded by the uh, local government of Catalonia and the European Union. And here are some of well, my email and some of the uh, group uh, media uh, addresses if you are interested in span the information. Thank you. Thanks, Pedro, for the next talk, for giving this very nice overall overview of the Alia code and all the group activities we are doing in Fusion. So we already have a couple of questions here in the chat. The first one is from Dominic Stanak who is asking, like you mentioned, that ALIA is not open source, but it's easy to obtain. Mm -hmm. It's not open source. Uh, it, it means that, well, uh, I, I don't know the details. I can ask for the people, uh, for the, if you are interested, for uh, to the people who is managing this license. But usually you need to ask for one of the license and you are granted access to because it's because it has a lot of modules so you are uh, uh, granted access to the modules that you ask for uh, depending on your product on your project and well the bsc needs to approve this this project but it's uh, i don't know any uh, research project that has been restricted access to 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 the code Thanks. And then we have a next question from Rupert Early. I'm not sure if I understand this first part, but is your NS module FE or FV based? Sorry, can you repeat? Is your NS module, I guess the NS should be a neutron solver, I don't know, module is based on FE or FV? And what missioners do you use? I, sorry, I, I don't. I, I'm not involved in the in the in the development of the fusion uh, of the neutron transport module, so I don't know if Ezekiel is. I'm oh, sorry, sorry. So he says that the NS is the Navier Stokes. Ah, okay. So it's based on FE or FV. I is probably finite elements, I guess. And it's finite elements. All the codes are finite elements. Yeah. Yeah, so it's not finite volume. So all, all, yeah, all ALIA is based on, yeah, sorry. All ALIA is based on finite elements. And yeah, it, it's it's weird because it's one of the few solvers that it's based on finite elements, but but it's to be consistent with all the formulation and to be able to communicate all the, all, all the parameters or, or all the values and all the fields in the, in the same, in the same way uh, and, and to also to use the same way of integrating and all this all the modules in, in alia use uh, finite elements as the space space discretization okay thanks and the second part of the question is what preconditioners do you use um for the simulations i show i'm using no preconditioners so uh, it's there are some preconditioners uh, implemented in some of the modules and actually uh, our group is working in one uh, preconditioner um, uh, specifically built for for the for the magnet module uh, i don't know much about this but i know that uh, all of the preconditioners that are used, so we are not using any external source or, or preconditioners. There's also, so if you want, there's the possibility to to implement uh, preconditioners, but but all the person uh, the preconditioners that I have default uh, used in in Alia are 
uh, built by the team of, of more uh, numerical method experts in, in, in Alia. Okay, thanks. And we have another question from Mary Kay Chessy, who is asking, are there many other examples of ex experimental data sets to compare with the couple fluid dynamics and heat transfer simulations? Well, we are, there are not many, uh, or, or at least that we are aware of, and uh, we are actually looking for, for more uh, uh, cases to, to, well, to, to use as, as benchmark. As I mentioned already, this uh, is, um, this case of the that it, it's a target for the uh, developed by the uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology, and yeah, related with fusion, there are not many. Well, we are not aware of that many data sets that allow us to to test the. The, the case. There are other uh, data sets outside of the fusion field. Uh, so if any of the attendants has any, any case that he, he wants to compare the experimental results with simulations or, or that we are open to collaborations, of course. Okay, very good. And then I think we have time for a very last question from Marina Beculé. It's more like a comic. She's actually impressed about scaling of the code and is asking if it's it depends on the application yes yes of course it, it depends on the application because because there are some well there are some uh, at the end uh, the the system of equations that depends on the on the partial differential equation and the uh, and for example uh, the uh, we are developing a preconditioner for this. Well, the, my colleagues no, uh, are, are uh, building this uh, specific uh, preconditioner for the for for the uh, high temperature superconductor uh, module because because we have some some problems in, in the scaling of this particular module by the by the by the ill conditioning of of this of this system of equations and so so yes yeah, so it depends. On the on on the partial differential equation uh, you are using, and of course also on the on the physical case. Okay, thank you. So thank you very much, Pedro, for the nice presentation. It's time to move on to the next one, the last presentation of the session that will be given by Helen Brooks from the Coolhan Center for Fusion Energy in the UK, and she will also present multi-physics simulations of reactors with Aurora code. So Helen, when you're ready, first yours. Thank you, uh, can you hear me? Yeah. Great, I'll share my screen. Is it working? Ah, there we go. Uh, can you confirm you can see the slides, please? Yeah, perfect, yeah. Great, yeah. lovely, thank you very much. Uh, so I want to start by thanking the organizers for the invitation and for putting together a really nice program of talks. I'd like to applaud the previous two speakers from this session for some really nice talks on, on the same topic. Um, and um, I'd like to acknowledge Andrew Davis, who is the technical lead on this project, who has uh, provided a lot of support and guidance for, for this work. Okay, so here is the overview of the talk. I've broken it down into four parts. First, I'll give uh, some very general introduction and context for uh, the work that has been done. I'll then move on to discuss uh, the software tool that I've been uh, developing um, over the last 12 months. Uh, in the third section, I'll uh, talk about, I'll show you some illustrative results. And then finally, I will look to the future and give some outlook and summarize. All right, so without further ado, so here's the context. I expect you've heard of this already, but uh, in case you haven't, I, the project that I work on is STEP, which is the UK AEA's government funded project for uh, which stands for the Spherical Tokamak for Energy Production. And it has the following mission that I've quoted here, uh, which is to deliver a prototype energy plant, fusion energy plant targeting 2040 and a pathway to viable commercial fusion. So I want to unpack that a bit. And the very first thing I want to focus on is the date, which is 2040, which is really soon. Um, in and it's a very accelerated, ambitious program. 
especially when you take into account that this is a less conventional tokamak geometry compared to jet eater demo which are your conventional donut shaped tokamaks this is a uh, slightly different geometry which is more compact um uh and then uh so in terms of the software tools that we have to develop a lot of the engineering analysis is really going to be having to happen within the next few years really we're already two and a half years into the first five year uh phase of funding in which we need to come up with a concept um the second point i want to focus on is that this is an energy plant it's going to uh, be plugged into the national grid. So this isn't just about coming up with a, uh, a plasma scenario and investigate uh, experimentally the scaling relations. This really needs to deliver electricity. And then the final point is that of commercial fusion, which is that if successful, this should be a, a blueprint for future reactors uh, to build upon. And so some of the things that are going to be optimized for are going to be different because things like making it cheap and affordable are also important considerations. And so when you think of all of those things together, there is really an urgent need to develop software tools for our engineers to, uh, to design and optimize uh, future tokamaks. Okay. So when I speak of engineering software, what is it that I am envisaging? I want to uh, drill into that a little bit now. Uh, the keynote speakers spoke of digital twins for plasmas. Um, I want to speak of digital twins for the whole tokamak machine outside of the plasma. So uh, what I mean by that is a real time simulate transient simulation so uh, that you can just that will model all of the components in a tokamak and how they behave given some initial conditions let's say a plasma scenario and really understand some very basic questions like how how long will these things live what are their lifetimes how um how will they perform given some uh, heat gradients and um and all of the forces from the fields that are going on um, and how all of these systems behave as a cohesive whole. Of course, to model an entire tokamak, especially if you take into consideration just the level of fidelity that you'll need, if you do a back of envelope calculation for the kind of resolution you'll need for the detail and then scale that up to a tokamak, you're talking billions of degrees of freedom, just the memory footprint and the amount of CPU to loop over those things, it's quite easy to see that it is an exascale problem. And while exascale computers are coming, they're on the horizon and there are lots of plans for them, they're not readily available to everyone right now. Um, and even if they were, the software that we have available is not yet ready, I would say, for, to tackle the exascale. And so in the short term, we will be focusing on a smaller, uh, smaller scale things. Uh, so to give examples, the blanket, the magnet and the diverter. So why focus on these? Well, not least because they are absolutely crucial to have a plasma in the first place. You need the magnets to confine the plasma. You need the blanket to absorb the neutrons and actually transmit away the useful energy. And also uh, in a breeder blankets to produce um, a, a tritium to feed back into the fusion reactions and the diverter to uh, divert away the excess heat. However, more importantly, these all to model these, it will require modeling of all of the key physics areas, which uh, the previous speaker has alluded to, and I will uh, also outline here. So that includes things like neutronics, thermodynamics, mechanics, and that includes mechanical contact, so things touching, electromagnetism, fluid dynamics, uh, chemical damage and uh, deterioration of, of materials and tritium production. And so if you like these components, represent a microcosm of what it is that we're trying to build to. So as long as what we make is sufficiently scalable, we could envisage that if we can model these, that eventually someday we might be able to move on to a full tokamak. OK, so that's the vision. Uh, but how are we going to get there in practice? Well, we need the software to do it. And it is widely acknowledged that the, uh, the typical tools that your average engineer will use so these are typically commercial tools. They do not scale, scale very well beyond the desktop. 
And so we need to not only develop a suite of HPC engineering analysis tools, but we need these to be adopted by our engineers. And so in order for that to be the case, this leads us to a number of really key requirements that our software has to adhere to. So the very first is that it must be easy to use. If our engineers think that it's just impossible to understand, then it's not gonna be adopted and everything that we will have done will be for naught. The second point is portability. We don't quite know yet what the architectures of the future are going to look like when we finally get access to uh, to exascale computing as part of our as part of our lives. And so we're kind of agnostic as to what exactly the platform's going to be. And so we don't exactly want to tailor to anything in particular, but be as general as possible. So we want to be independent of the architecture. The third point is reliability. So we are, go we are talking about making fu fusion an energy source that everyone is going to use. And that is going to mean that there will be regulation standards for that environment. And so if we're making engineering predictions that are going to be used in engineering designs, then our software must be verified and validated and trustworthy. And so it must adhere to software quality standards uh, that are going to have some sort of regulations upon it. And finally, this product that we're delivering, it's not just for step, it's to, we're looking much, much further ahead. The pattern that we deliver now uh, is hopefully going to be used and uh, continue to be used much later into the future. And so we need to be future-proof. And what I mean by that is it needs to be a maintainable code and it needs to be an extensible code. So as, we, as our capabilities get more and more, we need to be able to add to this code. And so all of these thoughts have led us to a, a very fundamental point, which is that we want to go down an open source approach. Okay, so that's enough about the context of what it is that we're doing. So now I'm going to talk about the tool that I have been developing uh, and working on. Um, apologies now if you just read the title and we're expecting a talk about the cluster in the US. Um, I will confess that when I came up with this name, I was relatively fresh faced to the field of high performance computing and wasn't aware of the latest developments in supercomputers. Um, and so I know. Uh, unaware I chose the same name. Um, I, so I'll apologize for any confusion, but I won't apologize for picking the same name because clearly great minds think alike. So talking about the software tool Aurora now, um, this is an acronym for a unified resource for OpenMC reactor applications with a silent fusion. So we're thinking about fusion, but actually in principle, it should be completely general multi-physics tool. Okay, so what is it designed to do? It's designed to work, it is built within the Moose framework, and it is designed to tightly couple Monte Carlo neutron transport with thermo thermomechanics, which has been done through finite element analysis. So I'm gonna say more about Moose and other dependencies on the next slide. Uh, so I'll come back to that. Um, and as, um, uh, apologies, adhering to the manifesto that I put forward on the previous slide, this is fully sourced, it's licensed under LGPL v2. And it's available already on GitHub. So, and we've got continuous integration and um, unit testing and Docker images and documentation. So if you're interested, download it, try it out. If you have feedback, if you want to contribute, please get in touch. We're more than happy to work with other people. Um, so what are we trying to do? What's the idea? The point is that the neutron transport calculations that are being done, those nuclear cross sections are going to have a dependence on the material temperature and also on the number of atoms and therefore the density. However, given the fact that the neutrons are going to deposit energy in the material, that will act as a heat source that will give rise to a temperature increase and therefore thermal expansion. So both of these two fields, the temperature and the density are expected to change. And therefore we want to capture that feedback and pass it back in to an updated neutron transport calculation. Um, so now onto the dependencies. So we don't want to reinvent the wheel, and so therefore we rely heavily on, on our sets of dependencies. So the first is Moose. Moose is a finite element framework uh, that's rather flexible and largely allows you to automatically create your own uh, multi-physics application without a lot of effort. Uh, it's, it's proven to be scalable up to 32,000 cores, which is quite impressive. 
But again, adhering to some of the philosophies that I've previously outlined, it's open source and community driven. So they're very responsive um, uh, at, uh, and at implementing new things where it's required. Um, and it's also built on two high performance libraries itself. So LibMesh is responsible for the meshing and for the actual organization of the finite element calculation. And Petsy, which is responsible for the linear algebra and uh, preconditioning of those matrices that appear. Moose is modular in so much as it has already many physics modules built in. It has a number of things such as heat conduction, it has fluids, it has mecha tensor mechanics, it has uh, different phases, it has a growing list of things. And because it's community driven, this is growing, this list is growing all of the time. It's extensible in a number of ways. Obviously it's open source. And so you can largely speaking, do anything that you want. But in terms of ease of extensibility, if you just have a problem that is expressible as a finite element problem, and you know what kernels you want to add, it's almost trivial to add some new kernels to it and then call them in your application. It's hierarchical. And this is very important in the context of multi-physics because also by virtue of the different physics having different scales, you might want to run your problem over different time steps. And therefore you might want to embed your apps within each other in some recursive structure. And Moose provides support for this through something called multi-apps. And finally, Moose adheres to software quality standards. So that's our main dependency, Moose. Now for Neutronics, um, so very much like the first talk in the session, it's, um, it's, it's Monte Carlo Neutronics, and unlike the second talk where it's deterministic Neutronics, um, OpenMC uh, is like MCMP, but it's, uh, it's, it's modern, it's C++, um, and it's shown to be very scalable. So uh, left to its own devices, you would have to specify your geometry with sort of Boolean operations, which is very uh, uh, manual if you have a very complex geometry. So what, this, what may be enabled via this next library, DAGMC, is the ability to perform Monte Carlo on CAD geometry. So if you've got a CAD model, you can mesh that model and perform neutronics on it. And the way that DAGMC does it, I don't want to spend too long on this, but it uh, creates surfaces and performs ray tracing uh, through those surfaces. And so it doesn't have to hold the whole volume of everything, but rather it just needs to calculate how long until a particle hits the next surface. And then finally, I want to mention that DAGMC uses a different meshing library than LibMesh, which is Moab. Um, and I mentioned this just because it's going to come up in, uh, in the context later in the talk. Okay, so I want to now quali uh, qualitatively say what it is that Aurora is doing. So we start with some uh, volume mesh that is in Exodus format and is loaded into Moose. Um, and that is passed into OpenMC and is used to create a, uh, an unstructured mesh upon which tallying is done. So OpenMC is responsible, as I've said, for performing the neutron transport upon a geometry that has DAGMC surfaces in it. And then you record think quantities such as the flux, such as the heat deposited by neutrons upon that unstructured mesh. Now, having done that simulation, that, is, that information is passed back in memory into Moose, and that, um, and that provides a heat source. The heat source is then a term which can be sampled um, uh, for heat conduction. And this is a little video. These results aren't too important. It's just to uh, illustrate. Uh, heat source for heat conduction. Um, in addition to that, it solves, in, uh, it solves coupled temperature and displacement. So not only do you have a temperature rise, but you will have thermal expansion, as I've already mentioned. So that leads to displacement. So here's, here's a little thing of uh, showing displacements. And you do this for whatever time step is appropriate for your problem. Okay, so now we're starting to close the loop. So we organize, uh, having retrieved our results for the displacements and for the temperature, um, and hence density as well uh, from, de from displacements, we can organize those elements into bins. So where, uh, how, how different they are uh, from their original results. And this allows us to define local regions uh, which we can approximate as having some fixed temperature and density. 
And then we take the surfaces of those regions, and this now becomes the new DAGMC surfaces for the neutron transport problem. So we pass these surfaces back into OpenMC and, these, and with new material properties and new nuclear cross-sections, and then we repeat the process. And we can go round and round for as long as we like, um, or so for as many time steps as you like, or until you have some stopping conditions. So may that be steady state or perhaps some component melted, which is unideal, but perhaps that's what you're trying to investigate. Okay, so I'm very quickly going to go through some illustrative results now. Um, so here's a, quite a simple model. It's, it's really just to sort of conceptually show what it is that we do. Uh, so we have a blanket module. So this is just a slice. Um, uh, this is an unstructured tetrahedral mesh with 10 to the five degrees of freedom. So not very big. Um, it's not very large either in terms of real, real geometry. So it's about a meter and a half across in X. It's a bit shy of a meter in Y and it's about 10 centimeters across. And so this would be repeating. And if you want to understand where this is in relation to the plasma, the plasma is above in Y. Um, so you might want to rotate it in your head and then imagine that in Z, you've got this repeating pattern for your blanket. A comment on the materials. So I've only got three materials in this problem. I've got steel for the supports. I've got lithium orthosilicate, which is a material being considered for breeder blankets. And we've got a lead neutron multiplier surrounding the breeder. Okay, um, the this, apologies for the very boring slide here. This is just a few words on the analysis setup. Uh, this isn't entirely meant to be fully uh, fully accurate. This is just sort of to give you a sense of what you might have to do to set up a problem. So uh, we specify some time scales. We specify our initial temperature, which here is room temperature. Um, in this particular problem, we have not coupled to fluids. And so we estimate the heat cooling effect of pipes, which are in the problem via heat transfer coefficients. Um, and you can see here what those values are. On the Monte Carlo side, we're just placing a uniform neutron source in the XZ plane. So if I switch back, it's just going to be above here. It's just a little rectangle above the problem, and that's a sort of proxy for the plasma. You could do something more realistic. Uh, probably uh, OpenMC has quite a lot of capabilities, but this is just a just for show here. Um, I've put a neutron source strength of 10 to the 17. Again, this is a bit low, so it takes all the results with a pinch of salt. Um, and then I perform 10 batches of 10 to the 5 particles, but I could have done more. Okay, so here's a lot of pretty pictures, which again are just intended to show you what, what kind of things that you can get out of Aurora. So here's the neutron flux that comes out of uh, OpenMC. Here's the heat that gets deposited. Now this is, if you recall, this is the heat source that we're going to use in our finite element problem. Here's the tritium production. So this is another thing that OpenMC can do. And in fact, if OpenMC can do it, then we can do it. You just specify in your input files what tallies you want. Um, here's the temperature. So I've got a nice little video here. It's just a few seconds, which shows the temperature increasing over a, a thousand seconds. So I took uh, time steps of 30 seconds here, which isn't, isn't too, uh, which is quite broad really, but it's good enough. And you can see that the temperature has increased in this particular model up to 600 degrees. Uh, Kelvin. Um, and so here's just a quick uh, slice in time and a slice uh, across of what the temperature contours look like for this problem. So in, in addition to the contours that you have for your materials, you've also got now these additional boundaries uh, adhering to where the temperature increases. So you can see you've got quite a lot here in the breeder region where it's rapidly going up in temperature. Okay, so it wouldn't be an HPC talk if I didn't talk about scaling. Um, so I've actually got improved results on this relative uh, in the last few days. So this is kind of really just illustrative and I think we can improve upon this greatly. But I've so far just looked at the shared memory parallel scaling. So this was done just on a single node at a cluster CSD3 in Cambridge. Um, so that's single node, which goes up to 56 threads. Um, and uh, it's been shown that OpenMC should be scaling well with threads. The observant among you might be able to see that this is not close to ideal scaling, even though there is performance increase with the number of threads. I think there's more to be played with this. And in fact, I've already found that I get better results doing things like pinning of threads. Um, so think of these results as illustrative, but not the final story. Uh, but just some details of what I've done in this particular run, I've averaged over 10 runs per point, um, and each of those 
Monte Carlo runs have had 10 batches of 10 to the 5 particles. Um, I probably should have said earlier what I'm actually comparing here. So this is just the sub, when I say Aurora here, I just mean the sub application in Aurora that calls OpenMC. But I still a non-trivial comparison because what we're doing here is we're reading in the mesh in a different format. We're passing that into OpenMC to create the tallies and we're retrieving results and storing them as well. So there is some additional operations. And the real takeaway from this slide is that doing this has not really resulted in any significant overhead. In this slide, you can't even see it uh, given the uh, statistical variations that we're seeing. So if there's one takeaway message is that this is not this. If we if OpenMC can do it, then we should be able to do it, too. OK, so finally, this is my outlook and summary. So I should be quite quick here. Um, uh, so this is really the first step in the story. This we haven't finished yet. Um, just on the, what we've done already, there's more to do in, in the area of neutronics and thermal mechanics, which is to perform a systematic study to understand what is the impact of, the, of this coupling. But in future directions for the physics, we need to couple to fluids. So Moose already has fluids. Um, and so in principle, we should be able to do this. We just need to figure out what the best way to do it is, what best setup is. Um, and then a uh, couple to tritium transport. So you saw that we have results for tritium, but we now need to see how that's going to be transported throughout the material. And this can give us some idea of, of um, tritium breeding. Okay, so on performance, I've really only just started looking at this. So we really need to do some benchmarking with higher fidelity models and more particles per batch. Um, and also we need to do some benchmarking with distributed memory and hybrid parallelism. Um, and that will lead us to some recommendations for what the optimal distribution should be. Um, if you're interested in performance, especially with regard to Moose, then I recommend Hulita and Chiroke's talk later this afternoon, in which she looks at the benchmarking of Moose for a variety of different preconditioners and options for a, a given uh, physics problem. Okay, but um, Aurora is not intended to work alone. So I've only talked about the coupled neutronics and thermomechanics, but this is intended to be coupled with a whole suite of growing tools that can be found here at this URL, Aurora Multiphysics on GitHub. Um, and uh, following the same vein, it, uh, they've all been named after myth uh, mythological gods from uh, Roman and Greek uh, pantheons. So, uh, the symbolism should hopefully be there. Apollo is the Roman god of the sun. Phaeton uh, is the son of Helios, who lost control of the sun chariot. So perhaps is appropriate for fast islands, which destabilize your um, destabilize your plasma. And Atlas, the Greek goddess of mist. So if you think of mist diffusing, that's appropriate for modeling trans uh, tritium. And I didn't mention, but Apollo is for uh, electromagnetism. Um, and in particular vortices and superconductive um, uh, superconducting materials. Okay, and because of this um, recursive structure, these can be trivially combined, at least from a software perspective. In terms of appropriate time stepping for the different problems, that's going to be an interesting multi-scale problem. Okay, so here's the conclusion. Uh, our goal was to create user-friendly open source architecture agnostic multi-physics and multi-scale engineering tools. And so our, our new code Aurora is a first step towards this goal. Uh, focusing on tightly coupled neutronics and thermomechanics, and it leverages existing proven tools, uh, Moose, OpenMC, DAGMC, and it's intended to couple to a suite of other underdeveloped tools that focus on electromagnetism, tritium transport, and fast ions, just to name a few, in addition to, of course, all of the physics modules that are already built into Moose. Okay, so that's it. I think I've got a couple of minutes over time, but um, if you have any questions, I will happily take them now. Thank you, Helen, for the very nice talk. Yeah, we have time for a couple of questions, so I will start myself. You mentioned that from neutron irradiation, you heat up the material, and then from the thermal expansion coefficient, you increase the volume, right? But also in the long term, you will have swelling, right? So from yes. neutron irradiation, yeah. you have defects, and that will provoke swelling that will also change the volume of the material. No, no, that, that is what I was talking about. Okay, so, so yeah. you take into account both like thermal expansion coefficient and swelling from defects. Oh, from defects, I see. Yeah, yeah from defects. I mean, ah, like, uh, okay. Um, no, we. I see. I see the, the point. Um, no, we're not defects at the moment, um, but sort of. Uh, yeah, I mean, that that sounds like a great idea. We should do that. <laughs> <laughs>
questions. And then we have a question from Mary Kate Chessy, who's asking, how do developers and engineers interact currently or plan for the future to achieve the goal of widely adoptable fusion code for engineers? Um, I mean, I can only speak for sort of the environment in which I work, which is the STEP project. So, um, you know, we're organized into different areas. So we have an area for engineering, but of course we do talk to each other and uh, we frequently give seminars to each other. And uh, there's a lot of crosstalk. Um, and a lot of what we're trying to do at the moment is really just show that these tools are um, are suitable for the kind of problems that our engineers are wanting to work on. Um, so I think our challenge in the next couple of years is to is to kind of persuade them to move away from their conventional tools. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know if that's similar to, to in other organizations or not. Uh, I don't know if I can really make a fully general comment to answer that one. Okay, thanks. So yeah, I don't see any more questions at the time and we are it's already quarter past. So Thank you, Helen, for this talk, and thank you to all the speakers and to all people who joined the session. Uh, we'll have a lunch break or coffee or dinner, depending where you are. And we'll be back in an hour, so quarter past one at Central Europe time, where we will have the keynote presentation from Marina Bekule. In the meantime, you will also have a link if you want to have the virtual tour on Marina Room 4, our supercomputer and the link will appear or has appeared already in the chat. So thank you for joining and see you later. Now it's time to start the session. Uh, welcome to the session. Thank you very much for your participation. Um, this session consists of mainly MHD related topic. Uh, for your information, uh, please, when you ask question, please use the Q&A tab, which you can find in the below of your screen. Let's move on to the first uh, talk. This is a keynote talk delivered by uh, Dr. Marina Beclé from CEA Cadrage, France. Uh, Marina, now uh, you have our attention. Uh, thank you very much, Amen. I will share my screen. Mm -hmm. Okay, can you hear, can you see? Yes, I can see. Okay, I'll change to full screen. Okay, is it okay? Great. Thank okay, um, thank you very much uh, for organizing this nice workshop. I enjoyed it very much. And during this difficult time, it's still very important to keep in touch with uh, all uh, people doing fusion and especially um, modeling. It's a little bit frustrating because you can ask questions in person, but still, uh, thank you very much for keeping us alive and active. So my talk will be about first principle modeling of magnetodynamic uh, stabilities and their control in magnetic fusion devices using, using HPC techniques. So I'm only presenter and I will present on the behalf of our community. Um, and the small introduction about MHD instabilities control, which are essential in ITER. And then I will present you a nonlinear MHD code JOREC. There are a lot of codes uh, around the world, but um, since I'm working with it, and since it seems to me it's most um, advanced in uh, doing uh, modeling and then uh, optimizing uh, control methods. So I will uh, focus on this one. And I'll present fluid and kinetic approaches and some applications we're doing. And as you can imagine, it's difficult to present all applications. I will focus on the um, only few of them. And in the first place, I will show you some progress in understanding of H localite modes physics, which was done um, during this nonlinear HD modeling with our code. 
and some discoveries we did recently. And then we'll go to um, progress and understanding of resonant magnetic perturbations, which are used uh, to control nonlinear MHD uh, instabilities like ELMS. And then we will see some aspects also discovered during the modeling and due to um, help of uh, high performance computing, obviously, then we conclude. So <clears throat> as you saw already in many presentations, this fusion research is strong synergy between experiment theory, numerical modeling, computer science. And all of us were working to guarantee the success of ITER and then uh, DEMO, obviously. And also you saw already is that modeling is very important in fusion, but it's very difficult because we have extreme conditions, very complex geometry, electromagnetic fields, the turbulent transport, MHD instabilities, and large variation in space and in time, and going to very small um, scales to uh, confinement time in time, for example, and from submillimeters to meters, especially in large machines like ITER. And nonlinear MHD modeling based um, on extensive use of high performance computing techniques helps uh, not only in understanding physics, but also now we reach the start of the proposed methods of active MHD control. Um, so we're talking about first principles modeling here. And I like the idea which um, Frank Yanko um, expressed already uh, during this meeting that first principles modeling we are doing in two directions. And one direction is really understanding uh, the phenomena and without this understanding, we can't propose simplified models. We can't propose any techniques uh, to control them. It's the first place we should really understand what's going on. So for ITER and for tokamak physics uh, and for still radio physics as well for fusion, we need to achieve maximum confinement and maximum performance, obviously. We should understand and minimize heat and particle transport. And you know that it's turbulent transport in tokamaks. Uh, then to provide efficient heating and current drive. Uh, but in this talk, we will focus on equilibrium, MHD stability, safe and high confinement scenarios and MHD control. And then uh, we'll have a look at plasma surface interaction and what's going on with materials under this extreme heat and particle fluxes during these transit MHD events. Okay, as I said in the beginning, that uh, it will be mainly about Jorek nonlinear <clears throat> extended image decode and applications to large scale instabilities and their control in magnetically confinement fusion plasmas. Um, and we have this large Jorek team, Jorek community, and now we started with very few um, people working, some PhD students and postdocs, and the author is Guido Heisman, so this code. Um, started some years ago, but now we have very large community and a large uh, number of participants, about 50 people. And this team is worldwide and uh, essentially in European countries, but now we have also collaborators in the United States, China and Korea. And we have this common platform um, on ITER, Git platform and large number of subjects. So a lot of people here. So. Um, um, about code uh, numerics, and it seems to me it's quite um, common features for fusion uh, codes. Um, we're using infoloidal cross-section uh, high order 2D uh, finite elements, and they have um, C1 continuous, um, meaning that variables and their derivatives are continuous when you're going to one finite element to another. And now we have the extension to even higher um, order uh, finite elements. And it's very good for good resolution with minimum points in colloidal direction. Then uh, in toroidal direction, we have uh, Fourier harmonics. We have uh, flux aligned grid, um, which is in, in, in the core plasma and close uh, scrape of layer. And then there is an extension to the realistic shape of the wall. And flux aligned grid is very nice as well in fusion because you can follow accurately parallel motion and conduction. And this is important. So you can also minimize the number of needed uh, elements here. Um, 
then uh, since we are dealing with very violent events, um, very nonlinear, we're using fully implicit time stepping, um, which is very favorable as well um, for highly nonlinear large separation of scales and anisotropies. And this is uh, common also for all fusion problems. And as you can imagine, going to the uh, implicit scheme, you are ending up with large sparse matrices. And we are using here iterative solver with preconditioner, which is um, physically based uh, because we tried many preconditioner standard one. And actually, the best one is uh, physically based, meaning that we're using non coupled harmonics uh, as a preconditioner. So still, you need to inverse some uh, matrix, rather large matrix here, and we're using plastics here. Then we have some stabilization for uh, shock waves um, and hybrid polarization um, also is used. Polarization scaling, as you can imagine, that it's rather challenging for this fully implicit fluid codes because we need to inverse matrices. But for kinetic uh, modules, it, it's very nice, as you also can imagine that a ni nice scaling for <coughs> particles. So the record is uh, reduced and full nonlinear uh, resistive MHD. And we have uh, two approaches here, fluid, uh, kinetic, and hybrid approaches, depending on the application. So in the beginning, we started with fluid uh, approach. It was the initial and not traditional one. And here, there are a lot of applications going on. But the initial one, and uh, all still ongoing work, is about modeling of h localized modes. And they are controlled by resonant magnetic perturbation, by pellets. And um, most discoveries were done when from the beginning, but then uh, introduction of uh, two fluid electron and ion the magnetic drifts also was quite a breakthrough here. Also, um, we can model small elm regimes like QH mod and everything. Um, then um, very large subject uh, which is going on now is modeling of disruptions and their mitigation uh, by massive gas injection and by shuttle pellets. And this technique will be used in ITER um, and also there is optimization of this method. Um, there is a task force in ITER uh, around these subjects and we're also participating in this um, work. And then um, vertical displacement events and hollow currents. Um, this is modeled with free boundary version where you can include the resistive wall and um, realistic coils and also to see how currents are developing in the conducting structures. Okay, so this is about fluid applications, not maybe all of them I mentioned here, but something new or relatively new is uh, kinetic models in Jarek <clears throat> because um, many applications really need it. And we have full orbit guiding center and gyro average um, um, models depending on the application. And then we can do fully kinetic or hybrid coupled to fluid approaches. And we have this particle pushes into REC implemented already, full orbit, uh, guiding center orbit, and gyro kinetic orbit. And the applications here, um, you can imagine the diverter physics, for example, with kinetic neutrals. Um, there are some examples presented recently on EPS. And fluid model for neutrals also exist. And um, for impurities, for ionization, radiation, recycling, and sputtering, so you really need kinetic models. And here's an example, for example, the tungsten transport, fully kinetic one in on the fields. The application was during an ounce and uh, many other things. Then um, fast ions. Um, like uh, alpha and toroid alpha and mode triggering and uh, runaway electrons during disruption, it's also fully kinetic. And here you can imagine that you need really full orbit uh, approach because uh, the orbits are quite large. 
Um, and the latest development, very, very recent, maybe a few weeks ago, uh, what was nicely tested, that now we can do gyrokinetic um, electrostatic ITGs with gyro average electric field. Um, in realistic geometry with X point, with scrape off layer and everything. I'll present you later a little bit more on this subject. Okay, let's go to the applications I promised you in the beginning. Um, application of REC to Elm's physics. Um, since you are doing, well, all of you are doing fusion, you know that Elm's um, are typical for H model high confinement scenarios and they are fast quasi periodic realizations of H profiles leading to particles and heat fluxes to the plasma physics components. And um, when we started to study them uh, in Present day machines are not very dangerous. So that they look like this during an, uh, an elm. You have uh, elm filaments going out, and without elms, it's quite quiet. And during an elm, everything is uh, lightened because you have um, particle and heat fluxes going everywhere, but especially as they are guided to the developed plates. Um, the physics uh, is like reconnection physics is similar to solar place. So you just imagine that you have this uh, filaments going out and cut it from the plasma and going to the facing components. And the problem is that if you scale uh, elm size to eta, they really will represent an issue for eta tungsten diverter. And people did some model, some experiments with just how tungsten will react uh, on the L like heat flux. And it really uh, was quite scary because you have melting, droplets, ejection, and have cracks. Um, and uh, actually, it was um, seen already that the safe elm, from a material point of view, will be only very small elm, about one megajoule per elm. But predicted for ETA, according to the um, experimental scaling, it will be about 20 megajoule. Per elm, and it leads to tens of gigawatts per square meter. And if you remember well, the E to diverter will design in stationary situation about only 10 megawatts per square meter, and in transient, maybe 20, not more. So elms should be really controlled. But before controlling them, we should understand how they work, what is the physics of elms and what is underlying instabilities. Underlying instabilities we knew already quite for a while, like for 20 years or even more, that um, ideal MHD already uh, showed that ballooning instability driven by H, uh, steep pressure gradient and developing on the low field side, um, you will have this kind of um, waves and um, this instability will grow. And also there is another one which is driven by um, current at the age. And you know that in Takamaks we have bootstrap current <clears throat> and it will be keen peeling mode, but mainly concentrated in, near X point because current is unstable for helicopter tubations. But linear MHD just doesn't tell you why Elm crash uh, is happening and what is the physics of Elm crash. It only non-linear MHD answered this question. Um, it was the first work uh, done by your record. And uh, what was going on after this initial um, picture of uh, instability is developing, then you will have, since you have resistivity in plasma, you will have um, reconnections uh, with open field lines and Elm is magnetic perturbation. So you will have reconnections in the ergodic field. And so energy will flow along this perturbed magnetic field lines and you will have temperature crush because you are losing energy like this. And if you see in the diverter, you will have the splitting on the strike point uh, because when this ergodic field lines um, crossing the diverter plate. And it was largely observed in the experiment, both magnetic perturbations and the splitting. So it was explained only in nonlinear MHD model. But at the same time, ELM is not only um, magnetic perturbation, also potential perturbation. And so you will have E cross B 
density convection and filaments. And then um, these filaments will be cut from the main plasma and still producing blobs. So you will have density crush as well. So it was explained quite a while ago, but then introduction, um, the magnetic effects uh, explain why elms are rotated. For example, um, in K star, there is a nice diagnostic electron. Um, you see diagnostic measurements, they show that before elm crush, you actually see this kind of structures rotating in different directions, independent on the rotation in the plasma. And then when we did modeling with two fluid demagnetic effects, uh, we actually discovered why it's happening, because you have um, rotating of these modes before elm crush. And so if you see uh, of these pictures, how it's happening during an elm crush, you see in the beginning, almost rigid rotation on the linear situation, and then it's getting quite messy because you're approaching nonlinear phase and here you have generation of sheared flow which cuts the density of filaments uh, and then you're producing these blobs and they, they go to the scraper layer and eventually going to the developer. Not much to the first wall, but mainly they end up in the developer. A mechanism was um, generation of this uh, mean uh, polyvalent flow by elm itself and generated nonlinearly. And um, it's very similar to um, ITG generating zonal flows, but uh, not via Reynolds stress, but via Maxwell stress. And also it's quite, uh, it was the discovery. Um, another discovery uh, was uh, why actually, when you look at Elm's uh, power deposition, the diverter, experimentally, it, it was observed that an inner diverter and outer diverter, they are almost symmetric. And even uh, sometimes even much more um, heat power is deposited to the inner developer. And it's very strange because Elm itself is developing on the low field side, but uh, then you will see, uh, and they will see the power deposition in, uh, on both sides. And also it was explained um, during nonlinear modeling with two fluid demagnetic drifts because uh, density is driven here uh, due to this A cross B uh, drift and demagnetic drift. So we um, reproduce a symmetric or even more uh, power in the inner diverter, like it was. Uh, the most recent also work uh, Elm cycles because you know that Elms are of course the um, periodic. And this is quite also difficult to model. And at the beginning, when you do it without the magnetic drifts, this is magnetic energy versus time. You have the first down crash, you started with uh, unstable already profile, and then you have this residual MHD, and your pedestal never builds up again. But then when you introduce the magnetic drifts, uh, they have stabilizing effect on uh, ballooning modes. And after the first crash, um, you have the time to stabilize again because you decrease the uh, pressure gradient and also you have stabilizing effect from the magnetic part. And then you can build up your pedestal again and then have this uh, cycles again. So you see how, for example, uh, pressure gradient evolved during the crash uh, going down and then build up again. In the beginning, we did very uh, high frequency elms, not very realistic, but recently we have this realistic parameters, uh, including resistivity. This is the most bottleneck for image decodes to go to the realistic resistivity, realistic uh, linguist numbers. But going to the realistic parameters and very nice work for ASDEX upgrades, they reproduced nicely experiment and elm crashes and stabilization and changing in parameters. And to stress it really were uh, type one elms um, in, in this model. Um, the spirit of this code and on this team, just uh, validating, 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 and comparing with existing experiments. 
And uh, this is uh, the example uh, from comparison of integrated or ELM heat flux in the diverter with uh, age scaling. And Jorek points are nicely followed uh, the um, experimental points. Um, if you model um, realistic discharges from jet, for example, from ASDEX, so we should rec, um, take into account realistic profiles, kinetic profiles, and equilibrium. So you, you end up with nice um, comparison, corresponds rather well. Okay, once we did this um, <coughs> validation, let's go to uh, ELM control by resonant magnetic perturbation. Um, now we know that we should really mitigate uh, and suppress elms, and in many machines uh, already uh, for some years. Um, These regimes were obtained by using resonant magnetic perturbation, and they are generated by specific coils. So in equilibrium, you don't have any radial magnetic perturbation. It's this is zero, and these coils will produce very small a radial magnetic perturbation, and then you produce slightly destroyed magnetic surfaces at the edge. So you will have stochastic 3D field. And the expectation was that you increase the edge transport and the decrease pressure gradient, and then melt maybe can be stabilized or, or mitigated strongly. It was the first. Uh, Explanation that only a pressure gradient uh, is decreased, but actually then uh, doing further studies, we realize that it's not as simple. But in many machines now, these experiments are going um, around the world. The question is, will it work for ITER? Because it's really uh, the most reliable way of suppressing elms. So then let's see how it goes. Um, in the first place, we started to do modeling uh, in vacuum, just superpose the fields calculated in vacuum on the equilibrium fields. But very quickly, we realized it's not the case. For example, you see comparison, it's done for D3D. Um, uh, if you just superpose vacuum fields on the equilibrium field, you will have this kind of magnetic perturbation. But if you go to plasma response, it will be quite different. And in the first place, uh, we explained not only with the array, but also with other codes that um, with um, rotating plasma response, we can explain this screening of um, RMPs by poloidal electron rotation, including across media magnetic and parallel projection on the poloidal field. And this Similar results were obtained by other codes uh, existing in uh, US, like MS3DC1. And in linear codes, also you can see the screening. But the main reason of the screening is that when plasma rotates, it uh, produces, generates this response current on the rational surfaces. And they will act to produce other um, magnetic fields, which would will be kind of opposite to the uh, existing one. So if you just do one query plot this magnetic topology in vacuum, so we'll see this huge um, lobes near X point, for example. And if you go with plasma response, you also see the slopes, but they are quite smallish because of the screening. So you don't have this much organization, actually. And as a splitting, um, in divert terms of experimental, it was nicely reproduced uh, with this plasma response modeling. But <clears throat> can we now explain why elms are suppressed? And this is also quite recent work. Uh, initially, we did it for uh, existing machines in um, ASDEX and KSTAR, for example, to, to see how it works, and then uh, go to ITER. So this is a work for ASDEX upgrade uh, magnetic energy time. And you see many modes present here. So they are unstable, they're growing, and they'll crash it. So we have an L without RMP. Then you go to RMP and on ASDEX, it's a realistic shot. 
um, RMP was n equal to two and six kilo per ton, and it was non-resonant situation, meaning that you have phasing uh, between coils with this number minus ninety. And what was seen in in modeling and also in experiment, experiment it was mitigated else. And in modeling with these particular parameters, you see this is the curve with RMP. And other modes are kind of uh, growing, um, not that fast like here, but still they're growing and eventually they will produce a crush. But then you go to the resonant situation, resonant um, phasing between coils, exactly the same RMP, exactly the same current, but something special happens here. You see uh, RMP uh, n equal two, then strongly coupled to this one modes n equal four, n equal six, and eight developing, and other modes they remain on the noise level. Uh, so something is going on here, and uh, what was discovered that for this situation you need external kink response of plasma. And then you can uh, obtain uh, the um, elm suppression. And it was exactly observed in an experiment like this. So was it ex because we just decrease uh, pressure prof profile gradient? Because you produce transport, it can be measured by RMPs exactly like you produce it in elms. And this is the magnetic energy versus time with two kinds of profiles, initial profiles where ELMS is growing, and then reduced pressure gradient profile. And growth rate is reduced as well, but eventually it grows and it will produce maybe smaller, but ELM still. So it's not only uh, due to um, decreasing of pressure gradient, but uh, it's because also uh, you produce continuous um, MHD via nonlinear coupling with uh, RMP. So this is what I show to students all the time. Without RMP, you have H pressure gradient grows until MHD peeling balloon limit is reached, and then you have Elm crush. But with RMP, you have continuously um, evacuated energy and particles, like you have uh, holes here in your bucket. And due to this, you will never fill uh, the bucket until this huge crush. This is kind of picture you can keep in mind. And also what was discovered and also observed that what I said in the beginning is that you need this kink response when um, suppression is observed. And uh, kink response meaning you have this kinking near X point. This is point current loss for resonant situation. And non-resonant situation, you don't have this um, nicely pronounced kink response. Marina, you have five more minutes. Please. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and then I go very quickly to ITER modeling um, after this validation. So this we finished recently the uh, contract done for ITER with General Atomic, which used optimize um, as a phasing in ITER coils to produce this kink response. And then we use this phasing to do modeling uh, with Jorek, with uh, full geometry. So in the beginning, we did the L, natural L, without any RMPs. And you see this uh, many harmonics just growing and crushing and filaments and how um, actually profiles are crushing. And then we go to... Um, find out what is the threshold for the suppression is also this magnetic energy for all these modes and you see just progressively increasing RMP current and uh, going to 45 to 60 you see this uh, picture similar to what you saw for us that's for example this only mode strongly coupled to RMP remains and other remain on the noise level and for other ends also we did the same okay um, so just how density, temperature, and magnetic topology looks like uh, in ITER, it's very similar to ELM picture, by the way, but except that it goes in continuous ways. So this is density filaments as well all the time here and similar for a temperature. Okay, and then uh, how actually the footprints in uh, diverter looks like, because the problem is 
that ITER diverter was designed for uh, axisymmetric uh, power deposition. Here you see uh, this is toroidal angle, this is length of a diverter, in inner diverter, and outer diverter. But when you apply RMPs, you have splitting and it goes like symmetry of your uh, and uh, of RMPs. And it's not very nice uh, because, okay, you have erosion here. So it was the idea to rotate them. Uh, but it was not the purpose of this work <clears throat> to smooth this um, kind of splitting. But what we found out is uh, if you just have an inverter uh, less than 50 megawatts, you can um, reach at this um, limits, material limits you, st you still. And the final slide that I really want to show you because it's really a very recent work. So how turbulence behave uh, with RMPs? Um, as I said, we now have this gyrokinetic model uh, to calculate ITGs. This is compass-like uh, device, L-mod plasma, and without RMPs, you have this uh, saturated turbulence here. And then uh, we launched this pipe call set, just uh, going to the stationary or saturated state. But then uh, let's do uh, apply RMPs. This is also a realistic uh, situation uh, for compass. And, Actually, the structure of ITG turbulence changed completely. And now you see much more turbulence in the age and uh, in the scrape of air and less in, in the uh, soil. And it's very similar to the results observed in, uh, in other machines, at least what I, what I saw. So this is uh, quite new. OK, so the, my conclusions. Now we have non-lead image demodeling based on extensive use of uh, HPC techniques and very important infusion. Um, uh, the nonlinear full and reduced resistive image decoy has a lot of um, applications and large international collaboration. And we can reproduce many experimentally observed features. And now our confidence really increased to do some um, predictions and uh, optimization of control tools uh, for ITER. And there are fluid and fully kinetic uh, models exist uh, and they um, apply to um, different uh, situations and um, and recently they're developed and used in drag okay thank you very much thank you very much for your interesting talk it's very, very good uh, for attendees do you have a any question, please, if you have it, please uh, write it in Q&A uh, tab. Uh, while I wait uh, your question, I, I want to ask a question, question. Can you describe a bit more detail, especially the boundary condition, boundary condition you're using the, in, for your simulation? Um, yes, for a fluid, um models I, I showed you before. Um, it's uh, she's boundary conditions. Uh, um, okay, now we, what we have on the diverter plates, uh, if you can imagine you have this field lines going to the diverter and we have she's boundary conditions both on heat flux and, uh, uh, and on the parallel velocity, uh, it's sound speed. And um, also she's limited heat deposition. And now with the extended wall, um, also once you have these field lines crossing the wall, you have the same conditions over there. And uh, for perturbation, they are zero uh, on the wall. And so you have all this, uh, okay, you, have, you can have resistive wall, but uh, what was used for it, or for example, in my, in my case, it was ideal wall uh, around uh, the boundary. Uh, for kinetic models, uh, also it depends. Uh, for the moment, particles are free to go out, or they can just stop uh, at the edge and the boundary. They're not participating anymore. But uh, this we should think how we could also implement the shift conditions for particles as well. Okay, thanks. Thanks. I learned a lot. Uh, I have a Another question uh, about your ITG simulation, turb turbulence simulation. Uh, in terms of computing resources for especially resolution, et cetera, how much different from uh, your MHD 
simulations? You can't even imagine. I mean, it, it scales very nicely. And mm -hmm. for example, for this case to reach, uh, okay, maybe because it's smaller machine, but it's less than five hours uh, of all time on, on 90 knots on Marconi. Okay, then saying that, uh, maybe if you're just going to this larger size machines, it may be larger number of harmonics, it will be larger, but it scales very nicely because, okay, it's uh, particles and particles are just very nicely parallelized. It, it, it's really candidate to go to GPUs as well. Um, but the fluid part is very difficult. Okay, for the moment it's working like in post prop because um, you just calculate magnetic fields and electric fields with a direct fluid part, and then you launch particles on this. But at the same time, particles um, are distributed in the beginning um, on, uh, according to Maxwell distribution. So they evolve uh, and then you just uh, calculate also. By the way, electrons are the adiabatic thing. But for the moment, it's, it's very, very, not very much time consuming, I would say, but it's very new. So I'm very cautious to say that maybe later it will be different. Thank you very much. Very impressive. Uh, I have a, there's a question from uh, one uh, from Adriana. The question is, can you comment on the capabilities of direct code for modeling runaway electrons? Ah, uh, unfortunately, I'm not doing this, but okay. But there are, oh, it was a very nice presentation on the European Fusion Workshop recently. Yeah, uh, this is a, a kind of old picture from uh, Christian Samario. Maybe Christian, <laughs> if he's online, he can uh, say. Um, there are two two codes. Um, in the beginning, it was full orbit code because we just fo followed the full orbits. Um, but it also was done on the existing uh, magnetic structure. There is a fluid also option to uh, model this, but now it seems to be that it's kind of uh, generalized picture. Um, what they can do is they can see how particles, how runaway beam is formed and where it goes and where it strikes uh, the boundaries. It seems to be there is a quite a progress here. I'm not very familiar what the recent, the recent, recent progress is. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, you have another question from uh, Marie. How is Jorek being prepared for exascale? Are there new applications that will become possible? Yeah, this is uh, the common question. Uh, this, I, I was asking it just on the previous speaker as well, because the problem is um, exascale. Uh, now people are just thinking about GPUs all the time, meaning that you need uh, a lot of uh, processors with very smallish memory. And we are arguing that a lot of nonlinear codes, especially fluid codes, they still need CPUs and they need really this combined architectures. And that's what we are thinking that it will be like this. Uh, unless we're going to the fully kinetic MHD, which is also possible, but maybe it's really a very long time uh, perspective. Um, but for the moment, I'm thinking that um, for exascale particles are just maybe ready to go. Um, we are working now on transforming a lot, many applications to GPUs, but it's still a work in progress. But it seems to me that exascale should be really done with kind of combined architecture. So there's a possibility to uh, switch to one to another. I can say that uh, kinetic is okay, it seems to me, but fluid, I don't know. Because fluid part, if you're just dealing with this matrix inversion, you need a lot of memory for, for the node. Otherwise you will spend your time in communicating. So. And also being a, a member of praise, I would say that we discussed a lot uh, this question. And it, it's quite worrying situation if um, Euro HPC will be only based on GPUs 
and just forgetting all these uh, problems with uh, non-linearities and non-linear fluid codes. I mean, climate codes and others that there will be outside this project. But it seems to me it's getting better if they agree to, to do EuroHPC also in uh, combination of architectures. User, more user friendly. Okay, thank you very much. <clears throat> I have another uh, question from Marie Kate. Jesse, Jesse, are the be unsafe elms a big concern for melting components in Inter? Mm -hmm. Or is there good confidence that these, these problems can be prevented? I think she's asking your opinion. Um, no, my opinion, okay, we should, let's hope it will be prevented. Um, the problem is with, okay, modeling for ITER, what I, maybe I, I skipped this, uh, I wrote it, but it, it, the modeling for ITER um, is difficult because we don't go to the realistic re um, resistivities for the moment. And this is really numerical limits uh, existing. That's what you see that uh, they are realistic values. This is quite high. We have almost two orders of magnitude. So what we are doing now for ETA, which is do L with these parameters and then apply RMPs with these parameters. And so they will be suppressed. It's okay. The problem if you go to the realistic uh, values how resistivity will behave, and also you will have this kinetic effects on resistivity and neoplastical effect on resistivity. It's not done for the moment with either size machine. Then there are not many possibilities to um, deal with uh, with elms uh, apart from resonant magnetic perturbation. I hope it will work. It works on other machines. Now we know that we need the skin response, uh, and we know how to reach it because we can adjust the phasing between coils. Um, or uh, we can go to the uh, Q95 uh, window where they will be suppressed, but phasing between coils is more reliable because you can adjust to different scenarios uh, this phasing. It was done in, in this contract. I didn't show you all the scenarios, but it, it can be done. But then, okay, how it will work in lower resistivity, it's still work in progress, and we think about it, how it will be done. Okay, thank it you. Very it will be done. <laughs> Otherwise, okay. Cool. Thank you very much. It's time uh, time up. Thank you very much for your talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. Let's move on to the next talk. Uh, this is an invited talk delivered by uh, Dr. Yasuhi, Professor Yasuhiro Suzuki uh, from uh, Hirosh Hiroshima University, Japan. Uh, now, uh, Yasuhiro you have our attention. So thank you very much for introduction to me. Uh, I start the sharing the my talk. Can you see the my slide? Yes, I can see your screen. Maybe you can make a full screen. Is it okay? Great. Yeah, so thank you very much again for giving the, this opportunity. So my name is Yasuhiro Suzuki from the Hiroshima University. So today the, I want to show the uh, my talk about the development of the 3D equilibrium code and the, its application to the stellarators. So before I uh, discuss the uh, 3D equilibrium, so I want to review briefly the MHD equilibrium. So in previous talks by the Marina, so she discussed about the MHD instability, uh, but the MHD equilibrium is a basis to study the MHD stability and also the transport. So if uh, we consider the equation of motion in the one through the MHD model, so this is the equation of the motion, and then the, if the time derivation is zero, that we assume, so we can derive the so equilibrium of the, in other words, the force balance of the pressure gradient and also the Lorentz force. 
So then the, this the equation couple the other、uh, equations the Ampere's law. So then the, we can derive the MHD equilibrium equations so like this. So then the, if the, we consider so these equations the, from parallel force balance, the, we can derive the directly these two conditions. So this means that if the equilibrium, MHD equilibrium condition is satisfied, so in principle, Uh, the pressure and also the current density can be assumed as a flux averaged quantities. So, then the, so again, the, so if the, we derive the, this, these equations, so this is also the equivalent to the existence of the nested flux surface. So then the, in tokamak, so nested flux surface can be exist, and then the,、uh, we can assume that these conditions, but the stellarators, so generally、uh, the 3D configuration, so then the, we are not sure the nested flux surface can be exist or assumed, something like that. And another point to consider the MHD equilibrium. So, if、uh, we consider the axisymmetric case, like the tokamak, so in other words, so no variation along the toroidal angle, so we can reduce the MHD equations to the one equations. So, then the, this is the very famous the equation, the so called the Brad Shafrano equations. So, then the, for tokamak case to solve the MHD equilibrium, We just solve the this the Brad s h a f r a n o f equations. And、uh, in the viewpoint of the mathematics, so this is so type of the so called the second order the elliptic partial differential equations. So then the, in such a sense, the, we can assume the MHD equilibrium problem as a boundary value problem. So then the, to solve the 3D equilibrium, So, the, how to define the plasma boundary? So, that is the most important problem. So, then the, so let's move on the considering for the general 3D magnetic configuration. So, then the, this is the schematic view of the stellarators by the LHD, so large helical device in Japan. So, in Tokamak, so in principle, the magnetic field to confine the plasma is produced by the axisymmetric the toroidal field core and the axisymmetric the polar field core and also the plasma current. So, then the magnetic field is in principle the axisymmetric the 2D configuration.、Uh, but the stellarators, in other words, the general the 3D configuration system. So, as you can see, Uh, the very、uh, complicated flux surface shape existing, and also the、so、3D magnetic field line appeared, so like this. So then the, this is the polar cross section of、uh, LHD plasma. So then the, in plasma core, so elliptic the plasma shape appeared, but the, in plasma edge, So, stochastic magnetic field line appeared to make the diverter configurations. So, then the, this figure shows the、uh, connection length plot of the different the polar cross section. So, then the, so in plasma core, so, and also the close to the plasma boundary, so connection length of the magnetic field line is、uh, very long. but So, as you can see on the stochastic magnetic field line, so long and short connection lengths of the magnetic field line are overlapping, and also the magnetic field lines so behave the stochasticity, and then the so magnetic field structure is very complicated. So, in such a case, the questions are rising. The, for example, the where is the plasma boundary? So, diverted to tokamak case, the, we can define the plasma boundary very clearly by the separatrix. 
But the in general stellarator case, so as I said, so stochastic magnetic field line naturally appeared in the plasma edge. So then the, we cannot define the plasma boundary clearly like the tokamak colloidal diverter case, something like that. And then the, so, okay, so where is the plasma boundary? And also the next question is uh, how the plasma boundary defined? So then the, because the, in stellarator case, so we cannot guarantee existence of the clear flux surface in the plasma edge. And also the, if the magnetic field behave stochasticity, so then the final question is the, how the pressure distribution can be defined on the stochastic plasma boundary. So in other words, the plasma pressure is isotropic on stochastic boundary or not? So these the question are rising in the general consideration of the 3D magnetic field like the stellarators. So then the in 3D system, so MHD equilibrium is uh, very complicated because the equilibrium current by the field shooter current make the so-called the pressure induced part of the field. So pressure induced part of the field change the magnetic topology. So then the, to consider the 3D equilibrium, so we need involve the impact of the 3D equilibrium response by the far shooter current. So then the, from force balance equations of the MHD equilibrium equations, the, we can derive the so-called diamagnetic current density, the J-PAP. And then the, from the quasi neutrality, so we can derive the parallel current. The, this is the so-called the partial the current. So then the, in simple, the circular tokamak cross section tokamak case, the, we can model the magnetic field is like this. So then the so J parallel is the can be defined as a very simple the equations. So like this. So then the far shooter current is the, in principle the related to the pressure gradient. But uh, in stellarator case, so as I said, so very complicated the magnetic field are existing. And also the so-called field periodicity. So for example, the LHD case, the field periodicity is 10. So that means that every the 36 degree, so same the product cross section appeared. So in another stellarator case of the better size 7x, so field periodicity is five. So then the every the 72 degrees, so same the product cross section appeared. So then the, that means the so uh, stellarator magnetic field has the periodicity along the toroidal direction and also the polar direction. So then the, we need to consider the impact of the far shooter current based on the those the periodicity along the polar and the toroidal directions. So then the, if the, we use the flux coordinate system on the Buza coordinate or the Hamada coordinate. And then the, we can decompose the far shooter current by the Fourier decomposition. So then the, so in principle, the J parallel can be defined of the summation of the magnetic spectrum on the flux coordinate system. So then the, if the, we see that this equation system, so point is here. So always the singularity appeared on rational surface. So then the, to avoid the, these singularity, so we can speculate the two hypotheses. So for example, the magnetic island might be open on every rational surface. So then the flattening of the plasma pressure uh, disappear the singularity. Or the over this uh, singular current makes a magnetic island, and then the, this uh, magnetic island also the eliminate the singularity. 
So then the different idea now the developing the mainly the Princeton group. So then the, they use a step to pressure profile, but the in realistic case, so we never see the step to pressure profile. So then the, we need model the realistic the pressure model on the rational surface or the magnetic island. So then the, if the, we consider the 3D equilibrium response by the partial the current, so this is the one example for the classical stellarators. So the, the, these are the vacuum flux surface. So then the, as you can see the clear, so nested flux surface appears so like this. But the, if the, we consider the medium beta and the high beta for the 3D equilibrium, so as you can see, uh, the plasma shift, uh, magnetic axis shift, of course, by the chaffron shift, but also the magnetic topology clearly changed by the 3D equilibrium response. And then the, so now the, I briefly review the theory of the 3D equilibrium, but uh, so MHD equilibrium is the most lowest order the assumption uh, to equilibrium field. So then the, uh, to derive the one field, the MHD equations, the, we ignore the many physics. Uh, then the, in this talk, so I want to emphasize the how to model the pressure distribution on the magnetic island and also the st stochastic field in the stellarators. So usually the, we consider the magnetic field becomes stochastic or the magnetic island open in general 3D field. According to the Richester Rosenblum theory, so then the temperature profiles are clearly flattening on the magnetic island. Also the temperature completely diffuse on the stochastic field. But uh, that is not true. Uh, so then the, according to the uh, Fitzpatrick theory, so with this of the flattening of the temperature uh, depend on the ratio of the chi pop and over the chi parallel. So then the, so in principle, the normalized uh, island with normalized uh, flattening width is, is proportional to the uh, chi pop over the chi parallel, the power series of the quarter. So then the, this is the one example of the magnetic uh, model, the magnetic field, the so-called ABC field. So then the Stuart Hardison in Princeton solved the anisotropic heat diffusion. So then the, as you can see, so flattening appeared the magnetic island. So these, this flattening correspond to the, this island. And then the, this flattening correspond to the, this island. But the, as you can see, the, for example, the here, so magnetic island appeared, but the not completely the flat like this. So then the, again, the, so temperature flatten or not depend on the ratio of the chi parallel over the chi pop over the chi parallel. So then the, from the, this study, the, we may consider the stochastic field can keep the finite the temperature gradient. So then the, this is the analytically modeled magnetic field. So then the, what happened in realistic the stellarator field? The, that is the question. And also the experimentally, the, we observe the finite the pressure gradient in stochastic magnetic field. So then the, this is the equilibrium calculation predict uh, for the LHD field. So as you can see, so if the beta increasing, so edge magnetic topology change, so like this. So strictly speaking, the edge magnetic topology becomes stochastic. 
But the, if the, we consider the electron pressure profile from the experimental observation, so finite the temperature, finite pressure gradient exists on stochastic field predicted by the numerical simulations. So then the, here, the, we study the anisotropic heat diffusion on the stochastic magnetic field uh, by the realistic the stellar field. So we simulate that this the anisotropic heat diffusion equations. So then the, we fixed the density and also the chi parallel and the chi pop. And then the, we solve the numerically the, this anisotropic equations. So then the numerical implementation, so we solve the, this the anisotropic heat diffusion equation by the finite difference scheme. Uh, so then the, but the, to calculate the parallel gradient, so here the, we introduce the so-called field line tracing method. So then the, to calculate exactly and precisely on realistic field, so we need the very fine scale grid is the necessary, but the, to calculate the parallel gradient, so in the numerical simulation that we follow uh, the magnetic field line, so then the, we calculate directly the parallel gradient along the magnetic field line. But the perpendicular uh, diffusion, so we assume the simply uh, the RZ grid like this. So then the, this is a schematic view, how to calculate the parallel gradient. So we calculate the magnetic field line uh, from the grid. So then the green line is the magnetic field line starting from the grid. So then the, we calculate the parallel gradient from the magnetic field line tracing, so directly. And then the also the perpendicular uh, diffusion. So as I said, the, we assume that just the second derivative along the R and Z directions. So we use the second order finite different scheme. So then the, for simulation, so we use the supercomputer system in the National Institute for Fusion Science in Japan. So then recently, not recently, the last year that we replaced the new supercomputer. So then the, that is a so-called plasma simulator rising. Rising means the god of the thunder. So then the, this the supercomputer consists of the 500, uh, 540 nodes by the vector host. So the, this the plasma simulator made by the NEC model the SX Aurora Tsubasa. So then the SX Aurora Tsubasa is used the so-called the vector engine. So this is the one chip the vector supercomputer. So then the one node, so so-called the vector host has the eight vector engine. So then the total the five, 140 nodes, so then the total the 4,320 vector engines. And also the one vector engine has the eight core. So then the story is no English documentation, but the perform, total performance is the 10.5 petaflops. And also total main memory is the 202 terabyte. And also the total storage is the 47 terabyte. So yeah, MHD calculation, yeah, I understand. The MHD yes. calculation doesn't use a huge supercomputing performance, but uh, so this uh, vector engine supercomputer can help the deduction of the computation resource. So then the, this is the exact result of the simulation of the anisotropic heat diffusion. So I show the two cases, the ratio of the chi parallel over the chi paths are 10 to the power six and the 10 to the power eight. So as you can see, so 10 to the power six case, the large the perpendicular diffusion makes the very smooth 
profile. So then the, in this case, the strong, the perpendicular diffusion uh, diffuse a lot uh, in the plasma edge. But the 10 to the case of the 10 to the power is, so as you can see, so we got the temperature profile, the well aligned, the closed flux surface, and also the on stochastic region. So small the flattening of the temperature profile appeared. And then the, this is the Poincaré plot again, and also the temperature profile with the different the ratio of the chi parallel of the chi part from the 10 to the power 6 to the 10 to the power 10. So then, the, as I said, the 10 to the power 6 case, the strong the perpendicular diffusion makes so the very smooth and the wider the temperature profile beyond the stochastic region. Uh, but the increasing the ratio, so as you can see, so in solar region, so temperature diffuse, but the small the flattening region appeared uh, in this the stochastic field. And then the further increasing the ratio, so as you can see, uh, the flattening region on the stochastic field here, and also the small flattening region on this magnetic island, and the inward board case, the same. So flattening region on the stochastic field appeared so like this. So then the, so if the, we use the anisotropic heat diffusion equations, so we can consider the more precise or the more realistic, so pressure distribution on the stochastic field in the stellarators. So, so this is a summary. So then the, so uh, we discussed the 3D equilibrium calculation. So then the two more precise and the more realistic the equilibrium modeling. So we include the more further physical effect. But the, in this talk, the, I emphasize the more precise the pressure distribution on the stochastic field model. But the, of course, the, for example, the plasma rotation is a very important issue to consider the magnetic topology. But the, in general stellarita case, the plasma rotation is much smaller than the tokamak. So then the, here, the, I don't discuss the, this effect. But of course, the, for example, the part of the tokamak by RMP, we definitely need to include the, this plasma rotation case. So then the so more precise the model, so many tasks is uh, ongoing. So then the, uh, we will discuss the impact of the other effects in future in different presentation. So that's all, so thank you very much. Thank you very much. It's very interesting talk. So now, uh, is there any comments, questions from uh, from uh, outside. Uh, yes, you have a question from Mervi. Says, uh, is, hmm? is there any experimental evidence that would confirm the stochastic magnetic field lines at the, at the edge, edge of stellarators? Ah, yes. So I, ha I wrote the several papers. So oh, we studied the radial electric field and the potential structure on the edge stochastic field in stellarator case. So then the, so as I showed the, for example, the one example for the LHD study. So here, the edge magnetic field line become strongly the stochastized. So then the, in this region, the magnetic field line is open. So in principle, the, to the diverter plate. So then the, in such a case, the parallel, the electron transport becomes the much stronger. So then the, we study the radial electric field made by the electron loss. So then the, we confirm the, how to say the magnetic topology. So 
we could not directly see the magnetic field become stochastized. But uh, so we observe clearly the magnetic field line open in this region. So then the, that opening magnetic field are made by the stochastization by the finite beta effect. So we observe experimentally. Thank you very much. Uh, you have another uh, question from uh, Matthias Aradi. Uh, he asks, oh, what abilities, advantages, and disadvantages does the code have over other 3D equilibrium codes such as VMEC? Uh, okay, so advantage is clear. So VMEC cannot treat the stochastic magnetic field. So because the VMEC use the flux coordinate system. So then the hint has the advantage uh, to treat the stochastic magnetic field or the magnetic island in general 3D field. So this advantage, so in principle, the VMEC is a very fast code, but the hint is not. So very time consuming, not time consuming, comparing with the uh, nonlinear MHD code, but uh, time consuming comparing with the VMEC. Mm -hmm. Good, thank you very much. Now it's time up. Thank you very much for your talk. Uh, oh, let's move on much. to the next, uh, let's move on to the next talk. Uh, next talk is a contributed talk delivered by uh, Daniel uh, Sora from UPC, UPC. Mm -hmm. uh, now, uh, Daniel, uh, stage is yours. Thanks. Hello, thank you. I'm going to share my screen. I have 15 minutes, am I right? Yes, you have 15 minutes. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm sharing screen. Okay, I think you can see my screen now. Um, okay, thank you very much for the organizing committee for for allowing me to introduce our our work uh, that we are currently doing in UPC. Uh, my name is Daniel Suarez. I'm uh, presenting this work called Implementation of a Quasi 2D Turbulence Model and Detection of Flow Instabilities in Liquid Metal MHD Flows. I'm going to talk about liquid metals MHD and that, um, that uh, involves uh, basically the application of liquid metal on breathing blankets and especially to DCLL, dual coolant lead lithium uh, design. The outline of my presentation, I'm going to briefly introduce the, the problems. Uh, later, I'm going to talk about the computational resources uh, that uh, we need to have in order to calculate uh, the, the flows that we, we are studying. Later, I'm going to talk about the potential of the 2D model. This 2D model is um, a fully developed model. Later, um, I'm going to introduce what happens when we have buoyant flows and the problem with the forces balance. And later, uh, the potential of the quasi 2D model, which is, uh, it's also 2D, but in a different way. I'm going to explain that later. And later, I'm going to introduce the FFT2 instabilities detection method that we have developed during these, these months. And finally, uh, I'm going to present the validation cases that we have been running and the application of those, those validated um, tools, the quasi 2D model and the FFT2 to a three-dimensional case. And finally, I'm going to recall the, the, some final remarks. Here we can see some, some plot by a work um, some years ago by Dr. Smolensev in, in UCLA. And they were studying the stability of several flows, buoyant flows. And we're going to uh, come back to this because in, in breathing blankets, in, especially in those um, with uh, high 
um, uh, graphs of numbers and so high heat deposition and liquid metal breathing blankets where we're having these uh, high uh, Hartmann numbers as well and Reynolds numbers, we may encounter these sort of instabilities that um, may influence a lot the transport of, for instance, heat or the transport of uh, tritium that is going to be bred in these breathing blankets. Um, in this slide um, of introduction, I'm going to explain that uh, we have a um, large experience studying a prototyp prototypical, what we call Shercliffe case, which is the sort of liquid metal uh, flowing in a rectangular channel where electric currents are induced in such a way that they finally create the Lorentz forces so that the flow velocity profile is of this shape. I like to call it cake shape because it, it reminds me of cake. And this type of flow is completely laminar. This, is, this should be in this laminar region. And Dr. Small and Steph as well, uh, several years ago, developed this map. This is a flow regime map where depending on the Hartmann number, so the intensity of the magnetic field or the, or the width of the channel in the magnetic field direction for those, for those breathing blanket channels, and depending on the Reynolds number, we may encounter some instabilities in the flow. So in this region, we're, we're encountering laminar flow. If we increase a little bit the Reynolds number, we're encountering our first instabilities on what we call the side layers, the side boundary layers, which are parallel to the magnetic field. And eventually, if we keep increasing the Reynolds number, so the inertia, we're finally encountering this turbulent flow with chaotic uh, movement of particles in, in, the, in the bulk region. Um, this is important to acknowledge this map because, as you can see here, this CLL in ITER, for instance, or in DEMO, um, it's expected to be more or less in this region, quasi to the turbulence region. So our laminar flow uh, profile that we know very good, it's not applicable to this region, which creates us, for us a problem. Uh, some 20 years ago, Dr. Muk and his collaborators, they developed this case, uh, which was a flow past a cylinder, uh, creating this, this wake, this vortex thread shedding. And they uh, found, you can, you can clearly see here that vorticity is very well aligned with the magnetic field. And this is what we call quasi two-dimensional turbulence flow. Basically, some instabilities appear because of uh, perturbances or because of an obstacle like here in this cylinder. And the oscillations of the flow finally align, just creating this turbulence, this vorticity, sorry, in completely aligned to the magnetic field, which is this characteristic of this quasi 2 d turbulent flow. I'm going to, I want to show this now because later we're going to use this quasi 2 d turbulence model and we're going to apply that, um, making use of this symmetry that this uh, solution or this behavior, physical behavior presents in this sort of channels and flow conditions. So we, we can recognize here clearly a 2D fully developed flow, which is this one, very well known. 3D unstable flow, which is in the turbulent uh, regime, and quasi 2D unstable flow as well. So if we um, think about calculating and computational resources that we need to analyze those flows, we may see that those flows regarding uh, having laminar flow, studying laminar flow, they are very cheap to calculate because we barely need uh, 10 to the 5 number of cells. This is a steady result, so this is quite cheap. However, if we go for um, those regimes which are not laminar, we need uh, 100 times at least more number of cells. And that's unsteady as well, so instable. So we need time step. We need to resolve for every time step the, the, the flow profile, which makes it very expensive. And we have the here, I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain very briefly here the potential of the two-dimensional model, the fully developed two-dimensional model. We have last year uh, made this work, liquid metal energy flow influence on heat transfer phenomena, um, where we placed a model where with uh, some heat deposition on the, on, the, on, the, on the liquid metal and eventually buoyancy created this sort of profile. And this is an important, um, this is an important model and very useful model because it's cheap. So we can calculate hundreds of cases and finally retrieve 
what we call correlations, right? So for instance, the Nussel numbers of the heat transfer is uh, depending on Hartmann, Reynolds, and Grassoff, for example. And we may retrieve this sort of correlations because we can run hundreds of cases, which is much more difficult in case we have three-dimensional flows. So in 2D model with buoyant flows, we may combine the inertia, the Lorentz, and the buoyant forces that are completely interacting uh, with, e with each other. In, in this case, we can see that the, sometimes we assess the relationship between Lorentz and Boyan by the Likudis number, which says that for the DCLL conditions, the flow should be stable. If we assess the relationship between inertia and Boyan flows, we can see that the DCLL will present mixed convection. It's depending on the Grassoff and Reynolds number. And if we assess the relationship between Lorentz and inertia forces, we may see exactly this um, map that Smolens have provided. Um, so this is a complex problem that we have studied in these three, um, three um, phenomena, uh, th three forces altogether, and the relationship. Some years ago, uh, Bechta studied uh, exactly this, the stability of the flow, and they provided the preliminary results. We can see them here, where the region, so the flows on the upper part of these lines should be stable. However, the, the, the flows on the lower part should be unstable. And in DCLL conditions, which is this red dot, we should be above the extrapolation of this model. So this model reaches 10 to the 9. So extrapolating this model, which is the orange region, should be this point. So DCLL conditions should be stable, but we're not very sure. These are our only preliminary results. And this is an extrapolation that we always know that it's, it's risky to do these sort of assumptions. So what's this quasi 2D model? Quasi 2D model is a, is a mathematical model developed by Someria Muro. They uh, develop uh, mathematically the, the equations to provide uh, some results for, for where we are having these vorticities aligned with the magnetic field. It's only valid for insulated walls. It solves the plane perpendicular to the magnetic field. And this is ideal for DCLL design, actually, because the walls are insulating. So here we see the application of this quasi 2D model that I mentioned before. And here we can see the equations where in the momentum equation, we encounter this term, which is the, um, the, the Hartmann breaking time um, term corresponding to this uh, MHD phenomena, only with, by this term. And this would be the buoyant term and the rest we already know. So the large number of cases to be run using this quasi 2D model, because we're, 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 at, we're, we're on a quest to find this map with these three, three forces, the stability map uh, with these three forces, we will run hundreds of cases. And in order to be able to assess the instability of, of each of the cases, we're going to use an automatic detection method that will be based on the FFT2. Uh, methodology. The F52 has been validated in our work and uh, we have uh, placed a random uh, arbitrary map, uh, field map, and we have following, following the, the, the formula of, of F52. Finally, we have obtained this map the buttons where we can see the coefficients depending on the wave numbers of each of these cases. Okay, well, I'm not going into details, I'm not, I'm not having time for this, but this will allow uh, the validation of the quasi to the uh, model and also the use of this FFT2 for each of the cases. So we have selected, for instance, the Poise wheel flow. So this is a very prototypical example, hydrodynamic flow. This would be the, the application of the FFT2 to this case. It's fully developed, so we are not having any uh, waves on the vertical axis. So it's because it's fully developed, so we're not having any any velocity differences on the on the flow direction. Later, we're going to see the validation for share cliff flow. So this is MHD already with no buoyancy. We can see that for higher Hartmann number, the accuracy is better, right? This is the cake profile that I mentioned before, the coefficients as well, not having any component on Z direction. We're having the Tagawa flow. We call it Tagawa flow. It's a buoyant flow and up with the application of magnetic field. So we can see again for Hartmann numbers very high, the accuracy is much better than for low Hartmann numbers. And we are finally 
uh, validating this with a mixed convection, which I mentioned before with our previous work published already, uh, that again, for a higher Harman number, the accuracy is much better. So we can see here the, the result um, analytical or, or with the quasi 2D model. Finally, we have uh, recalled this flow past an obstacle, which is past a cylinder by Dr. Mook and his collaborators. And we have observed this uh, vortex track shedding. And um, in Mook's work, we found the oscillations of the drag and lift coefficient, which gives a strudel number of 0 0.16, which was exactly the same that we found in our, in our solution. This is our results on the lower part. And here in the MOOC work, he, they, they studied, first they, they used the hydrodynamic flow and they assessed the oscillations on the vertical axis. So these are velocity only in the component of the vertical axis with, the, with this, which is the component of the magnetic field actually. So when the magnetic field was applied, which was second 470, the um oscillations on the on the direction of the magnetic field were completely damp as we can see here and the same happens in our case we apply the the magnetic field in time 490 so the oscillations in the vertical direction completely damp providing an insight that this flow became quasi 2d and here we have the calculation of a three-dimensional flow so the complete three-dimensional this is the result is is the one calculated with quasi 2D. And this is the FFT2 result for each of them, which is pretty similar, which were good news for us because that was a uh, uh, good proof that uh, the, the, the code was uh, performing well. The tools were, were adequate. So just to summarize final remarks, the quasi 2D model is very promising to be used in parametric studies where many simulations are needed because it's very cheap to calculate with quasi 2D model. We only, we, need, we only need one node in the direction of the magnetic field so we can cal calculate 2D. So we can calculate hundreds of cases again. So the implementation of quasi 2D model shows accurate results, especially for high magnetic fields. So high Hartmann numbers. And our research group, as I mentioned before, is on a quest to retrieve the flow regime map which is a work that we are intending for next year um, in, in the Eurofusion Consortium. And uh, the use of FFT2 method may allow for an automatic detection of flow instabilities and the eventual construction of the regime map. We are trying to achieve something similar to what Smolensev did, but in three dimensions. And sorry, just to put my stop here, just finishing. And um, once the stability boundaries are known, the cross-sectional 2D model may also be applied on solid grounds. So this is the, out, the outcome of our work has been the development of this quasi 2D and the application of the FFT2 method. And that was all. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That's an interesting talk as well. Uh, for Pat Participants, do you have any question? If so, uh, please uh, write the question in using Q&A tab. Meanwhile, uh, I have a question. I have a question. Uh, I glimpsed uh, some, something the word uh, magnetoconvective uh, convective flow regime or something. Then in the end, uh, you, you said you want to develop. Can you explain in in which sense you want to develop the model or flow, et cetera? You mean the, the map? Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, the idea is that we, uh, we, want to we want to obtain some map similar to this one. But mm -hmm. this one doesn't consider buoyancy, so this would be grass of zero, right? And we... On it, we want to provide this stability map for different uh, graphs of numbers, different buoyancies, uh, magnitudes. So that when studying the DCLL condition, the, the liquid metal flow condition on the DCLL design, uh, we can know if we are going to encounter vorticities or not, instabilities or not. Basically, this, this is the idea that we are pursuing.
Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, I have another question. You said you can uh, launch many, many cases, like hundreds or a thousand. Hundred cases, maybe you said. Uh, can you explain? Can you describe the detail of the computing in terms of computing resources? For example, how many nodes using and uh, wall time, etc. For one case, for example, one typical case. Yeah, actually, it, it uh, it's very depending on the Hartman number, because mm -hmm. very high Hartman number requires very very um, small cells on the boundaries. So um, for, let's say for Harman numbers, uh, let's say 2000, something like this, one to the case of this shape, let's say this shape, for instance, um, it could have, let's say half million nodes and it could take, um, around a day using one node and 48 cores something like this and in marconi we're calculating that in marconi we're always trying to to go to go to work below uh, so one node or less so never go beyond two nodes because uh, that um, may create some some problems with uh, parallelization etc so that speeds up so we can for instance run um 30 cases in par at the same time using one note each something like this mm -hmm. yeah for instance harman higher harman number can take a couple of weeks maybe or more even weeks. for 2d that's very detailed. yeah okay yeah uh -huh. i see i see thanks thanks for your answer now it's uh yeah it's time Time. So thank you very much, the speaker. Uh, let's move on to the next uh, talk. This is also a contributed talk. Uh, this will be delivered by uh, Dr. Sita Sundar. I hope I can I could pronounce it correctly. Uh, now uh, it, the stage is yours. Please uh, please start. Thank you. Okay, uh, good evening everyone. I'll be talking today about flow shear driven instabilities in relativistic EMHD regime. So outline of the talk is like this. First, I will describe what EMHD regime is and then how relativistic effects are affecting this EMHT model and instabilities therein. And then I'll discuss various facets of velocity shear driven instabilities. Then I'll show some results and conclusions. So motivation for this talk is very different from what we have been listening since uh, morning today. This is related to fast electron propagation in plasmas as found in fast ignition scheme of laser fusion. Fast ignition scheme of laser fusion is a variant of inertial confinement fusion scheme where the task of compressing the nuclear DT pellet is separate from creation of hot spot or ignition spot. So what happens in fast ignition scheme? First, a nanosecond laser pulse is used for compression purposes. Then fast sub picosecond laser pulse is used for ignition. So this is the basic methodology of fast ignition scheme. 
Sorry, I think if you can make uh, the, if you can use full screen mode, that's more easy for us to see, see your screen, see your slide. Thanks. Is it okay now? Yeah, that's, that's nice. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. So this is the basic uh, methodology for fast emission scheme. We have a deuterium tritium pellet, which is of millimeter size. So, and there is a gold cone. So laser penetrates through these gold cones first. So first uh, nanosecond laser pulse compresses this target. But when it compresses this target, it uh, heats the outer envelope of the DT pellet. This DT pellet then expands, which in turn exerts force on the inside deuterium tritium material. So it, it compresses the deuterium tritium material to uh, higher densities. Now, at these higher densities, it is suitable for ignition purposes. And then uh, uh, laser pulse, fast sub picosecond laser pulse is impinged on this deuterium tritium core uh, and then ignite this core. But what happens? Laser pulse cannot penetrate this overdense plasma like deuterium tritium core. So, uh, in turn, fast electrons are generated inside this deuterium tritium core. These electrons, when propagate, they, uh, when they propagate, return shielding current comes back. So there is a uh, current sheet uh, propagating in opposite directions are there. These current sheets undergo various kinds of instabilities like Y-belt, tearing, coalescence instability, and they form current channels, like fast electrons moving towards the core and return shielding current coming in the opposite direction. So this kind of situation where return shielding current uh, and fast propagatory current can be modeled using a velocity sheared profile. So as the energetic beam propagates inward, the background plasma electrons provides for the return shielding current. So we have a core carrying inward current and outer shell the return current. So this can be modeled like we have a faster electron moving uh, in the right hand side and return shielding current, which is slow moving uh, plasma electrons, they are in the opposite direction. So uh, we have a cylindrical channel like situation here. So this can be modeled using a seared axial velocity. Like we have a velocity which has shear along the radial direction. This sheared velocity produces a poloidal equilibrium magnetic field B theta, which, are, which also has a shear in radial direction. So these shear uh, velocities are known to be susceptible to instabilities. Like even in neutral fluids, it has been found that whenever there is a shear in the velocity, uh, then uh, it is uh, unstable to kelvin helmholtz like modes. So uh, how it affects when we are dealing with uh, EMHD model in plasmas. So EMHD model is like, we have electrons uh, dominating the phenomena and ions are just stationary neutralizing background. So we are looking at phenomena at very fast time scales. Uh, so electron time scales is the response time, like time scale is in between electron and ion gyro frequency. So there are certain instabilities, how these instabilities are different from neutral fluid instabilities. We compare them, let's see. So the governing equations for this set of equations like uh, gamma is the relativistic factor, mass, any, they are typ typical as denoted in plasma. So this is the relativistic momentum equation and continuity equation coupled with Maxwell's equations. In EMST model, in general, uh, we ignore displacement current term. So we have uh, these set of equations. But when we take uh, relativistic speed, very strongly relativistic speed, ignoring the displacement current term won't be appropriate. So we will see the effect of displacement current also on the instabilities. The no normal normalizations used are like this. So length scale is electron skin depth, normalized with electron skin depth. Magnetic field is uh, normalized with typical magnetic field value, B0, B0, and the time is uh, normalized with gyro frequency. So uh, this is the norm normalization in time. So 
since to model these instabilities in cylindrical geometry, geometry is quite difficult, we tried to model it in Cartesian geometry. So we made some simplifications here. So there are no variations along y direction. So velocity is sheared along x and z. So flow is along z, but shear is along x. A magnetic field produced is along y direction. So we have a sheared magnetic field along y and the perturbed magnetic field also along y. Velocity, velocity and its perturbations are along z and x directions. So to study this uh, system, we started with analytical profiles, step velocity profile, which, uh, which represents the shared velocity profile. Then we chose a uh, realistic profile because in general, uh, velocity profiles are not quite step-like. In truth, they are like, uh, they have some shear width. So we chose tangent hyperbolic profile and we solved it numerically. So for step velocity profile, we analytically got a determinant which we solved and found the growth rate. And using the growth rate profile, we, we plot here the growth rate upon V. So this is the growth rate for non-relativistic case. Second one is for uh, the velocity is very a little higher and uh, solid line denotes for uh, the case with displacement current term and the dotted line denotes without displacement current term. And this, uh, the subplot C and D show the growth rate, difference in growth rate for weakly relativistic and non-relativistic and strongly relativistic and weakly relativistic case. So the difference is not very pronounced we see uh, uh, at very small cages, cages, like very small scales, the difference is very, uh, very less, but it gets bigger and bigger as we go for higher cages. Uh, but when we model the instability using tangent hyperbolic realistic velocity profile, we see the growth rate is quite different from what we observed earlier, like here we have a continuously growing mode, but now for tangent hyperbolic profile, we have a mode which is growing, becomes maximum, and then such starts decreasing, and then such such is to zero. So, and there is a uh, particular value of kg epsilon at which it becomes zero. So for neutral hydrodynamic fluid, this kg epsilon is equal to one. So, when kg epsilon is equal to one, like shear when the uh, shear in velocity is of the order of the mode excited, then the growth stops. But uh, for the EMHT uh, KH instability, we have KG epsilon, which is smaller than one. This is for the relativistic velocity for which V not equal to 0.8. So this is velocity 0.8 C, you could see. Now, if we in, increase the relativistic velocity even further to uh, 0.9 C, then the growth rate is very, very different from what one expects in for neutral KH-like instabilities. So here we have a mode which is growing, then starts decaying, but it doesn't uh, decay to zero. There are further peaks in the growth rate, like second peak, third peak, fourth peak. So there are multiple peaks in the growth rate. So it means there is not only one mode which is uh, growing, but there are new modes appearing into the system when we go to the relativistic regime, strongly re relativistic regime. And even the width for these instability regime, like KZ epsilon is also increased. So we can excite modes which are even sharper than the shear in the velocity profile. So this is very new, unlike uh, neutral hydrodynamic fluid instabilities. If we increase the velocity even further to 0.95 C, we see that the first peak which was appearing earlier is, has vanished. And we have a mode which is growing. And then uh, now the, kg epsilon range is even beyond one. So it's greater than one. 
it's up to 1.2. Besides that, there is a blue dotted line. This blue dotted line denotes real frequency. You have five In this case, minutes. okay. So these blue lines de denote the real frequency. So we have real frequencies over here also. So when we go to extra relativistic regime, we have not only the uh, growing mode, but we have oscillations also into the system. So we try to explain the multiple peaks in growth rate in strong relativistic regime using an analytical scheme, which shows a condition like uh, gamma naught V naught double prime minus V naught U square upon omega bar gamma naught cube is equal to zero, which in turn denotes that necessity condition for instability implies that V naught minus gamma naught V naught should change sign. This can be understood using the eigenvalue and eigen uh, eigenvalue plots. So this blue dotted lines shows eigenvalues and uh, the red lines are gamma naught minus gamma naught V naught double prime. So you could see uh, for a smaller V naught, it changes sign only once. But if we go to higher V naught, higher velocities, it changes sign more than once uh, in the shear width regime. So it means when we are using relativistic limits, then the shear in velocity produces shear in the relativistic factor also, relativistic mass factor, uh, which in turn generates scales which are sharper than the velocity shear. So uh, this is more pronounced when we go to ultra relativistic regime. When we plot the maximum growth rate, and the threshold value of the wave vector, we uh, see the maximum growth rate. And this is the first peak for when V not equal to 0.9. So they follow a certain trend, like they are decreasing with increasing velocity. So uh, to conclude the work, in the present incompressible limit, role of displacement current was found to be very weak. So displacement current is uh, not very prominent and in general, uh, even in the relativistic regime, we can ignore displacement current as long as it's in the incompressible limit. For step velocity profile, growth rate increases monotonically with Kz. This gets restricted by finite shear width epsilon of equilibrium velocity profile. In the strongly relativistic regime, the growth rate shows many novel characteristics like asymmetric eigenfunction, multiple peaks due to shear in the relativistic mass vector of electrons. And the gamut of unstable wave vector widens and the mode doesn't remain purely growing, but some real frequencies are also observed. Thanks. Thank you very much for your talk. Interesting, good talk. Um, for attendees, uh, do you have, if you have any question, please write uh, down in using Q and A tab. Meanwhile, uh, I want to ask a question. I don't, I, I didn't take a memo of which slide it is, but uh, you showed the government governing uh, equations, it, and it looks this is a nonlinear system. Do you do you solve this nonlinear system or? Yeah, these are governing equations, but uh, first we solved it in the linear regime. Okay. 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 So, so uh, use do you use computer simulation for calculating the this kind of yeah, dependence yeah. of growth growth, growth yeah. rate? Huh? Yeah. 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 Oh, okay. Uh, is is this something uh, heavy heavy big big code or you can? Uh, the linear code we used as a. Uh, not very big code, but the nonlinear one uh, needs. Uh, oh, you have nonlinear. Okay. Yeah. So for nonlinear case, we need uh, this is uh, nonlinear one is used uh, with the LCPFCT package developed by NRL, NRL. So that needs clay simulations, clay machines, but the linear ones are uh, used with the MATLAB code. Mm -hmm. Okay, you have a question from Mavi. Probably she's mentioning about nonlinear one you, were me you mentioned. Uh, the question is, could you comment on the computational costs of your simulations? 
Yeah, so the nonlinear code uh, uses like uh, 36 cores uh, for like 16 hours. Using which machine? Can I Three machines. Okay, okay. So. I see. So do you have any question? Okay, I think, I think uh, what? Sorry. Yeah, that is, that is the question uh, I see. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank uh, you. Okay. I think it's time. It's time to have a break. Thank you very much for, for your participation, speakers and attendees. Uh, we are going to have a break, short break. Let's come back to the session, next session uh, in 15 minutes, uh, 3.25. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much for your participation. <clears throat> well, uh, hello, everybody. Um, I think it's time to start the last session of the day. Um, we have a uh, one invited talk and four contribution, and I think that. We all know the rules, but remember that the, to make questions, we need to use the Q&A application in, in Zoom. And well, the, the first talk is in charge of James Dark. I don't know if James is here. Yep, yep, I'm here. Perfect. Whenever you want, you can share your 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 screen. Is that working for you? Yes. Been good. Perfect. Yes. Perfect. Fabulous. All right. Shall we, shall we just get started? Yes, okay, whenever really you want, you can start. Brilliant, thank you very much. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is James Dark. I am with the RFM lab at CEA in, uh, in France. And today I'm gonna to be talking to you about doing some modeling of a uh, hydrogen transport and breeding blankets and specifically looking at the influence of trapping effects in, in these models. Uh, so this is something I would hope everyone would recognize by this point. So this is, <laughs> this is a stereotypical talk about, in particular, ETA. And the operation of a tokamak, as we all know, we're going to have our plasma going around the torus, like so, interacting with our diverter at the bottom here. But in every other kind of future tokamak that we have that will need to generate electricity, every other inch of, of space basically is going to need to be taken up by our breeding blanket. And yeah, so our breeding blanket is going to have three kind of specific uh, requirements for it to be a success. We need it to replenish all the tritium fuel supply um, that we're going to need for our reaction, obviously, uh, from breeding all the tritium inside. And it's going to need to shield all kind of surrounding components in our tokamak from the neutrons that are coming out from our plasma. And we also need it to exhaust and convert the, the energy from our neutrons born into a form that we can then generate into electricity, i.e. heat. So yeah, that is gonna be a very integral part of uh, any future tokamak that will be built, designed to generate electricity for the grid. So what's the kind of motivation behind this re research in particular for tritium transport? Well, first off, there's gonna be very strict limitations on tritium inventories in demo, both kind of in fuel, uh, fuel kind of uh, cargoes, as well as what is being, absorbed into various different structural materials around the vessel itself. Uh, we're all also very concerned about permeation of tritium into cooling channels, in particular if those cooling channels are water, uh, water-based, because 
removing tritium from water can be a bit of a nightmare. Um, also, if we have high levels of tritium around our whole vessel, we might have issues with maintenance and decommissioning in the future at the end of life. And we can also have um, certain hydrogen embrittlement issues with steels. Uh, so Eurofer, for example, we can have so that can lead to changes in mechanical properties of our structural materials. So obviously, we need to be kind of aware of what effect we're having there. But also because of just the general performance of the breeding blanket, we want to make sure that we're a, breeding as much tritium as we can, but also knowing exactly where our tritium is going and making sure that it's going where we want it to go rather than just diffusing out into our tokamak. So what's the, so the work that I've been doing in the past few months, uh, this has been specifically to investigate the influence of trapping effects on, a, on WCLR breeding blankets performance because um, yeah, because trapping is something that's very much a given when looking at any kind of materials level uh, modeling or research. But then once we go up to larger scales, like kind of macroscopic or uh, component level and system level, it's not something that's actually been kind of largely considered so far. So this is kind of initially looking at the influences of this in particular. And we're going to do this by modeling multi-dimensional multi-material tritium transport using a hydrogen transport code called Festin. Um, and from this, we want to accurately evaluate tritium inventories in our structural materials and also evaluate any what tritium is permeating into cooling channels. And from these results, we can then potentially suggest uh, some design alterations or we can work with designers to mitigate permeation into these various different parts of our structure. So how do we go about doing this? How do we go about modeling tritium transport? Well, obviously we need to start with the geometry. So the WCLL design is what we decided to go with for now, just as a one of the proposed designs for demo. And this is a mock-up of um, what a WCLL blanket would look like in the for the case of demo. So what we see here is a lot of these layers sandwiched on top of each other of these unit cells. And what we would have is our liquid lithium lead kind of coming in from the rear and reacting with the neutrons that are coming out from our plasma, heating up and then returning backwards to then be processed to, to exhaust all the heat, the tritium being produced, et cetera. And so for this work, we basically took a, we, we have like this 3D render of a WCLR model, but we actually just did 2D simulations for now on, um, so we just take a central slice here from our 3D model. And this is what makes up our geometry. So, yeah, so this is our 2D geometry. In green, we have our lithium lead breeder, liquid metal. And in gray, we have our Eurofer structure and the cooling pipes in the center here, as well as our tungsten first wall. And for reference, this is about two or three, two or three millimeters thick. Our whole model is about half a meter long. And yes, so in white here, we have our kind of where our cooling channels would be. And yeah, obviously our plasma is coming in from the left-hand side here. And this is a kind of typical mesh that we would use so about 1.1 million elements. And obviously you can see here, we have a particular focus on the structural areas because that's what we're kind of focusing on in this work in particular. Um, yeah, so obviously as, as it's been mentioned several times today already, the kind of the key issue with modeling anything to do with components and tokamak reactors and fusion reactors in general is that there's a lot of different physics at play. And how these all interact with each other is something that needs to be considered in any kind of work. And obviously, neutronics is kind of the cornerstone of most work to do with um, fusion reactors, because and in, for tritium transport in particular, because neutronics is going to form both our source term for tritium production and also our heat source term. And then obviously, where we have our liquid reader and our and our water coolant, we then have interactions from our heat transfer. It's obviously very tightly coupled, changes in density and advection of our heat moving around with our breeder, but both fluid dynamics and the heat transfer directly impact the tritium transport through advection of our breeder, but also heat kind of completely determining a lot of our diffusion rates in tritium transport. But obviously there's a whole bunch of interactions that we can see here, but at the end of the day, when you kind of start to do this, these kind of modeling works, you have to make certain assumptions at some stage and some considerations and simplify models kind of actually be able to get started somewhere. So for this work, we just consider tritium transport, fluid dynamics and heat transfer, and we couple them together. And this is how we define them. So 
We have our um, heat diffusion terminal, our advection of heat. Uh, we have our fluid dynamics um, expression here, which uses the Boussinesque approximation, which basically just kind of determines that we only have changes in the density in our buoyancy term. And these are our uh, terms for describing tritium transport. So these are microscopic rate equations that were first kind of derived by McNabb and Foster in the 60s. And these allow you to kind of describe how the tritium transport um, uh, accounting for trapping mechanisms as well. So we have here our like diffusion term, our source term, our advection term due to the fluid, dy fluid dynamics, coupling them together and how our uh, trapped concentration changes. And it should also be noted that for this work, we did our heat transfer and fluid dynamics in steady state, hence there's no uh, change over time, but our tritium transport we do as a, we do over time. Um, so yeah, for regarding source terms, we basically took a lot of our terms from the literature. So for neutronics, we take this uh, nuclear heating data for a WCLL, and this is as a function of distance from first wall. So if you imagine our plasmas on the left-hand side here, and we have our heating data uh, for both our LA, LIPB uh, breeder in green and our Europhone blue here. And then we basically just do some basic fitting and this um, forms our heat source terms as a function of X distance from our first wall. For the tungsten component of our model, we just took this from the literature. And also our tritium source term is also taken from the literature, but it, all should, but it should be considered that this source term has been evaluated from the same original neutronics data from Morrow. Um, so yeah, it's, it's, it's from the same data essentially. Um, what we're concerned about in tritium transport in particular with materials properties is the diffusivity and solubility of um, hydrogen or tritium in uh, the different materials that we have. And obviously these are a function of temperature. And these have been taken from the literature, of course. Um, and yeah, these are something that you can't evaluate analytically. It needs to be done experimentally. And these two parameters together have kind of form the, the permeability of, of, a, of a given material. Um, moving on. So these are the different trapping parameters that we consider. So we consider two different traps, um, hydrogen traps in tungsten and one in urifa. We've only done this, we've only used three traps for this particular model just for computational cost, really, because every time you add um, another trap, it's an extra degree of freedom. And yeah, so like in some works, it could be considered that there are three traps in tungsten and more in Eurofer as well, um, but not for this work, just, just to start off. But obviously this is like a lot of numbers to kind of consider. What, what's really important to consider really is the, A, the detrapping energy and particular um, the trap density, obviously, you can see here for tungsten is much more significant than it is for Europa. So we do expect to see much higher levels of um, inventory compared to Europa when considering trapping in particular. And if we look at boundary conditions for the hydrogen transport in particular, we consider a recombination boundary condition at our coolant interfaces. We consider just a symmetrical boundary condition on the top and bottom of our domain an implantation flux to account for the um, tritium that's coming in from the plasma directly. And at each material interface, so between the tungsten and urofern, between urofern and uh, lithium lead, we consider the conservation of chemical potential, which basically just um, conserves the ratio of the mobile population relative to the given material's solubility, uh, hydrogen solubility, that is. And these are the values used for, uh, Interested. So that's so moving on to some results. So regarding kind of trying to evaluate temperature fields, if we, we can see here in our 3D model, we have these cooling channels that go like all the way along the channel, and that's not something we can model in a 2D model. So what we do instead is we just actually model the uh, heat transport in 3D, and then we take a 2D central slice basically. And this is what we then use as a reference. And we can, and we basically project this, the results of this steady state simulation onto our tritium transport model. And we can see here, we have like maximum temperatures of about 786 Kelvin in our tungsten, 823 in our Eurofer, which is about the, literally on the maximum of the, of the operating capability of Eurofer, and 925 in our lithium lead. 
one. And moving on to our velocity field. So we designed a CFD solver using the same software, the Fenix software. And so we can see here, we have a minimization of velocity closest to the walls. And if we take a kind of profile across our central point, we, we can see this kind of typical U-shaped uh, velocity profile and a maximum velocity of about 0.2 millimeters per second. And obviously the kind of key issue with this, this work in particular, and, and why we see this U-shaped profile is because we haven't considered MHD forces yet. It is something that we do want to consider. And obviously, as we saw before in some previous presentations, it kind of generally presents as like an M-shaped profile or kind of more of a flat top. And yeah, we obviously see a very different velocity profile once you consider MHD forces. Uh, so moving on to this, so this is a simulation of looking at some tritium transport, uh, in particular, the solute concentration over time. So we can see here that the velocity field has a very significant impact, kind of carrying all the tritium around as we would expect. And we see obviously the highest levels of tritium production right next to the blanket, right next to the closest to the plasma source. And we can see here that most of it's kind of being carried around and we see highest levels of the solute kind of closest to the wall where, where our velocity is minimized. And yeah, and then we can also see here as the hydrogen starts diffusing into our urethra structure as well. And this is an image of our steady state um, field basically with um, obviously we can see highest levels around the center where yeah, it's not necessarily being kind of picked up as much. So when we look at um, inventories all, all over, we see a total kind of increase in our, like from, we have here in dotted, in our, our dotted lines are basically inventories without considering trapping mechanisms and in solid lines with trapping mechanisms. So we can see a very significant jump here in our tungsten in our first wall here. And we see a significant increase as well in our, both our structure and reading zone pipes. And yeah, so it just kind of goes to show that actually where, a lot of designers kind of work within very strict limits of looking at hydrogen um, inventories in our structure. Actually, we kind of really do need to consider this effect at a much larger scale as well, because we might be kind of pushing what the safety limits are already for tritium inventories in our structure. And this so now we're looking at um, permeation into our first wall. So this GIF is just showing us the um, trapped concentration of hydrogen in our structure, kind of ignoring what's happening in the, the thing for now. And what we can see here is that the, the trapped concentration is extremely dependent on the temperature. So where we have a kind of uh, copy of the temperature map here, in the areas where it's hottest, we see the lowest levels of trapping. And that's because the, the temperature is kind of imparting enough energy onto the hydrogen so that it doesn't get trapped in this kind of energy sink. And it can allow it to like keep on diffusing through the material and in particular here kind of diffuse into our cooling channels. And we can also see here that we have like much lower levels of um, trapping around the where our velocity is also highest here. But what I wanna focus on at the minute now is kind of looking in particular at this first wall region because if we kind of blow up this color bar completely out of proportion and we look at the contributions from both the plasma and the breeder, we can see here that the, the contribution from the breeder absolutely dominates what is going into these first wall cooling pipes. And like what's coming in from the, the plasma is either not diffusing fast enough or it's just kind of getting trapped initially in these areas where it's cool next to the first wall. And so, so for some actual numbers for context, we can see here that by orders of magnitude, the contribution of tritium that's going into our first wall cooling pipes is coming from the breeder rather than the plasma. So again, something that can definitely be considered in some higher like kind of system models and stuff. Looking at um, surface flux going into our breeding zone pipes here. So we have here in different colors relating to the, the position of the um, breeding zone pipe in relation to the first wall here, we can see our highest levels of kind of surface flux in our middle zone pipes, which is kind of expected if you see the, the steady state field of where our tritium is. And we see the lowest levels kind of at our rear breeding zone pipes. And this is obviously due to what, how our velocity field is so much more significant at the rear here. 
And where we have the velocity is much more significant around the pipe, it's not giving it the time for the hydrogen to diffuse into the, the breeding zone pipe itself. And we can also see that it takes, but this is also, yeah, this is um, all it's kind of steady state and or not for tritium obviously, but, and it, it takes roughly about kind of 12 to 15 days to get up to this state. But obviously with demo, we're not likely to see operation for 15 days. I think it's like 7,200 seconds at a time. So it's not completely representative. But, yeah. Um, so yeah, kind of moving on into something else, something that is obviously very important for model. A model is only ever as good as the parameters that you use from the literature. And for something, so for certain material property, all material properties really, they have to be determined experimentally. And there's one kind of feature which is obviously very important in modeling tritium transport in particular for a WCLL, and that is the solubility of lithium of hydrogen in our liquid breeder. Because depending on which reference you use, basically, you can have vastly different results because we see here kind of a, almost like two orders of magnitude difference in various different references. And also to, to compare, this is the solubility of urethra that we use in the model. So depending on which reference you use for the solubility of hydrogen and lithium lead, at different temperatures, your hydrogen may be more soluble in your lithium or it may be more soluble in your urethra, which kind of, kind of then pushes it's, for lack of a better word, the hydrogen's more incentivized to kind of diffuse to whichever area it's most um, soluble, kind of it can mitigate diffusion that way. So basically just to in investigate the significance of this range in the literature, we just take kind of two very maximum values and a bunch of values in between of solubility of hydrogen and lithium lead. And we run the same model again over and over to see how inventories change. And these are the kind of results that we see. So it's a bit not easy to read, but what we, the basic the message here is that we see as the solubility of hydrogen and lithium lead increases, our structural inventories decrease naturally, because obviously if all our tritium is being produced in our breeder, it's then less inclined to diffuse into our urethra if it's not, if, if the hydrogen is much more soluble in lithium lead than it is in urethra. But for reference, this black dotted line is a measure of the actual, of the reference we used for lithium lead. So if you use, so depending on what reference you use, if you use an other reference, the likelihood is, is that the, there's, a, there's a large potential that actually what we estimate in our work is actually an underestimation. And that actually, if you use, if we discovered that the hydrogen is uh, much less soluble in uh, lithium lead than we thought, then our structural inventories could increase dramatically. And basically, depending on the reference you use, we see like a factor 25 difference in urethra inventories and about factor three difference in uh, first of all cooling channel surface fluxes. So yeah. So yeah, so where do we go on from here? Well, there's basically a lot of new things we obviously want to kind of start incorporating into the same model and will be the kind of per the kind of forms the objectives of my PhD in particular. And so one thing that we want to start considering is how neutrons affect um, hydrogen inventories, because obviously hydrogen traps are essentially formed from microstructural defects in our kind of solid materials. So obviously as we're having a lot more neutron damage over time, the number of these defects is going to massively increase over time and therefore forming new traps and therefore making how our um, inventories change more, much more significant over time. And yeah, so this is something that we're working on at the minute and trying to start considering into our model. So by creating, uh, basically developing a trap creation model, obviously MHD is something that's very, it's, it's very kind of new in the field of regarding tritium transport for breeding blankets in particular, but it is kind of very important to start considering now because it does have such a significant effect on the velocity field of our liquid nettle breeder in particular. Um, we want to start considering some more complex um, interface and surface models, also looking at co-permeation, so considering the effects of deuterium, in particular at the first wall, and hopefully try and get some kind of a chance to try and get some experimental validation as well of some parts of the model, if not, is obviously creating a whole uh, lithium lead. 
uh, components not going to be happening anytime soon in particular. Um, yeah, so just in conclusion, FESM has been used to simulate tritium transport in both solid and liquid components of the WCLL. Uh, the flow of the breeder has been taken into account uh, by coupling FESM to a CFD solver. We've seen that the inclusion of trapping effects and in modeling increases uh, inventories, tritium inventories by 15% in this case. Uh, permeation to the first wall cooling channels is completely dominated by tritium coming from our breeder rather than our plasma. And the fact that um, certain material parameters definitely require a lot more um, further experimental data basically to improve the reliability, thus improving the reliability of models that we then create from those results. Um, if you're interested in this work in particular, we just recently managed to get a publication in Nuclear Fusion. Um, I encourage you to go read it and we go into a lot more detail then about the, the work we did. Um, and just to kind of acknowledge the, uh, our work has been partly funded by Eurofusion as well. Um, thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'm happy to answer. Thanks, James. Good presentation. Um, well, we have some questions. Uh, one of uh, Roberto Iglesias asks, uh, well, uh, there are two questions in one, yes? Uh, the question I will try to transmit uh, could diffusivity and solubility be used neither for analytical nor experimental data, but from multi-scale modeling simulations? Okay, I think that... Uh, uh, sorry, could diffusivity be used yes. from analytical experiments? Um, I believe um, diffusivity and solubility is something that it has to be basically done experimentally. I don't know how much you can evaluate analytically, to be honest. Um, um, for instance, should non-new diffusivity prefactor activation energies be obtained and subsequently incorporated to your modeling if a nanostructured sustained solution is meant for the first world? Um, yeah, I don't I'm, know if you incorporate, if you understand the question. Um, partly, I guess. Um, yeah, I, I haven't seen personally any work from kind of evaluating trapping and solubility parameters analytically um, or diffusivity and solubility parameters analytically. But I, I'd be interested. Please contact me afterwards if you if you know of some work. Um, yeah. yeah. Sorry. <laughs> yes. So no, no, no. I understand that the, the maybe uh, Roberto can uh, do your, the question in private. Because it's very complex the 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 the, the, the answer. Um, I would like but to like, yeah, yeah. just just I, sorry, I, the second part of that question where he was saying that if new fact if new values were kind of evaluated, could we implement them? And the answer is absolutely yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Yeah. There are another question about Mary asks about if fifteen percent increase in tritium inventory is still acceptable for demos. I, I think that this this is the question. Um, at the minute, no, but obviously demo is still a very kind of evolving project. And so we're still like, they still haven't even come up with a kind of concrete design for it yet. So we, so they haven't A, decided what actual breeder they're gonna use at the minute, but for current, we haven't kind of taken this model and scaled it up, but normally when you're kind of working in design, you do kind of work right up to safety limits, right? So well, obviously with kind of a given factor to, Cushion it, but um, I would accept. I would expect that it kind of goes past at the minute what uh, is, is current safety limits. Um, another question about Daniel Suarez. Uh, he asks about uh, if if you consider the possibility to pin finding helium bubbles on the liquid metal. Uh, and how will that affect the tritium transports? Okay, uh, we uh, haven't yet, but that is actually the work of uh, my colleague Remy Dillapot Matiohan. Actually, um, so I think in the liquid metal, I don't know how much of an impact it would have. Obviously, helium bubbles is something of concern in in our in our tungsten first wall, but I'm not sure how it would affect in our breeder itself because, like. For example, at the minute, if we consider kind of atom densities, we're having kind of one uh, tritium produced for every like 
for every one E to the six LIPB atoms like. So, so we, we don't even really have enough to form like any kind of tritium bubbles or anything. So I don't think the helium bubbles will affect the tritium transport that much in the liquid breeder itself. Okay. I, uh, I, I, will, um, I will make a question of Marina Beculet, do it, mm -hmm. about, because it's, it's, I, I have the same question. Uh, she, she, she wonder if there is any possibility to test this model against experiments. Well, we see that you show a lot of spreading in the results in the literature. Mm. Maybe to try to do something experimental could be, uh, but I don't know how, how, if you are planning to... Um, I, yeah, we do have some, some permeation experiments going on at IRFM. But in terms of like the WCLL in particular, I know that there is some work planned by the like in the WPB uh, package for Eurofusion where they are looking at a in particular that um, material parameter I was talking about of solubility in liquid lead. But moreover, then they actually want to start building some component scale okay. models of like okay. I think just keeping it simple for now, just having like a tube. Or, and then having our kind of liquid lithium lead flowing in between, and then hopefully being able to measure permeation going through the tube or something. I know there is some work being planned, and I think it's being done in CMAT in, in Madrid. I can't, can't confirm that, but yeah, there, there is some work planned, and I would obviously love to be able to kind of collaborate to validate anything that's uh, been done in this work in particular. But yeah, there's nothing at the minute that we're kind of jumping out for hopefully in the future, for sure. Perfect. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, we have the last question of the, from Mary. Uh, I don't know if you read it, but uh, you have simulated a fixed breathing blank in design. It's look that the design could be further improved from the treatment transport point of view. Could you comment on the possibilities of such optimi optimizations based on testing? Um, a fixed breathing blanket design. Um, Fix, yes. Yeah, we could definitely start looking into some optimization stuff because we do want to not only just look at WCLL blankets, we would like to kind of consider the other um, options that have been considered for demo, such as like our pebble bed designs and stuff. And we have kind of started kind of postulating ways that we could do that as well. Um, yeah, because our because the geometry, like we are very flexible on it. We could potentially kind of apply the same method to any, to any geometry and definitely something we want to look into in the future. Perfect. Well, thanks very much, James. Uh, Thank you. Very interesting talk. Um, OK, we pass to the, the next one. Brilliant. Thank the you very much. Talk. No, thank you. Yes. The next talk is in charge of Ezekiel Goldberg. Um, Ezekiel, whenever you want, you can share your presentation. Thank you very much. Just a second. So can you see the screen? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, Alejandro, and thanks to the entire committee of the workshop. I'm Ezequiel Goldberg. Uh, I'm part of the fusion group of the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And I'm presenting this work on the development of a massively parallel neutron transport code. Alia has been described in detail in a previous presentation today. So this will be a very brief summary to refresh the information and for anyone who may have missed it. Alia is a computational mechanics and multiphysics code created within BSC. Its development involves a multidisciplinary team of many professionals from the case department of BSC, as well as external collaborators from research centers, universities, and companies. It solves partial differential equations in unstructured finite element meshes. And it has a modular structure with each module describing different physical processes. And the coupling between them is achieved at the time step level. It is important to know that um, it was developed and designed using highly scalable numerical methods with supercomputers in mind, particularly Marinostrum, 
which is housed at BSC. It's been established to have uh, excellent scalability up to 100,000 processors and 4 trillion elements. That's 4 trillion uh, in English. Um, it implements various parallel frameworks at different levels without uh, user intervention, other than asking for it in the input. And all of this um, has allowed Alia to be part of six uh, European Union funded centers of excellence in high performance computing, which um, prepare, they prepare simulation codes for exascale computing to support uh, scientific progress. On the fusion side of things, uh, it has been mentioned uh, quite a few times today, but it is known that the fusion plasma is a source of neutrons that reach the materials and components surrounding the plasma and interact with them in several ways, um, inducing heat uh, damage or producing tritium to feed the fusion process. And to simulate these neutronic processes, Neutro is being developed as a deterministic neutron transport solver within the ALIA multiphysics framework with the goal of providing accurate calculations for shielding, tritium breathing, heat transfer, and damage uh, to reactor elements, and assisting in the analysis of the materials and component designs. The deterministic approach was chosen as it is deemed uh, less expensive in terms of computational demand than other methods, and with the hope of providing a more global analysis and complementing these other methods that, for example, Monte Carlo analysis. The input needed by Neutro is obtained from evaluated nuclear data files, which are publicly available. And we use the enjoy free and open source software from Los Alamos National Laboratory to parse and retrieve the information, such as the total macroscopic cross sections and the energy group matrix for the elements present in each case. And this has to be done for each element or each isotope uh, that is involved in the case to be simulated. And we have developed some ad hoc tools to help us pre-processing this data and transforming it from the output we get from Enjoy to the format we require in Neutro. <clears throat> now, here is an overview of the equation we are solving in ALIA, which is a stationary Boltzmann transport equation without the terms related to fission. It includes the total macroscopic cross sections um, the energy group scattering matrix and the source, all of which depend on the spatial variable, which is discretized with the finite element mesh, and also the solid angle and the energy of the neutrons, both of which have continuous ranges and need to be discretized as well. For the solid angle, we use the discrete ordinates method or an alternative method applying quadrature sets based on discontinuous finite elements. And for the energy group, uh, the, for the energy, the multigroup approximation is used. In the multigroup approximation, the energy spectrum is divided into several smaller energy ranges or groups, and each of them has a constant cross section meaning if we have uh, capital G number of groups, the equation uh, with the continuous range of energy changes as shown uh, on the slide to account for each of these energy groups. I also said before that for the solid angles, we use the discrete ordinates method with equal level set, applying quadrature points with adequate weights to divide the phase space in several points which yields M, uh, capital M possible discrete directions. This means we have a G by M matrix to solve for each finite element. And as with any discretization, the level of detail uh, has a direct impact on the computational demand. To detail the current state of Neutro, we can work with three-dimensional domains using unstructured meshes, which is very important since the intricate geometry of fusion reactors requires true 3D geometric representations, and that is a challenge in itself. The simulations are stationary, and we can apply isotropic neutron sources at the boundaries 
um, with anisotropic scattering using real base expressions for spherical harmonics. Uh, recently, we incorporated in the code the possibility of using multiple heterogeneous materials, meaning several materials with various constituents each present uh, within a case. Now, here is an example of this recent development. We are working on this case in collaboration with the, the tech fear group from UNED, with, which have a vast experience in these topics. And two very distinct materials are being considered as part of the first wall of the reactor, including the lithium lead breathing blanket uh, surrounded by, the, by steel. And in a case such as this, we would consider the properties of every one of the constituents involved in each of the materials. For example, the neutron cross sections for both isotopes of lithium-6 and lithium-7, and three isotopes of lead-206 through 208 for the breathing blanket, and of the isotopes of iron, chromium, tungsten, etc., present in the steel, as well as the percentages of the constituent in the material to account for how much they influence uh, the effective value of the property, in this case, for example, the cross-section in the, in the material. We are currently testing and contrasting results obtained for cases with these types of material. And here in this slide, we can see some recent results of neutron leakage, which would be the neutrons that reach the side farthest from the source and escape the material compared with the experimental data reported in the SINBAD benchmarks. A SINBAD stands for Shielding Integral Benchmark Archive Database. And it was the outcome of a project that intended to establish a database containing sets of radiation shielding and dosimetry data relative to experiments that are relevant um, to reactor shielding, fusion blanket neutronics, and accelerator shielding. We contrasted our results with various cases using different materials and geometries. Uh, what you are seeing now is a manganese three-dimensional layer using 59 energy groups. And it can be observed that the results obtained for the leakage as a function of the energy follow the measurements quite well with um, some dispersion towards the lower energy end. Here we have a um, very similar case with the same geometry, but using silicon, uh, which was one of their experimental results in the series. And again, the results are very good, um, very good agreement, uh, with a little dispersion on the lower side of the spectrum. <clears throat> and we can see here results for another case with a different geometry. Uh, in this case, a tungsten sphere with a deuterium tritium neutron source in the hollow center. And our results follow the experimental measurements uh, quite well, including the peak near 14 mega electron volts. <clears throat> and for this last result, um, we have here results for an iron spheric shielding overlaid with the measurements from the Sinbad experimental series and also contrasted with results obtained by our group from the MCNP software, which uses the Monte Carlo probabilistic approach. Uh, our results are adequate and satisfactory, yet there is some room for improvement, um, considering well, the, the angular discretization. And it should also be noted that the spherical geometry is a possible source of error, since it is not an exact representation of the real space. There could also be some discrepancies in the representation of the source, which we consider to be isotropic, but in the experimental report, it is stated to have a certain angular dispersion. Using mesh refinement and mesh partition methods, which are part of the features that Ali offers to users, um, the scalability of Neutro was studied when running in a supercomputer. The case uh, here where we have two instances of the same case, except for the number of elements and the number of computing nodes that was used. It is worth mentioning uh, that the implemented parallelization strategy is the main secondary technique with the main process in charge of distributing the data and the communication 
and the secondary threads performing the calculations using uh, the message passing interface or MPI. Um, in the graph, it can be seen that the case with almost 78,000 elements reaches a 95% efficiency uh, with 256 processes. While the second case, the, the bigger one with more elements, almost an order of magnitude more, shows some degradation due to the overhead required for the communication between the processes and reaches an 82% efficiency with uh, 1,024 processes and a 70% efficiency for 2,048 processes, which although not ideal is still a good performance. The current and future work involves well, calculating the heating cost by the neutron flux, as well as calculating the tritium production from neutrons interacting with the breathing blankets, and eventually including uh, the effects of gamma radiation, which are significant, for, for example, for the heat. Um, but well, we are still studying how to approach this task, which is not trivial. Um, as I said before, we are working with collaborators with a lot of experience in these topics to perform comparisons with other neutronics codes, such as the Monte Carlo code MCNP, as a means of validation. And finally, some of the steps I just mentioned um, are required for one of the most important goals, which is coupling neutro with other ALIA physics modules, such as the thermohydraulics one. And for that, we also need to select some validation cases to test the coupling and in the hope of eventually being able to solve the thermal, mechanical, and neutronic behavior in one simulation at the same time. To conclude, we have a deterministic neutron transport code that was integrated into the ALIA multiphysics framework, which allows us to adapt it to the needs of both our group and the surrounding organizations. The goal is to make a tool to contribute, in, to, contribute to reactor design studies, uh, for example, for future reactors such as DEMO. And we are currently working with multiple materials in each in, a, in the same case as composites or alloys that are found in fusion reactors in uh, three-dimensional domains with unstructured meshes. And our results are in good agreement with the experimental measurements taken from the SIMBAT benchmarks. The code shows uh, good scalability, but we have improvements planned and we are continuing the development to expand the set of features, uh, including calculating heat and treating production, as well as to refine the accuracy of the results. Thank you very much. Um, thank you, Ezekiel. Um, uh, we have a few questions to you. Uh, the first one is Marina Vipulet. Asking well, some of these questions were uh, were answered in your presentation, but uh, uh, how she asks about Alia uh, is he, he, it is or not related to IMAS, the tool for different code coupling and the development of Eurofusion uh, for a few years already. Uh, this is the first question. There are another question uh, about the different modules of ALIA, and uh, this they are a bit coupled in simple way. Are all modules rebrightened using high level HPC optimization or based on all codes? Uh, I don't know how do you want to start to answer. Okay, I'll try to break it down. I think it's three questions in one. So um, there are members in our group that are working with IMAS. Um, I'm not very familiar with the tool, but um, I would suggest that maybe you contact uh, me or some other members of our group by email and we can discuss this, this question particularly uh, with more depth. And on the other hand, the other part of the question, um, so the if different modules in ALIA can be coupled in a simple way, that's um, a little bit relative. Um, if the, it's simple for the user, it's not 
as simple for the developers. So the developers have to make sure that the coupling works correctly. But if the coupling um, has been developed and tested, then for the user, it's just a matter of selecting the, the modules that they want to use. Um, and then on the last part of the question, are all modules re rewritten using H high level HPC optimization or based on old codes? Um, I can't say for every module. What I can say is that the, the parallelization part and uh, the HPC part of the code is taken care by Alia itself and the, the kernel part of Alia. And then the physics, the different physics modules um, just take advantage of these um, parallelization uh, interfaces that are exposed to the to the developers. Uh, so there's no, so the developer just has to worry about using and taking advantage of the, these features that Alia has. Perfect. And another question of Helen Brooks. Uh, uh, he he says your results on slide eleven and the other slides, of course, uh, sham around a lot, but you don't show error bars. Are you able to quantify uncertainties? What are main sets of uncertainties? Uh, um, so yes, we. Also, I mean. Um, we are able to quantify the uncertainties. We haven't um, dedicated um, a lot of our efforts to this yet, uh, since we are still in the development uh, stage and testing and comparing to some results. Um, I, uh, regarding the sources of uncertainty, um, I think I mentioned a few of them in during the presentation. So. The, geomet the geometry representation could be one of them. Then the representation of the source, which we we have only used uh, isotropic sources. And so not all of the experiments use isotropic sources. And then the level of discretization used for the, the, the energy range um, and the amount of energy groups, as well as the angular discretization is probably another source of uh, uncertainty. Perfect. Well, I think that's very good, Ezekiel, and we can pass to the next presentation. OK, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next presentation is in charge of Giovanni Lapenda. How are you, Giovanni? All right, do you hear me? Yes. Now I'm gonna share the screen. Okay. Let's see if you see the screen here, and then I'm gonna make a full screen. Yes. Do you see it? Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Very well. Good. Good. Thank you for the opportunity to speak at this conference. Um, so I'm going to talk about the the methods for full sixty modeling uh, of, of a full device uh, for high beta plasmas. And uh, so the, the type of method that I'm going to describe is, is first principle particle and stuff, where the, the fields are full Maxwell's equations and the particle is full, full trajectory. So uh, the distinction that we, we make in our method is between explicit and implicit methods. Um, in the explicit method, you know, you, you, you progress in steps. You uh, solve the Maxwell's equations in given particles positions and velocities. Once you have advanced the Maxwell's equations, then you, you solve for the, for the particles. So uh, it's, everything is, is explicit. You can compute the new current from the old fields and you compute the new fields from the old current and density, of course. This uh, has great advantages in terms of implementation, but and it has a lot of very successful applications. However, there are some limitations. This limitation is that, first of all, energy is not conserved. And this introduces some stability limits. And then uh, the time step and the grid spacing have to be uh, are limited by stability constraints. 
when implicit methods are used, what you do is that you iteratively solve the two coupled equations together. So you're no longer stepping one over the other. What you are doing is that you are solving them together. So you cannot compute the new current until you are computing a new field, and you cannot compute a new field until you are computing a new current. So this requires a full iteration between all the particle movers and all the field solver, which is a tremendously large nonlinear iteration. Okay, which is not really feasible in, in, in this. I mean, it is feasible for small problems, but if you want to go massively parallel, that's very challenging. Although one day it will be, it will be implemented. But um, so uh, the advantage though is that it removes the stability constraints. Not not all of them. I I was a little bit exaggerating here when I say no stability limits. I say greatly reduce stability limits. And in particular, delta t and delta x can be chosen to your desired resolution. So if you're resolving a certain problem. You don't need to worry about the smaller scales if you know that they are not important. In practice, here uh, I'm using uh, this machine in Korea because we have started a new collaboration. These are the typical scales of this machine. I go from a cyclotron plasma, ion cyclotron, ion plasma, and then a millisecond. And on the other side, you see the spatial scales. So you see, the explicit method has to resolve the smaller scale. And that is why it's so convenient to use the gyrokinetic method, because the gyrokinetic method does not have to do that. But if you want to do a 6D full peak, uh, fully uh, six dimensional simulation, then, then this is a constraint you have. If instead you use an implicit method, you can select your resolution at the level that you desire, because you know that the method will not go unstable. It may be inaccurate, perhaps, if the underlying physics is not well considered. But for problems that you, well, where you know that you can do it, then, then it's a reliable method to use. This is an example of what I was saying for specific, specific case of streaming instabilities where, where you can see that the energy conserving method conserves energy to, to machine precision, or rather to the precision of the nonlinear iteration that you're using. And this allows you to, to have a, a good transfer of energy between particles and fields. With a larger time step, you can get you can get a particle acceleration that you would not get even with the smallest uh, explicit peak. So then, uh, but as I say, this is fairly uh, impossible, not impossible, but uh, extremely challenging to implement uh, uh, in practice. So explicit is excellent, very easy to implement on uh, supercomputers. It was, in fact, the first application that achieved petascale at Los Alamos in the work of Kevin Bowers, um, full implicit needs this couple uh, system of equations. So you need to implement some sort of fully, uh, you know, full scale Newton creel of method that solves for the whole system, though there are some ways to reduce this, this cost and that's an area of intense uh, investigation. But an alternative is to use semi-implicit method. The semi-implicit method is a method where this strong nonlinear coupling is in some way simplified to become linear. So now you only have to solve the linear set of equations only for the party, for the fields. You can, with this simplification, uh, extrapolate out of the iteration, the particles. So in that, it looks more similar to the explicit method, but it still requires a global solver. Among the same implicit methods, they are new. They were developed first in the late 70s. Uh, at Los Alamos, it was an implicit moment method that was developed by my thesis advisor a long time ago, Jerry Bragbill. And uh, the team instead at Livermore uh, developed the direct implicit method. In one, you, uh, you, you, you achieve this linearization by doing a fluid like expansion. So you're using the Chapman Hensko method to expand the, the current. And in the other, you do a direct linear uh, Taylor series expansion. But both of them, unfortunately, don't conserve energy. So when they, they are manageable, they could be implemented already in the 70s. And in fact, in the 90s, it was part of the numerical Tokamak project in the US. But uh, energy is not conserved. So this still introduces some limitations. So in 2017, I came up with this new idea for doing this operation of linearization without losing energy conservation. And I call it energy conserving semi-implicit method. It's axiom. 
So first, uh, briefly, what is the uh, implicit moment method? That is where I started from, because I worked for like 20 years at Los Alamos, and uh, I was uh, very much involved in the development of this method. In the implicit moment method, you do an expansion. Uh, and I should point out that at this point, uh, the early differences between the direct implicit and the moment implicit have really almost completely disappeared. There are some differences in the in the particle mover and uh, in the centering of the quantities, but but the Taylor series expansion now is just by both. So this Taylor series expansion to express J in terms of E, so you can write a new, new current with, a, an, with an, an expression that you derive analytically with quantities that are all based on initial time step, not initial, I mean the beginning of the time step, and the new electric field. So this is a response of the plasma that, that you can plug into the Maxwell's equation and then you solve an equation only for E and B, because that's the only unknown that is left, the new E and the new B. J is no longer, doesn't need to move the particles anymore because this territory expansion does the job. But as I said, this is not energy conserving. So I made, I made a, some modifications to the mover and uh, to the uh, field solver in a way that uh, the expression that links J and E can be derived uh, using the mass matrix, which is a concept that anybody that works in uh, finite element method, uh, no. Uh, with this mass matrix, uh, one uh, doesn't need to make any any approximations, provided that you discretize the uh, mover uh, according to, to these equations. In essence, this mover is the same mover as the direct implicit, and the field solver is the same field solver of the implicit moment method. So it's kind of a combination of the two methods. When properly combined, then they give you this relationship that is exact. There is no approximation in deriving this formula. Now, same story as before. You have the J, you plug into the Maxwell's equation, you, you have this, 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 this is called the mass matrix. It's known from the beginning of the time step, sorry. And all these quantities are from the beginning of the time step. And only a uh, new thing that you have to keep is the electric field. So once you put it into the equation, you have, um, you have your linear solver, energy conserving. So here is a little bit of history of the implicit moment method uh, that was developed by Los Alamos. And uh, I picked 3D was developed in Kaolov when I left Los Alamos and moved to Belgium. And now we did this uh, new uh, energy conserving method. And now we are trying to implement it in, a, in, in hybrid heterogeneous computers with CPU and GPUs. So that's kind of the history going back to C1985 when the method was uh, say completely derived. Now uh, we are developing Axim further. This is a scaling that is uh, for, I think in, in this case is Pleiades, a supercomputer and NASA. And you can see here that the mass matrix comes at a significant cost. It uh, allows you to conserve energy. So that's, that's a great thing, but it takes half of the calculation to do it. The, the rest have interpolations and the mover. So uh, the idea is that the GPU can take care of these two steps and vastly reduce the cost of the stimulation, I say, by, by almost uh, one quarter of what it was before. And the mover can also be improved by going to, to the GPU. So in, in essence, you are only left with a field solver that it may not be so easy to put on a GPU. Uh, so we, we developed the first uh, the method, then uh, we developed a 3D fully uh, massively parallel implementation. And finally, we did also a 2D version to do some, some 2D problems in Fusion. Uh, this is an example of a work that we did with, with a company. And uh, this is a... Um, our applications also involve astrophysics. So this is, for example, a global model on Mercury that, that can be done. So you can, you can model the whole magnetosphere with full kinetic peak with X. So here is an example of the work that we did on the Polywell that, uh, from a company in San Diego. First thought it was uh, J.M. Park, where we studied uh, magnetic mirrors and uh, the so-called uh, Polywell. But these are two systems where the beta is high. And you can see here the diamagnetic effect being properly computed by the code. We made an extensive study of the boundary region and uh, studied it with, uh, with respect to the mass ratio and uh, arrived at uh, a proper description of this, this device that was then, then published. 
We are now moving on to a new project that started only maybe uh, two or three months ago. It's a project of the National Science uh, Challenge Initiative of the Korean government. So in collaboration with the Koreans, we have realized that the code is especially suitable for studying some of the I-beta operation of the uh, spherical tokamak that they have in Korea. And of course, this can be applied to other spherical tokamaks, just as Koreans, let's say, they, 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 they were uh, able to, to, to secure the funding from their government to do it. And the idea then is to, to apply XIM to this case and to make it more efficient using GPUs. This is an example of a simulation that we, that we one of the first simulations that we did within this project, where you see some islands forming for an instability in uh, this device. And this is uh, the locations where the, where the experiment also sees the instability. Now, I just wanted to briefly mention the advantage of using the implicit method now with, with, with an example. The explicit method has to resolve the smaller scales. So if you do that for having a good energy conservation, you have to do the, use a time step and a grid spacing in every direction that is at this level. When you go, so that would, in, in the estimation to, to, to have a simulation that runs for 48 hours, you will have to use 30 billion processors. So obviously it's not possible to do it with uh, explicit peak. And I, and I stress that that's because the total CPU time goes with the grid spacing in every three directions and time. So if, if you just increase by a factor of 10, each one of them, you gain a factor of 10 to the four in the cost. So that's indeed what already ipeak 3 d could do, the implicit moment method. With that, is uh, the time will go down to, to 30 million processors. I mean, if, if you assume the same total duration of simulation, then, then you, will, you will need 30 million processors, and this is the CPU time that you will need. It's still not really feasible, although it, it, may, it may be feasible in, in exascale computers if there is a dedicated one just to do fusion applications. But, but with, the, with XIM, energy is conserved always. So the, the same simulation I just showed you, the one for the spherical tokamak of Korea, uh, we actually did it uh, with XIM, and it took 48 hours uh, using 30,000 processors. So it, it's a demonstrator that, that, that we, we, we could do it, and, and the results were in good uh, agreement with the, with, the, with the observation. Of course, not, not for everything. If you go look at the small scale uh, turbulence, you know, it's not resolved. So. But if you look at certain uh, magnetic uh, effects, uh, like for example, uh, theory modes, then, then, then the code is uh, suitable for, for that in beta plasmas. So what we are doing now with the Koreans and also uh, with a collaboration in Europe called uh, Deep C, we are uh, moving the code to GPUs. We are, we are looking at applying it to, to Lumi. This code is already running on Lumi, but as you know, Lumi is not yet uh, equipped with the uh, with the GPUs, so we are we are working with uh, with uh, still uh, with uh, NVIDIA GPUs, uh, and uh, we have already experimentally moving the uh, particles and also the interpolation of the mass matrix. In fact, a uh, team led by 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 um, Elisabetta Boella and Maria Elena Innocenti, two of my former students now in university in the UK and uh, at the Ruhr University at Bochum, have a project to to, to do this on the on the uh, Swiss supercomputers. Uh, so we are making rapid progress in moving parts of the code to, to the GPU using, using uh, OpenACC or uh, for the uh, AMD uh, OpenMP. Uh, the other advantage of bringing in the GPUs is that that will also allow us to make a, a more complete analysis as the simulation runs. So some of the GPUs can be used to analyze the data, in particular using machine learning and surrogate models, you know, for example, to represent the smaller scales or to, uh, to, to analyze uh, the particle distributions. Since there are hundreds or hundreds or, 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 or billions of particles, if not trillions of particles, it's not possible for the human mind to analyze that data. We need, we need machine learning. And it's also not possible to save it all the time steps because it would take such an enormous amount of disk space that is not feasible. Uh, doing it on the fly with uh, machine learning running on some portion of the GPUs, then it's, it's certainly a very convenient way to go. So this is part, as I said, of these two projects, the deep, uh, sorry, the deep project, uh, and which describes the this machine with, with this uh, hybrid architecture. 
uh, which has a data analytics module that can do the analysis of the data. For example, here is an analysis of the distribution functions. And, uh, and then there is a component that does, uh, that does the, uh, the, 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 the GPU part and a computer portion does the CPU part. And the GPU part will be the mover, the particle interpolation, and also the construction of the mass matrix. Um, so then in summary, uh, I hope I didn't take too much time because I don't have a clock with me, but uh, I think the exit is now. You're a, you a bit later, but okay, okay, don't, don't worry. Okay, no, but, uh, just quickly, then, it's, it's mature on the CPU uh, and it's been used already for a number of years, but now we are working to moving into the GPUs and if anybody's interested, let's say, to join into this effort, uh, we are uh, open to any collaboration. With that, I, I close because uh, in the slides, you can see some references and so forth, but uh, I don't need to waste uh, your time. Perfect. Okay. Very interesting. Uh, I, 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 there is not much time to question, but there are interesting questions of Marion Smender. Um, and I don't know if you can read it. Uh, you say you can choose your spatial and time state large, but that could excuse phenomena which happen at small scales. Okay. Yes. Could of you course, comment yes, on yes, how yes, well the assumption of, yeah, yeah, for yeah, example, yeah. in a, a assumption applied to the spherical tokamak case? Yeah, this is an interest case. Yeah, so uh, you, of course, have to do a conversion study. And, uh, and, a, and a validation with, with experiments is a, a requirement because you, you, you are using a model that, uh, that is, let's say, vastly more advanced than MHD, but not as advanced as a fully resolved uh, uh, case where, you, since a fully resolved case is not, at this moment, neither in the next 10 years feasible, this is the only thing you can do. And of course, you have to do it carefully, uh, testing that your results are, are reasonable, and uh, uh, guided by physical knowledge about the machine and picking up the right problem where this method can work. Of course, it doesn't work for everything. Okay. Well, thanks very much, Giovanni. Uh, My pleasure, thank you. Um, well, we need to pass to uh, the next presentation is uh, in charge of Shurita Inca. Shurita, uh, I think you are connected. Um, <laughs> You can share your presentation whenever you want. Hello, do you see me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, thank you. I'm ready when you say. <laughs> yeah, 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 you can start. Yeah. Hello, world. My name is Julita Inca. And I'm going to talk about today uh, the, about the scalable, scalable solution of the linear elasticity equations in 3D. I divided this talk into four parts. I'm gonna talk about myself in the STEP program. I'm gonna emphasize the importance of this work. I'm gonna talk about the experiment itself and some conclusions. I am a high performance uh, computing specialist and STEP. STEP stands for Spherical Token Mac for Energy Production. So this is a program of UKAA. Our team aims to generate commercial electricity from fusion by 2040. As you can see in the image, uh, this is composed uh, by several components and we need to do simulations of these uh, elements. This program is ambitious. It challenged science, technology, engineering, and math. So we can say that engineering and HPC people plays a crucial or a key role in our company because we need a scale multiphysics solvers and we need to scale all the simulations as well. So this work provides an approach to fill the gap between engineers and HPC. You can see in the image that different phenomena are related to this work. What I choose is um, based on some uh, previous studies. 
UKAA engineers are performing a scalic analysis, elastic analysis to determine the stress and the strain history. So the experiment, um, the linear elasticity equation in 3D is in simple words, the displacement in 3D. You can, you can have here the equation that relates the displacement to the strain. This strain is very small. As you can see, it's very, very less than one. In my experiment, we have like less than 0, 0, 001. And when you find out this strain, you have to relate it with the stress and you can use this linear elastic equation and you can um, use, uh, you have to use the property of the materials, which more, most of the times are isotropic. Once you have uh, calculated the strain or you're related with the stress, you can use the stress divergent equations. You have involved the body force and mostly the couch stress tensor equation. Uh, you can see here the simulation. The simulation was done using MOOS. MOOS is a framework which is based on the final element methods. It has been demonstrated that it can, um, can do simulations over 100,000 cores. It is a friendly user framework. It mostly uh, interacts with other libraries like LeafMesh, Petsy, and Hippre. In my work, I used the uh, LeafMesh and it was able to handle more than 121 millions of those degrees of freedom. So I am using basically in the, the math part, the preconditioners. And I have just several uh, preconditioners as well. But in this case, in, um, today, I'm going to talk just focusing on the hybrid boomer AMG performance. As most of you in the audience can, may know that preconditioners help to solve a sparse linear or very large sparse linear systems um, in companion with some iterative methods. Um, it has been demonstrated in previous study that it performs better when you are doing the combination of preconditioners with cryo subspaces methods. Um, this also uh, motivates the development of more effective preconditioners. So basically my experiment was doing a benchmarking. I was doing simulations of more than 121 degrees of freedoms. Um, in this case, I used the Hippre Boomer AMG, which is based on the multi grid uh, algorithm. This is the list of KSP types. I'm including the use of no cryo of subspace to do the comparisons. I use for the parallelization the MPI and the metal solvers. Uh, These this results are, are were done by using Newton. And uh, for the binary conditions, I use Dirichlet and uh, the first Lagrange order at the moment. These are the um, the dimensions or size for the mesh on the element type I use. Okay, due to the memory bound, this uh, simulation was not possible to be run in serial. So that's, I put my baseline like using 10 cores or 10 MPI tasks. I use uh, for the simulation, the hyperbium array, uh, AMG and the no KSP. So, it took uh, more than 9,000 seconds. If I do the distribution around 10 nodes or 20 nodes here, as you see, all of the KSP um, demonstrated strong scalability. In both cases as well, we have achieved 140 MPI tasks as it, they provide the lowest time or FEP time. When I'm referring with FEP time, I'm talking about the final element problem time. I'm excluding the creation of mesh ta uh, time or any other time related to the matrix uh, operations. And when I, I wanna emphasize here is that among all the KSPs, the, the best or the winner was the flexible GMRS in companion with the hyperbumerang. If we are talking about the same number of MPI tasks, we can see different times achieved. 
So this is something like I want to point out. You have around 800 seconds in comparison to 600 seconds. Um, you can see the memory spent in both cases were the same. I don't know if you can see the whole uh, table. Um, and I also took into consideration the standard deviation to show the variances of, of the samples. So um, in both cases, it was more than 20. It's, it's about um, 25 or 26. So we might say that these uh, samples were not so homogeneous. Um, I also checked that all the outputs have the some converged message. So with regards to the speed up and the parallel efficiency, we can see that if we do the comparison between the 10 nodes and the 20 nodes and analyzing in the point of 140 MPI tasks, you can see that it, it can speed up 10 times in comparison to our baseline. Um, but the parallel efficiency that shows is around 66%. Uh, however, if we see, or in the other hand, we can see here, and uh, 20 nodes, it's, it's a speed up around 13 times. It's quite, quite good. And it's over 80% of the parallel efficiency. So between these two experiments, we can say, okay, let's use 20 nodes. Um, the distribution was the seven MPI or N task per node across 20 nodes. Mm, I, I'm recalling these uh, sentences like, the number of the standard deviation that it was 26. Like again, shows that all of the 10 runs were not so homogeneous. What if we do the distribution of the HPC resources between 14 nodes and 28 nodes? Again, we see that all of the KSP types shows strength scalability. And the number was not now is not a 140, it's 186. You see? And um, again, the numbers or the times of FEB to solve the problem is different. Um, and in this case, this is it's lower time. So this is good. We can see as well the standard deviation is, is, is smaller than in the previous cases. So Overall, if we have to check or in, in numbers, we might say that the combination of high prep. Oh, this is another thing. This is the conjugate gradient in this case, which is the winner instead of the flexible GMRS. Um, so this is good. We achieved the lowest prep time by using it's 500 seconds, around 500 seconds. A good standard deviation. Again, we check all our outputs with the salt converge message. This is very important. Um, okay, if we analyze again the speed up and parallel efficiency in both cases, we can see it's slightly 10 times it's faster in this point. But when we see in this, um, this case with 28, we can achieve around more than 16 times. This is, this is very good. And in the parallel efficiency here, achieve 52. Yeah. So in this case, it's presenting for the 28 uh, exactly or slightly tied with the number of 80%. Overall, uh, in this the four scenarios I present, I would say that we, we go for this, this option, like the 28 nodes. The combination of hip rebumer AMG with a conjugate gradient show overall the, the, the optimal lowest FEV time. And this distribution or was uh, again seven tasks per node uh, across the 28 nodes. And uh, the number of MPI tasks used was uh, 196 for more than 121 doves, million doves. Um, the standard deviation is very good number and the parallel efficiency is good. So um, I, I am glad to, to, to share this with the world. So I, we achieved more than 16 times this time. All this benchmark was done by using the cluster of Cambridge, the CSD3, which has 56 cores per node. We have uh, three conclusions here. We can see, this is something I, I didn't point out, but if you check the 
the slides. We can see here the GMRS uh, was not a uh, scale as the others. And in the case of 28 nodes as well, we didn't have a result for, for this number, 1,500 1, MPI. So um, it, it didn't offer a strong scalability as the other KSP types. And as well, we have we have shown that the distribution of cores across different numbers of nodes matters. It was different times achieved, even if we are using the same numbers of MPI tasks in both cases, um, the continuity and the flexible GMRS. We also demonstrate that we speed up the simulation more than 16 times. In comparison to our baseline, we was using a hyperbumer AMG with no KSP at all. We achieved more than well, uh, 9,000 se uh, seconds. And our experiment of after, after all uh, the tests, we achieved uh, around 500 seconds with by using the hyperbumer AMG with the conjugate gradient. These are the references I use in my work. Um, thank you so much to Professor Andrew Davis for supervising this work, um, Dr. DeVos for providing the input files and the organizers as well. You know, this is my second year in a row, so I'm very excited about it. You might follow me on Twitter as well. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Julita. Um, uh, very good work. Uh, we have a question of Thomas yeah. uh, Snyder. Uh, how do you define the parallel efficiency? Uh, it's a comment about the question. It looks like you measure it is for different number of MPI tracks and a constant number of nodes. This seems very different to standard definitions. So um, what I'm doing is first calculating the execution time. Mm, okay, I've used these, these numbers or these distributions. And then I, I did a, um, the comparison in of the, for to have the, the speed up, I did um, the compare the division between using 10 cores across uh, in comparison to 20, then 50 in, in comparison to 10. So I did a division, just, just, just a division. Uh, of the execution times on different in different nodes, and for the parallel efficiency, when as once you have the speed up, you divide by the numbers of cores used. That's that's how I define the the parallel efficiency in this case. Okay. Um, I have a question about the result because the question is, you 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 find that you use. Uh, all the, the simulation in one machine. But do you try to do the same simulation in another machine in order to identify if um, there are no problems, but maybe um, influence of the, the hardware in the results? You understand my question? I think so. Uh, at the beginning, um, I was working on another cluster. So the first filter I did was uh, testing all the preconditioners. I, I got the same results in this machine or in this cluster in, in Cambridge, um, but just in, I can say that the indicator was if converge or didn't converge. If the solution converge, I, I, it, for me, my test was pass, 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 pass. Okay. Um, if we are talking about the scaling or the times, I also had, uh, um, I, I had another uh, benchmark, but it was in the same cluster, but with different sizes. I, I oh. did it with a smaller mesh, and then I used, uh, was incrementing the meshes. Because, you know, if the variance it was when I used the second order of Lagrange. In this case, I'm using just the first Lagrange order. So, some variables, I, I was changing, but I, okay. I did it. Okay, perfect. Okay, thanks very much, Julita, for your presentation. Uh, I, I just to say, in time, in this in these occasions, <laughs> I remember you of the last our last uh, meeting, uh, and I hope to see you next year too. 
Yeah, I want to do a couple uh, simulations, coupling uh, phenomena for next year, um, transient phenomena as well, bigger simulations. Let's see how it goes. Thank Perfect. you so much. Okay. Have a good day. See Bye. you. Bye. Um, okay, you can share your presentation whenever you want. Mm -hmm. Um, okay, can you just see my screen now? Yes, perfect. Uh, you can use, okay, yes, perfect. Okay, okay whenever you are. So, thank you, Alejandro. And hello, good morning to you all. Uh, my name is, well, good afternoon to you all. My name is Leo Fernandez from the Barcelona Supercomputing Center. And in this presentation, I'm going to present our last work on this experimental validation of a new HPC tool uh, for high temperature superconductors. Uh, for this work, the Barcelona Supercomputing Center has been collaborating closely with ICMAP, the Institute of Material Science of Barcelona. And in the BSE, we're responsible for the development and testing of the module magnet from the HPC code Dahlia and further validation while ICMAP carried out experiments and provided its data for the validations. So here we have uh, the outline of the presentation. First, I will give a brief background. Uh, then I will comment a bit on the modeling of this applied superconductivity. Uh, later on, I will present the results on this experimental validation. And finally, I will give the conclusions. So first, uh, as a small summary of the background for our work, uh, we know that in some fission reactors, like tokamaks or stellarators, the fuel is heated up to temperatures of million degrees Kelvin in order to achieve this plasma state. And in order to keep this plasma hot without damaging the reactor, it's confined with strong magnetic fields. And these magnetic fields are created by strong electromagnets carrying big amounts of current. Here is where superconductors appear. As we know, superconductors are materials that, under some concrete conditions of temperature, current, and magnetic field, they have zero resistivity to electric current. And in particular, the high temperature superconductors are a type of superconductors that keep the superconducting state at temperatures over 77 Kelvin. Out of their many properties, the most relevant ones are that they can transport higher currents at high magnetic field compared to low temperature superconductors. And this makes them a good candidate to carry the currents that need to confine the reactor's plasma. Uh, this together with the fact that this technology is becoming mature enough, uh, we can start to consider them for fusion magnets. So as we commented, these HTS are promising for fusion applications, but there's a drawback here, and is that the electromagnets of these reactors need of currents of the order of some, of some kilo amperes, and the Repco tapes used can only carry limited currents of the order of a few hundred amps. So that's why they need to be assembled in, in complex tractors or cables. Uh, in this work, we focus on the properties of this tape from, from Theva, which has a layer of one micron of HTS coated with many other layers, like this Hasteloid for improving the mechanical properties, or copper, just in case uh, there's a sudden uh, heating in the superconductor, it can transfer the thermal and electrical current. So going to the motivation part, uh, we've seen that the structures needed for fusion applications are complex. And so the HPC tools are needed to, in order to study some of the properties like this cable stability or the easy losses or even quench. And in these problems, there are many physics involved too, like the electromagnetism, heat transfer or solid mechanics. So that's why we've been working on the electromagnetic module of a multi-physics tool like Alia. Uh, the electromagnetic module has already been validated against benchmarks or analytical results. And on this last work, we focused on the, on the first experimental validation of this tool, as well as the implementation of some complements for the module. So Alia, um, I'm not the first talking about Alia. Uh, the code we use as a basis for building this module that can simulate HTS is, is this HPC code Alia. As we commented, it is a simulation multi-physics HPC code. It was developed at the BSC, and it solves the PDEs by using the finite element method. It's written in Fortran and has this very good scalability. And its uh, main feature, we could say, is this model extractor by different physics. So depending on the problem you want to solve, you can use between different modules. You have between turbulence for turbulence problems, Nastin for Navier-Stokes, Temper for heat transfer, or this last uh, module we, we, where it was developed is this magnet model for electromagnetic problems. So now going to how do we model this applied superconductivity? 
Um, the model we use describes the electromagnetic problem with this H formulation of the Maxwell equations. And the problem is solved by using the finite element method with H elements as a space discretization. And for the particular case of superconductors, um, in order to model the superconducting materials, we use this power law for resistivity. Uh, this describes properly the nonlinear behavior of the superconducting resistivity uh, with using a typical value of this EC 10 to the power of minus 4 and the N value, there's a range between 20 and 30 and we used a value of 30. Uh, JC is the critical current density and it depends on the material we want to simulate. And what we can observe here is that for uh, values of the current that are lower than this critical current density, the resistivity will be very low. Uh, but once this value of J goes over this critical current density, uh, this exponent will make the resistivity to increase a lot and make this transition between the superconducting and the non-superconducting state. So um, getting a, a bit of a, a summary of these um, parameters, this, uh, in superconductors we have these different conditions below, below which the material will be in the superconducting state. Um, the one we are interested in the most is this critical current density. Uh, is the maximum amount of current that can travel through the material before losing this superconducting state. And this value is used in, in superconductor modeling. And in general, as we can see here, it depends on the temperature, the magnetic field, and the strain. Uh, so that is why, for a good modeling of superconductors, we require a multi physics tool. Also, we can observe that the dependencies uh, of this uh, critical current density are not, are not simple. So it's good to have an HPC tool uh, that can solve this uh, in a more or an easier way. So here we, we present the, the magnet module. Uh, it was built in, it's built in Alia and it solves this electromagnetic problem with the H formulation. Out of its main properties, it has this um, low order Nedelec elements and an implicit scheme for time integration. As we said, it's bu it builds on Alia's parallel capabilities. So, so it will perform uh, good in these HPC computers. And it has a very good tunability, uh, like this weird Savart option when you have a smaller domains, uh, several boundary conditions like uh, Dirichlet or Neumann boundary conditions. Or lately, we added this axisymmetric option uh, for some problems with special symmetries. It has been already validated, first against benchmarks and also against analytical results. As we can see here, showing a, a good agreement on this AC losses benchmark from Kapolka with a maximum difference of a 3.5%. So the next step was to validate it with experimental data. And here now we go to the, to the results part of the, of the experimental validation. Uh, as a small summary, uh, the experiment proposed was to measure the monetization of an HT state subject to an external, external time varying field. And we wanted to validate the 2D and the 3D models of the tape in Alia and use a critical current that can locally depend on the magnetic field, magnitude, and orientation. Here we have a, a summary of the experiment carried out by ICMA. Uh, is this in-field cooling experiment. Uh, it consists on placing a, a, a tape into a cryostat and adding, well, uh, applying a magnetic field, a vertical magnetic field of 0 0.5 Tesla. After this, they cool the superconductor down to the superconducting state and they remove the magnetic field. Uh, because of the Faraday law, the, the superconductor tried, uh, made a response to this field variation by creating some current loops and a, and a self field. And because of being a superconductor, these current loops won't dissipate and they could measure this, this remaining field and remaining currents with this uh, Hull probe. So what they measure is this surface here. Um, it's the magnetic field, the Y component of the magnetic field at 400 microns from the tape. And we are interested in the cross section of these of this, uh, results because we will use this, this data here as a validation data for, for our simulations. So, starting with the simulations, uh, the first simulations we've done are these two D simulations. Uh, we did several cases, but we can we'll just present these two cases here one smaller domain and one larger domain. These are vertical size of the tape. And we applied a, an external magnetic field of 0 0.5 Tesla with a frequency of 50 Hertz. So after five milliseconds, we would have a, a zero field um, situation and we could check uh, the results we obtained. If we observe the current distribution at that point, we observe how the current loop was created. So that is the first, the first step uh, that, that in order to, to validate uh, the, the module. 
And also, if we observe the well, the, this elapsed time for the two for the two simulations, we can observe that it was a slightly longer for the smaller domain than the larger domain. This is because for this domain we use this bill subart option we commented, and this uh, needs to iterate through all the elements in the in the domain, so it will take a little bit more of time. Uh, as a validation, we, we compare this experimental cross-section data we commented before with the magnetic field at 400 microns. And what we can observe is that despite some minor asymmetries here in this left part of the, of the plot, uh, we, had, we have good agreement with experimental data. So after this, we try to implement this critical current dependence here. Until now, we were using a constant value for the critical current density, but we know it depends on the magnetic field, temperature, and strain. Since our problem is at constant temperature and, and not quite complex, we try to implement the dependence on the magnetic field and the angle of the magnetic field. Um, as uh, for this, we model the, this dependence as a product of the angular part and the magnetic field part. For the magnetic field part, we took this data from the manufacturer and in ICMAP, they, they made a fitting out of this black uh, line here, which is this expression here. And we inputted this into this part of the expression. And for the angular part, we just inputted the data, the data into Alia and made Alia interpolate the points uh, from this data that we that we gave. So after this, the the results from this simulation are again um, quite similar to the previous ones, and they still have this this small asymmetries here on the left part, but in general they show very good agreement. And something we can notice here is how the how the lapse time increased a lot to almost five hours and a half showing how these dependencies and these um, nonlinearities are uh, induced create uh, and make uh, that the lapse time is, is way longer than the previous cases. And as the last as the last simulations, we went for these 3D simulations of the tape. Uh, again, we did several cases, but we can sum them up in these two cases. The 3D case where we have um, the constant value for the critical current density and the 3D case where we use this dependent uh, critical current density. We observe how this elapsed time is, is quite short for this case, almost only half an hour, showing the good parallel capabilities of Alia and Magnet too. But again, when we add this uh, critical current dependence, uh, the elapsed time increases to almost, almost five hours. Uh, from here, we, we can compare both uh, the results, well, the, the two magnetic fields at 400 microns uh, with the experimental data, and we can again observe that there are still these this, uh, differences on the left part, but in general, they show very good agreement. And well, something which is relevant is that now we can observe many other physical phenomena, like these current loops here that we can compare with experimental data that, that was measured from MIGMAP, or also. Uh, in previous cases, if we had to, to or when, if we wanted to get the data of the, magne of the magnetic field and the current distribution, we, we should get like two different plots and inter in, make an interpretation of these current loops. But with this, we can get in a more uh, easy way and we can observe many of these physical phenomena like these current loops or the magnetic field at each plane of the, of the tape. So as, as a last point, uh, we may wonder which of these simulations is, has a better approach to the experimental data. If we put all of them together, we can just observe they all look very much the same. So we cannot say which of them has the, is the better approach to, to the experiment. In order to solve this, we did this small quantitative comparison where we computed uh, two errors, a root mean square error responsible for the global difference between one simulation and experimental data and the percentual max error, which corresponds to the maximum difference between two points given a simulation. Uh, what we can observe is that the 3D cases are better with this global error, having one order of magnitude less error than the 3D cases. But uh, on the other side, the 3D cases show to have better point-to-point -point differences, having 5% less local deviation than the 3D cases. Overall, we can say that the simulations show good agreement with experimental data. So this leads us to the conclusion part, where we can say that this first stage of validation from the, for the magnet module from Alia was completed successfully with this uh, experimental data. Uh, these minor asymmetries from the experimental data were not reproduced by the simulations done, but uh, commenting this with experimentalists, we, we conclude that these uh, asymmetries were coming from some defects on the tape. 
and we will be working further in, in the future to get more experimental data and compare it with new experiments to observe uh, if this hypothesis is true or not. And finally, well, these three simulations show better results, uh, getting this four times smaller root mean square error and also give a more physical phenomena to be seen. But the 2D cases show to have this 5% less local deviation than the 3D ones. As next steps, uh, we would like to validate the model uh, against new experiments, like could be AC losses experiments, for example. Uh, we would like to improve the preconditioners to cope with the resistivity transition between the air and superconductor, or in general, just to improve the performance of this, um, of this model and these simulations. And finally, we would like to couple this magnet module with other area models, like Temper, which is the heat transfer module, to simulate multi-physics problems that could be quench or heat propagation in these HDS states. So thank you for your attention. And well, here is my, my contact if you have any comment. Perfect. Thanks, Ariel. Um, well, very interesting work, very, very well the, the match between 2D and 3D experiment. I have one question about the amount of freedom degree of each case. Of course, uh, a bidimensional case is um, mm. more less expensive, but more or less, what is the, the, the size of the mesh in, in two cases? Okay, so uh, I think it's up there, but in general, like the number of elements in the 3D cases is at around 50,000 elements. And in the 2D cases, it's 30,000. I mean, for the 3D case, we tried to, we made an effort to have a, a better meshing. And because if, if like here, it was not a problem to just uh, use the, 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 an easy mesh. But for the 3D cases, we had to get like a specific size of the elements, because if not, the, the number of, um, edges was increasing a lot. Okay, yes, I see that because, okay, you have very good result in 2D, but with a lot of um, more element in relations that in the 3D case. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, it's dependent on the symmetry of the problem now, because you are trying symmetry problems, but you 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 have another experiments with uh, asymmetry problems in order that you can use 2d and you need to use only 3d what sorry sorry well, this the results are, are comparable because the symmetry of the problem allow it yes, yes. but uh, the question is you try with uh, asymmetry problems in order that you can use 2d and then you need to use three-dimensional only you understand? Yes, mm, we, we haven't done yet these experiments. We are looking forward to, to have this together with these AC losses to more complex uh, experiments where we can uh, like get these differences between the 2D and the 3D. And, but for the moment, we have this first experimental validation. Perfect. OK, yes. uh, this will be interesting. Well, ah, I want, uh, one last question in relation to it. Uh, another question in, in uh, before in another presentation. You you don't try yet a uh, uh, couple models, yes? Mm -hmm. You don't couple model yet magnet with temper, for example. Yeah, that's that's something we are we are working now on it, like to couple this this model. But uh, at, at the moment, there's not, I mean, there's a problem here because um, in, the, in the heat transfer model, it's, the elements used are like, it's not edge elements, it's normal elements. So here we are having a bit of a trouble on this issue, but the idea is to couple the, the two modules yeah. and get. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, the question is related with the, the, is it easy to couple uh, these two models with so different elements? Okay, this yeah, is really an issue. Yeah, that, it's that's an a issue. Problem. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yes. Okay. Well, uh, thanks very much, Oriol. Um, okay. okay, I think that's 
we finish the pre the the session and we finish the day, isn't it? And I think this it was the last contribution of the day. Well, uh, if there are no comments uh, of the organizer, I, I think that we will start tomorrow at nine o'clock. And yes, uh, well, uh, thanks you to all the participants and the resist to the last uh, contribution. Um, well, I hope to see you tomorrow, nine o'clock. Um, good afternoon. Um, see you tomorrow, yes?